Hello everybody and welcome to day number four of the Shurima Cup. I'm going to be your host, my name is Gangly, and lucky for you I am joined by two beautiful handsome faces. That is Boopasaurus and the guy who gave me the gun buddy that I got. Thank you so much, Riot Mortdog. How you both doing coming out of day three of the Shurima Cup? Oh, I'm doing doing great. Uh, a lot of really great play, a lot of really cool new players that I'm excited to highlight, uh, along with uh, the players that we all know and love. So uh, let's get it done and have a great day today. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, excited to be back for the final day, see who can really you know pull ahead, see who manages to play those uh, A-tier comps, uh, figure out some ways to maybe pull into some really creative top fours. So that's kind of what I'm looking at, and I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we saw a lot of really exciting things yesterday. Very excited to see how it all shapes up today. Now, Boop and more, I'm going to be back with you in just a minute. But before we go too far, let's talk a little bit about where we are in competitive TFT. Now, we are in set nine, Rune Terror of Forge playing in the Sharima Cup. About a month ago, we played in the Freljord Cup. Between these two tournaments, players will be looking to qualify for the mid-set finale, the final tournament of set nine, and potentially the final mid-set finale we may ever see in in competitive TFT history. Now, at set 9.5, we'll have the Noxus Cup and the last chance qualifier. All of these tournaments ultimately leading to the regional finals, which is every North American's chance to compete and qualify for the World Championship, and hopefully North America will be able to get back to back titles. Now let's hone in on the Sharima Cup, talk about the motivations of the players. That is the prize pool and qualifications coming out of it. Now, all 32 players on the day will be competing for their share of $12,500, and we will be paying out positions one all the way down to 12th place. Now, on top of the money, maybe even more importantly to a lot of these players, is that players will be competing for qualifier points in order to get to the mid-set finale and ultimately the regional finals. But for players who maybe did not compete in the, the Freljord Cup or had a weak performance in the Freljord Cup, it's important to note that the top four placements on the day, the top four will receive an automatic invitation straight to the mid-set finale, which is a huge game changer in your career as a player in set nine. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the format of the competition. Last weekend, 128 players were whittled down all the way to 32, who met up with 32 additional players yesterday for day three. At the end of the day, we we whittle the competition down to 32 final players who are playing in the fourth day of competition. Today, we will play five games with all 32 players before cutting the field in half to 16 for a sixth game and then cutting the field one last time for the top eight. And it's also important to note that yesterday, 12 players earned bonus points, which can, which can have a huge impact in where they place on the final day. So we'll have to see how that all shapes up but i'm going to welcome back boop and mort as we talk a little bit about some of the uh i guess the the end of the day yesterday as we saw the players finishing out the day go to social media and they had lots of things to say but we'll start it off boop with a player who did not qualify for the qualify for the fourth day of competition that is dish Soap tft who says day one lamau genuinely think i played fine just ye a lot of low variance plus getting punished for not being a hundred percent perfect 
Yeah, so I think this kind of speaks to just generalized, I mean, disappointment. Like, you, if you're Dish Soap and you're not playing on the last day, you have not reached expectations. And he knows that himself. So he's trying his best to go through these emotions. And this is definitely going to be something that helps. But maybe the reasoning here, and this is something that uh, we talked about earlier uh, with more, is the early game is pretty standard right now, which actually opens up opportunities for people who come in with less plans. So copying Dish Soap's homework might have been a better meta <laughs> this time around than in previous previous metas because the choices you make earlier on just aren't as intense maybe than in some other iterations of EFT so far. Yeah, I mean, they, we've seen plenty of tournaments in the past where a B patch comes out the week before an event, and it's those players who can learn really quickly who find success on that weekend of competition. So I can absolutely see a world where Dishtop, one of the hardest working players in North America, can find an edge more easily when there are fewer people copying fewer pieces of his homework. Now we've got another tweet coming up from Robin Songs, maybe potentially North American Goat, I don't know, lots of people say it, I say it too, but you know, I I think everyone says i don't know we'll see robin says plus two points going into day four i'm better than dish soap more dog what do you think yeah i mean i saw on the stream you know yesterday we were talking a decent amount about dish soap and robin's like you know what about me i think there's you know he's been trying to prove for a long time that like you said maybe he is the na goat he's had a lot of consistent performances ever since that one 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 lag one one tournament uh you know and he's been doing really well but there's just been so much attention on dish soap and i think a lot of people often forget that robin is just so consistent he does very well in a lot of these tournaments i think really you know just trying to prove how great he is and i, I think he's doing a great job of that so far I also want to call out one of the stats we see on this card, the first place rate of 37% and the eighth place rate of 0%. Something so crazy about Robin Songs is that in set nine, he is top five in first or eighth rate, even though he has no eighths across the entire set because he just wins that much. Obviously, you can chalk it up to variance or whatever it is, but Robin Songs is one of those players that knows how to win. Let's move on to another tweet. We've got one from Lil Kahuna. This is a player who maybe is not known by as many people in TFT, but is definitely an equally important cornerstone of the community, <laughs> who says, last seed again, LMAO, WTF. I am the biggest scammer known to mankind. See you tomorrow, Sharima Cup, day four, hashtag Sumi Sweep. So, you know, I, I've said this before, but I think the FBI agent that is, you know, trying to track Lil Kahuna is really confused about his life right now because I think all of us are as well. Lil Kahuna has one of the craziest Twitters. Definitely check it out. It's hilarious. Uh, I think in the, uh, in, the, in the lobby on Discord, he's Lil Slayuna. Right, so that just gives a little bit of a peep inside of the noggin there. Also, one of the greater memers uh, here. Huge increase in followers for Kurum and Grand Vice. But, you know, there's been accomplishments, as you can say, outside of the Convergence. But now it's time to create those uh, scenarios within the Convergence. And why not today of all days to show up and, you know, prove yourself and potentially uh, lock in some more TFT for the future? Well said, well said. Now, we've got a few more tweets lined up. We've got one coming in from Cloud9's K3 Soju, who says, five of us in the top 10, not fun if no competition at Precedent, at Satsuko, at Milk, at Kiyun. Uh, hey, Mortdog, who's your favorite from this study group? <laughs> Rank them one to five right now, live. Hi. Nope, not going to happen, not going to happen. But, uh, you know, these five players have definitely proven, especially on the ladder, how good they are. You know, Soju, Milk, and Kuhn have been around for a long time. Uh, you know, and they've definitely had amazing performances each in their own rights. You know, both Milk and Soju making it to Worlds. Uh, Setsuko as well. So these are some of, you know, the NA goats as well. Uh, now, every time they, they get a little far ahead, sometimes you get those, you know, big, big-headed tweets come out there. And so we'll have to see if it can live up to today. But I think all five of them are coming out guns blazing, sort of showing they're here to prove. And... Soji leading the top, you know, the, the name change, we'll see, but, uh, you know, doing really well there. Up and coming streamer K3 Soji. That's right, that's right. And I do want to call out Soji with 0% eighth rate, one of those players that's really good at avoiding eighth places in tournament. Now, we've got another tweet coming in from Goobums, who says he's not in that same study group, but definitely making a point about them, says May day two or day four, in this case, Asharima. Dog walking the whole squad tomorrow, Boop. At Preston, at Milk, at Setsuko, at Kiyun, at Soju. GG Easy. He is he's tagging all five members of the K3 study group. 
<laughs> I love it. More of this, honestly. I love the emotion. I love the trash talk. I think we in esports overall we can get some good trash talk going, and this is a great start uh, for someone that like Goobums, who is also really good and has pr you know provided some really great results uh, in the past here at the fifth at the Gizmos and Gadgets Championship. Zero percent eighth place rate as well. So if someone is gonna talk, you know, Goobums has a little bit uh, uh you know of walking the walk to do. Maybe finishing in first place today, finishing ahead of all of them, then we might see a follow up tweet. But I love it. I love the emotion. I love I love the trash talk. More, more, more. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, there's a phrase, don't talk if you don't know. And I bet if you ask Goobums, nobody knows more than he does. Now, we've got one more tweet coming in on the day. It's coming in from the point leader of day three. It's Wajin Iverson, who says, in a very wholesome way, one Shurima Cup, day three, Mort. Hopefully, I can avoid the winner's curse for tomorrow, which does seem like it's been a pretty real thing in competitive TFT. Yeah, it feels like I've been, you know, casting for a little while now, and it does feel like every time we do one of these day one or day three interviews, the person's feeling pretty good, had a good performance, and then the next day comes around and they just can't quite make it, or even worse, they bottom out real hard. And so hoping Wajin Iverson, who's been doing really well lately, you know, he did uh, really well at that Monsters Attack mid-set finale, got to go to Worlds based off that. Hopefully he can kind of show that he's not just, you know, based off one meta and can do really well here. Um, come back and do well. So yeah, I'm just really hoping you avoid that curse again. So, Wajin Iverson's one of those players that we kind of first heard of back in set seven when Setsuko, one of the best players in North America, came out and said like, hey, I've played against this guy in solo queue and I'm telling you he's the real deal. So exciting to see that come to fruition in set eight and then ultimately find his way into the world championship. Now, Boop, more. I am going to see the two of you in just a little bit. You're going to be back for game two on the day, but right now I'm going to take the time to introduce the final casting pair on the day. It's Casanova, it's Crowen, the three of us back on the desk. Cass, Crowen, how you both feeling? I'm feeling great. We get to, you know, crown another champion today here at the Sharima Cup. And uh, I'm really excited about some of the players who have never made a day four before that have come in and had really good performances. Rudier, one of them, uh, never made a day four, actually got bonus points coming in today. Uh, Master Uknan uh, played some, uh, you know, interesting strategies. I mean, he was one of the Earth players and he made it to, to day four as well. And then Sub-Zero Arc, who is our uh, last remaining Caitlyn player. And as a Caitlyn enjoyer myself, I'm excited to see him uh, make it to this uh, stage. And I really want to see him do well. Definitely, I love to see it. I mean, firstly, it's great to be back with you both for another final day of competition, seeing what players lock in their spot for the mid-set finale. I mean, we had a fantastic finish yesterday, a lot of great narratives continuing, and some starting to develop as well. So I'm really looking forward to seeing those come into fruition here today. Now let's take a look at some of the compositions that were played yesterday. We did get a chance yesterday to see how everything turned out in week one to so Casanova. Let's see how things shaped up yesterday compared to the weekend before. As you can see, I mean, you know, the popularity is trending upwards of a lot of these most popular compositions. Um, but when you see that, usually it does correlate with uh, a reduce in success as far as top fours and winner. It's because the comps are more contested and therefore less people are hitting and they're, you know, taking more bottom fours. However, we're not really seeing that for the most part here. And the one that surprises me the most with that statistic is the six Noxus Darius with the reroll because when you're re-rolling those especially get a lot worse when they're contested because you need those three stars and uh we're actually seeing this st the stats look just fine with a pretty large increase in popularity yeah definitely i mean some of those uh six noxus variants do come through with the samira cassiopeia reroll, and then the others come through with the darius katarina focus and we've seen a couple of times yesterday where those two were in the same lobby and both of them actually you know top four a decent amount so it's not that surprising that the top four rate is only down by three percent still 63 percent top four rate for that comp is absolutely insane and like you mentioned as well the popularity rate of all of these comps are going up that we see besides the Ka kaisa yasuo flex and that kind of makes sense it's the composition that players aren't aren't necessarily gunning for but you get stuck on and obviously the win right there you going down even further i thought five yeah. percent was low enough but 2.5 percent now that composition is almost never ever finding wins I want to piggyback off of what you're saying here, Crowen, which is that I think if you took a look at the early or mid-game popularity of Noxus, those numbers would actually change quite a bit. We're seeing a lot of players playing oh, yeah. the opener of the Samira and then transitioning into a late game, especially we've seen a lot with Zeri or Aphelios as well. And I want to call out this Aphelios pick that we have seen relatively popular in the meta, but not capping out as high, especially as high as the Zeri flex coming in at only a 5% win rate. Mort Dog talked a little bit about this on 
the broadcast yesterday saying that, you know, sometimes you have the Cephelios that just get stuck on that front line while the Zeri is really good at clearing out back lines, even despite a strong front line. So definitely not too surprising to see the comp not with a super high win rate, but definitely seems like a very reasonable fall back, back plan for our AD players. So we have the lobbies ready on the day. Let's take a look at what lobbies we're going to be seeing for the fourth day of competition in Casanova. We're going to be starting with lobby A on the day, and I feel like this is a pretty stacked lobby from top to bottom. Yeah, that, I mean, that's the thing, right? Like, all of these lobbies do feel pretty stacked, but lobby A really drew our eye initially, right? We've got Weijin Iverson, who was our point leader uh, yesterday on day three. Um, we've got joining in that is Soju and Milk from the study group that was so dominant, right? All five of them in the top 10. That's Soju, Prestivant, Milk, Setsuko, and Kiyun. Uh, and they're joining, you know, little Kahuna that was talked about earlier. Yeah, a bit of a memer, but this isn't the first time he's made a day four. Uh, the one that stands out to me, uh, who it is his first time on a day four, is Sub Zero Arc. I, I mentioned him earlier, the Caitlyn player. He's one of two alongside Joe Bookmark. Uh, and, you know, being a solo Caitlyn player, I think is actually quite, quite, quite good in the current meta. So looking forward to see what he can do. I also want to draw a little bit of attention to Connor is me, the second player on this list. Now, Crow and Connor is me is, a, is an interesting player in the sense that he is one of three players in North America to have competed in the open bracket in both the Freljord and the Sharima Cup and make final day both times. It's something he's done alongside T-Boy and TSM Solus. Now, I feel like traditionally you see these open bracket players, they find success in those opening weekends, but they fail to convert on that second weekend when the comp competition gets tougher. Does it surprise you to see a player like Connor is me kind of coming up and doing it two times in a row? Uh, I want to say yes and no. I mean, it is surprising because like you're mentioning, players come from a week one to week two and be like, oh, the tempo is a lot different. There's a lot stronger players in the lobby, so I have to approach this a bit differently. But I think Connor is a player who's been around a little bit more than some of those, you know, fresh newer players. Like this is their first tournament or first two tournaments. Um, and so being able to do that, I, I think, especially among metas, like in the Freljord Cup that change from week one to week two, just goes to the testament of maybe Connor rising up and putting his name among players like um, you know, Wage and Iverson, a re-replay to come out of the gate swinging and be able to be consistent, right? Finding a final day is hard enough. And I think Connor is a player that can even find final day success. And we could be seeing him later in the penultimate and the final lobby as well. I also want to draw some attention to the top of that list. It's Beast Coast's very own Sox. Now, Casanova, Sox did not compete in the Freljord Cup. So obviously this has some pretty large implications for how he needs to perform today. I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on what you're expecting to see from Sox. Well, so Sox really has to, to shoot for the fences, right? He's got to make it to that top four to try and make it into mid set, unless he's going to find a way through ladder snapshots or anything like that, right? Because uh, for earlier cup, he got no qualifier points. He's got to get everything here. So, I mean, we may see Sox play for that, right? At the start of the day, he's just got to make it to the next lobby, to the next lobby. But once we get towards, you know, uh, if he makes it to the top 16, to the top eight, certainly going to have to play for those top spots. He needs to be in that top four. And you know, we, we, we talk about all these players and still DQA is here untalked about because <laughs> there's just so many great players in this lobby. And DQA, of course, being part of the study group that dominated the Freljord Cup alongside Kurum, Dish Soap, Robin Song, Solus, and Broccoli. And, you know, DQA, Robin, and Solus are all still doing fantastic in the Sharima Cup as well. So realistically, the two study groups that have been so dominant in set nine so far are DQAs and Soju's. There's something so poetic about DQA, despite all accomplishments, still being the last person talked about in this lobby. There's something about DQA, honestly, one of the most decorated players oh, so in good. TFT, but it doesn't always feel like that. And I wonder, Crow, and it does, it has something to do, one, with like the personalities of streamers. And obviously when they're in the limelight, a lot of these big names get the attention. But I, I do wonder if it also has something to do with the fact that North America at this point in time has become so deep in its talent pool that yeah. even the most decorated players sometimes still fall to the wayside. Yeah, I really genuinely believe that. I mean, even Mort brought it up and we're going over the tweets, right? Robin's like, oh yeah, you know, what about me? You're talking a lot about dish soap, but like Robin's always there, always very consistent. And it's like, yeah, we all, we're, we're going to know and love a name like Robin. And I think that the same can be said about at least five players in this lobby, right? Players of of massive pedigree. Um, so I th really think, I mean, NA has proven that they can compete with the best re-replay winning the world championships. NA's talent pool is so deep. And I know it's the conversation of, oh yeah, like, you know, NA rely on stats or whatever, stats are, are the edge, but I don't really don't think that's the 
case i really think it's just the amount of talent coming into the scene so that's why we're talking about players like in the specific lobby like sub zero arc like connor is me who not only are able to find success but sometimes do it with um non-meta play styles right sub zero arc being the caitlin player like cast talked about and looking at their stats from yesterday and even some of the lines they're playing are a little bit different than the norm and so that is i think a big thing to hone in on when we uh, look at all the games today is what players are coming up kind of from the will work from that new player perspective and able to challenge the na greats but with a totally different play style it's just so impressive yeah and like sub-zero arc playing the caitlin but also connor is me the other player we're talking about was on ezreal which True. is you know also wow. not going to be the standard uh you know we saw Appy's maybe popularize it it's not popular but at least you know <laughs> had a really great run in frail yard playing the ezreal which was a big surprise to people but now connor taking it to day four of the sharima cup and still kind of carrying that torch having a strategy that's different from everyone else we we've, we've talked about it a lot on the broadcast that in tft there's kind of two components well there's multiple components but you do have you know understanding meta understanding lines you kind of have to do the busy work to make sure that you're actually prepared but comfort and player agency is a huge part of tft and one of the most fun parts that differentiates players among each other and i think that if you are a player who is maybe not always one that to conform to the meta you're not the one that's playing orn and maybe some people they think they're playing earth and they're spicing it up but check <laughs> this one out let's see how the resident ezreal player does so Game number one is ready. Day four of the Sharima Cup. Cast, Crow, and take it away. All right. Thank you, Gangly Crone. We're jumping in immediately. Warlord's Palace, Vandal Cafeteria, and Unstable Rift are the options. We've got people in all of them, but it looks like everyone kind of wants the Warlord's Palace. So we'll see if they get one guide by Kahuna or Sox. Nope. They do not. Weijin gets it. Warlord's Palace. Sox being the Vandal Cafeteria picker there. That is interesting. wonder if he has some tech, really likes, um, you know, so kind of like an Earth play style, right? You get yep. these emblems online. You're going to be able to play these vertical traits, say, um, even like like Deadeye, but like Zahn is going to be the big thing that people go for. But you can make it work with, with Shurima and other ones like that. Noxus even is another big one, but not going to be the case here. We are going for Warlord's Palace. So at the end of stage four, we get a treasure armory. We get to roll down and pick your loot. Just one gold per reroll, so not too bad but starting off here with k3 soji cloud nine's very own and he had a pretty solid day yesterday ended up eighth on the day had 34 points but played a ton of zeri that's kind of his main focus here it seems like soji very much a, a meta focused player yeah and uh just you know he's got a rec site early i don't really think soji is the player who's gonna love to go in the bruiser's direction but i think he'll you know he'll take a look at his first augment and maybe there's a decision point there if he decides to hold on to this but uh, i i want to take a look at the legends right all orn uh except for connor on ezreal and sub-zero arc on yep. caitlin this is what we expected honestly with sock standing on bandle cafeteria i was curious if he had pivoted to earth today uh, it would be like uh, an actually really good thing for him to get if he knows that this is an orn lobby he's playing earth he has actually a couple outs on portals that give him an advantage right like placidium library or uh you know god's will is grub or of course the bandle cafeteria so yep. maybe there was some thought there but no it's just gonna be orn uh yet again maybe he just has some other tech that he likes all right taking a look at sub zero arc our other kind of non-meta player caitlin player like you very much oh, know and love i got i just gotta stop you real quick if yeah. you notice his shop is locked this is a big thing yeah, i was talking yeah. to you guys before <laughs> uh the day this is something he does a lot on caitlin if he gets a good shop on one four he doesn't pre-level instead he just locks the shop if it's gold he's gonna get a swain oh. uh, he doesn't hit so uh, we've been kind of the curse of the caitlin players yeah not letting them get gold augments because in this spot he would have been on a pair of samiras with a cassio with a swain two and an aurelia two and that would have been a massive lead in the game but instead it is silver augment so he is unfortunately uh, just gonna have to pick something else and at least he still you know has swain cassio and samira to start it's still a good start yeah, inconsistency, and I think that's not going to be exactly what you're hoping for with a Noxus opener, but it makes sense. You don't need to carry a full streak forward to do well with Noxus. Um, you're going to be strong enough if you, you know, slam uh, some items like Ionic Spark is slammable here. You have one uh, tier for the potential blue buff for the Samira, if we consider re-rolling. The shop lock does lean very, very much into the Caitlyn style of play, as you're mentioning. Just a little unlucky that it's silver tier augment. But there was also an Orianna in the shop and Echo on the bench. So it could have been something like a buy Orianna. Um, maybe even, you know, sell the, uh, sell the Taric in pre-level, but probably it's going to be by the Swain there every single time. It just could have been something like a Vi in the next shop to get pilt over online, pilt over caps out boards and wins lobby so much, but Caitlyn player, so not going that route. Tried to play around the stars are born, just didn't get it. 
yeah it's interesting because a lot of the time you actually would do that as a caitlin player because you want to pre-level anyway right so you yep. buy the orana you would pre you'd sell the tarik you'd pre-level and get it but i think having the swain aurelia in his shop he probably oh, yeah. decided that that is more powerful if he hits the gold augment than trying to play for piltover at least uh it, it, feeling that that's a more consistent out um but you're completely right like it, it did close him off this time from uh getting piltover and trying to play that line and he did get a first with piltover yesterday so it is a line that you know he may have wanted to play for yeah definitely it's almost like we're seeing the same board here just uh not the noxus <laughs> same augment however inconsistency for Wajin iverson as well couple of swains couple of samiras almost looks like a double trouble yet lacking the augment there and no sample items as well right and that's going to be a big difference in say versus a player like soju on the other side they're already slamming a sunfire has the bow on the samira right three noxus in wajin iverson even though he leveled is going to be you know inconsistent there but that's good generating a lot of economy early to get that economy rolling wajin iverson's not too upset about that i think yeah and soju just if, to note you mentioned the zeri is the main focus uh of soju he did have zonheart uh, so he's going to be able to lean pretty heavily into that Zeri comp later on, just angling from it very early. It does kind of close him off, makes him commit a little bit harder to that, but uh, it is a line you want to be playing anyway, and it can support multiple players and still do well. So we'll see that, but BQA has found the Piltover. Uh, I'm not sure go. if he found it on 2-1. Actually, yeah, he did. Yeah. He's got four, yep, four, four so he found it on 2-1. Perfect. Uh, DQA in a really good spot to have that. It should be uncontested, and inconsistency players are going to have boards that are, are definitely strong enough to beat you. Oh, 100%. And it looks like he had the uh, Jace plus the Oriana and maybe picked the Bruiser just to get the Vi online for the Piltover. So his board's going to be a little bit stronger than if you're trying to like full open. But good yeah. thing there's not another Piltover player because just that Bruiser buff would be the difference of winning a fight, cashing out a little bit too early. But we got to be looking towards a bit later on, right? Mort Dog was talking about it a lot yesterday that, you know, around that eight cash out area is what players are usually going to be looking for. Get online, get that 20 stack T hex, find the Zeris, but we already know it's gonna be contested by Soju. And I get to see everyone's comps. There's a lot of Samiras floating around. Yeah, I was gonna say, Chrome, look at the sea of Noxus, right? Like <laughs> yeah. the entire right side is all Noxus, and then there's another one with Connor. Of course, these are not Noxus commits, but it's just everyone that kind of got the opener and is playing the opener. And honestly, DQA loves to see it. Everyone is reasonably strong. No one is playing for Lost Streak. Everyone's playing some level of tempo. Uh, and so this is a really great spot to be a Piltover player. Oh, 100%. Yeah, even so Sox playing the Samir 2 without Noxus, um, but everyone else having that. And it could be one of those things where if one of those players starts to come out on top and say like full win streak throughout the stage two, they can just look to commit to it. Maybe they get lucky. Maybe they roll Darius on some passive shops up until Krugs, right? That is going to be a, a, a potential out of commit. However, for Lil Kahuna with something like a Gargoyle Stone Plate slammed, I would actually consider the direction to be going away from it, even though the Darius is on bench there is no Darius items right now Ionic Spark could be slammed for Katarina but there is no Katarina in sight Lil Kahuna almost has too much of a good thing right now but with the bench having to sit a Jin too there's just no room for it playing all of these other good units and good synergies even the Oriana 2 providing 2 Sork is very powerful right now one of the reasons that Kahuna is on 100 HP trying to win streak throughout the whole stage going up against Wajin Iverson here looks to be another win yeah, I mean, Lokuna definitely uh, looking prime to just five streak stage two. I mean, I, I can't really imagine a board uh, being too much stronger than than what he's got going right now, especially as you said, just kind of a wealth of resources sitting a Jin, sitting a Darius that feels crazy on stage two. Yeah. Um, but instead, he's just hit everything else, uh, making for a very good board and making 20 on the four win streak is certainly not bad. Really good shape for the economy. And uh, like I said, I mean, looking at the side, maybe Connor with the, the 13 gold board or Sox with the 12 gold board are the people that can contend with Lil Kahuna. However, the synergies here are just fantastic. Yeah, definitely looking at that board um, kind of value there. I'm glad you brought it up because it's very much telling the story always in stage two. The ones that are more expensive, that 12, 13 is going to be at the top and the ones that are, you know, sub 10 are going to be down there at the bottom trying to go for a loss streak, especially DQA. Oh. Only Wow, Melk actually has a three value board. Maybe Melk was running into DQA trying to grief his streak. We'll have to see uh, what matchup I actually ran into there, but that could be huge to grief the Piltover player on just stage two. Looks like the fight's already over, so it was Soju that beat Melk and did not run into DQA. DQA, fortunately for DQA. Yeah, this fight was actually incredibly close. I think Connor did have a board that could start to contend uh, due to that Samira too, but it just wasn't quite enough. Uh, very, very close loss, and Connor didn't have the full streak, so it's not going to feel you know too terrible to have that happen. Uh, but Kahuna going to continue that five streak through Krugs. 
we look at Weijin continuing to do really well with that inconsistency only on a one streak. Yeah, lost value for one round. They had three losses after the carousel, but getting value here yet again. 30 gold on Krugs, not bad at all. Um, it's going to be a little bit behind, say, players who have full streaked into Krugs, but still in a very solid spot and can go any direction, right? I think that's going to be the main theme. If everyone's starting around Noxus, it's where do the pivots happen? When do they happen? Ooh. And with getting something like a greater champion duplicator, that can be really setting the tone if Weijin's able to, with inconsistency, generate that much money to go something like a fast nine, especially with blue buff Samira and then a JG. Yeah. Um, that could just be an Ari later on. Yeah, I mean, this, this is actually... Uh, it's really yeah, it's slammed. leaning towards a, a fast nine place. We've actually, but I, I was vault reviewing yesterday. Uh, Sub Zero had a fast nine game where he had essentially kind of this board. It was it was Samira with a Swain two early on. Had the blue buff, had just some decent items, uh, and then hit level up on three two, and it oh, just led to an easy huge. you know go nine uh, play around that blue buff, play for Ari, play for for the big five cost carries and Weijin. I mean, looking at this three two augment, you already have inconsistency, which is going to be great for generating the economy now uh you know what do you find on three two can it help you get to nine even quicker uh and really just turn this into a big bill gates board yeah now that you've set up the i, I really want that to come through prismatic for second augment please that would be absolutely insane for Asian iverson's position in this game but opting to go a little bit of a different board than what he had last time the oriana goes in over the karma for just two sork over two invoker and what's invoker really benefiting right your main carry this mirror is already having that blue buff value so you don't need to generate any more mana for her so i think that's actually a really good little small tech to just get that much board efficiency out there local hunter streak does get snapped because sub zero arc did level kind of a trademark of a Caitlyn player right pushing that tempo even though he didn't get stars or born the second augments come through is going to you know, not be anything crazy combat caster six noxus is going to be on the board however even if this isn't the commit for the entire game it could be actually here for a while yeah the, the thing is you know Weijin's on inconsistency but this board is actually pretty good for streaking however what's great about that is Weijin can kind of just stay at this power level for a bit and he can actually level a bit quicker especially since we were talking about hey maybe playing around the five cost maybe Weijin can't go fast nine but he might be able to go eight very quick build a board there and then try and push to nine afterwards and I think that Weijin having a relatively cheap board at 14 gold and having already 40 gold here and inconsistency is in a really good spot to just try and econ be a little bit greedier this game yeah 100 percent socks on board with noxus as well three items slammed on samira that could very well pivot into either aphelios or zeri i think socks is gonna be super open to both of those routes um and aphelios actually while the stats from yesterday were not great and the first place rate did go uh down a little bit you know from five percent to like have that to like 2.5 some of the players in this lobby actually had some very solid aphelios uh games yesterday uh dqa played it a couple of times and talked forward a couple of them uh another one was Lil Kahuna as well actually played Aphelios uh, a couple of times top four both of those games as well so players in this lobby especially maybe it's just a bit of a coincidence but they seem to be able to pilot that composition not to a first place generally but still to wins actually Soj is one of the players that got one of the only wins I believe uh or no he top four didn't win excuse me but still a lot of players in this lobby playing that line yeah well DQA at the very least not playing at this game this is going to be that built over uh, and he is starting to get towards where we will see the cash out, right? Seven, you know, we were talking seven, eight, nine. Those are kind of the losses uh, that you're looking to find it. He's, he's been able to uh, conserve 36 HP here on the seven loss, which isn't particularly high, but it's also not particularly low. I think DQA has done a pretty decent job, especially since he was uncontested on the, uh, the loss streak. So now he's got 70 gold right now, wants to go to seven with a lot to roll and make a very big board. That loss kind of hurt quite a bit. We'll see where his HP ends up towards the end of that 24. 24. Wow. And so he'll he'll be looking to try and get that cash out after carousel. Yep, go level seven, roll it down. Hope to find a Zeri. We get a chance to peek at the comps right now. No one has really their four cost units online right now. Besides for, I mean, Soju's running with a Gwen right now. No items or anything like that. It's just on the board. Um, for a little bit of extra power but really this 3-5 is where we're going to see the lobby tempo start to shift a lot especially from players like DQA and perhaps Milk as well yeah DQA actually finds an Urgot here we see some slams of items uh the makings of a bloodthirster spread out between the Renekton and the 
Tristana, so that will be able to go straight to the Urgot alongside a Hodge that he has on the bench. So that's immediately a lot of power that can go to this board as he levels to seven and starts looking for more. And that in itself potentially Zary can find some wins. And there's Zeri and two Jinxes in that shop. That's insane. He's got a Tristana replacement if he wants to play more Gunners. I don't think that's going to make the board just yet, though. Wow, Ryze even being found on stream to generate some of gold potentially. It's gonna be hard to fit it in this board, might not have a chance to do so, but just finding it's kind of crazy. Robotic arm being the Zeri mod as well. Some solid items to slam. It could be DQA aggressively slamming things like a Hodge and an IE. Doesn't maybe have to be that greedy. Maybe DQA greeds one more loss. It depends on the matchup, however. But Sox has gone level seven as well, uh, trying to push the tempo of the lobby. So DQA not continuing to slam items might lose this one yeah i think he's he's actually it looks like he's playing this for the loss right he's got four bruiser in so it's gonna buy time for the zeri and the ginsu to stack she should be able to kill off a lot of the board it's actually very close but it does feel like sock still should be strong enough to win this yeah. looks like zeri should be able to pick up one or two more kills and then it'll be it yeah there's, there's one. The one. Oh, it doesn't quite get two but okay that's loss. a good loss and his his board is ready to be so spiked it's ready to be so much stronger than the rest of the lobby nine loss for dqa is gonna send it a little bit more here try to find some upgrades sitting on a decent amount of pairs lissandra now has potential to be upgraded would have to drop something like a, a four bruiser to put it in you know ash for the dead eye but not going that route going to ins oh I, I is, is going to put the put it in for the frail yard is going to actually drop for zon out of there drop the ergot for now not going to sell it because that sword is there and ergot's just a really good unit is trying to slam items at this point tg slam trying to get the round win against soju who's also a zeri player this is a huge round yeah so you found the zeri he's got some front line with this echo too however it does feel like you know dqa is a much stronger board there's the freljord gonna get the shred through he still has the sichuani alive and the lissandra alive in front of the zeri that's gonna be the cash out for dqa on a nine loss he's down to 15 hp but that is gonna be a massive dino and a massive cash out we'll see what he can do with everything he gets items gold whatever just gonna have to watch what dqa can put together let's see it's so many golden orbs cast what's going to come out through them oh we get a tactician's crowd and aphelios upgrade another aphelios on top but a bunch of gold Okay, Tactician's Crown is solid, but honestly, everything else, a little bit of gold to recover, but not exactly the, the best. I think a lot of that power is going to come through with the T-Hex to hopefully be able to carry DQA's streak forward. Yeah, and he's, you know, he's still playing around this Bruiser instead of trying to get that, uh, that Urgot in with the Bloodthirster, trying to get more items, items on that. Very good Zeri items being able to be picked up. Finds a Jinx too. Still not making the board. There it is, finally going to get rid of that Renekton find Sejuani 2 as well oh sitting on things like three bruiser three gunner three Zon has to find a way to get one of them in and yeah the Urgot is going to go in can't play the Aphelios 2 oh is maybe deciding to no no just is going to swap the Zon mods off I suppose see where exactly wants to place these Zeri has no healing right now so oh excuse me there is some in the augment apologies but is going to be slamming things like a runans in there try to continue the streak forward once again yeah i mean should be in good shape for quite a while that sejuani is going to upgrade the front line quite a bit the t-hex can make up some of the damage right 30 stacks on stage four is, is incredibly strong right so uh you know dqa should be safe for a while that board isn't turbo capped maybe somebody can find uh something a little bit better but 53 gold is quite a power spike above most of the rest of the lobby i mean especially someone like Weijin sitting on an 18 gold board here's the prismatic lobby that or the prismatic augment that we were waiting for it didn't come through earlier but infernal contract not going to be the take that's going to be a re-roll for a free gold neg dqa is not really in a spot for it's almost like yeah if you're playing piltover and you have a big cash out you're gonna streak forward you maybe get tempted to take something like a golden egg um because you have the time that has guaranteed board strength so dq is probably considering it uh, i wonder if he thinks he's strong enough Cass. what do you think i mean it, it's it's as you said right he just cashed out so there is like potential that he is strong enough to streak with it but you do have to remember i mean everyone else is getting a prismatic so someone might be able to find a really good way to spike heavily and then you're in trouble because if yep. you lose a round just because you lapsed in power uh then yeah you're, you're done for so finding some more combat power now so that you can actually push to level eight push to level nine instead of having to roll down uh does make a little bit more sense to me 
Yeah, some more healing with the harm assist coming through. Doesn't matter that the Zeri doesn't have a uh, healing uh, item on her own. She does get kind of sent really, really low there just from some ambient damage. But the rest of the board, again, especially that T-Hex, is powerful enough. And now we got to start to worry about players in the rest of the lobby, right? Soju on a six loss streak, dipping a little bit low in HP here, at sitting at 36, but does actually snap it, roll down very heavily. We see on level seven only has 10 gold left. Milk did something similar. It seems like kind of sending it to zero every single turn. So we got to start to watch the players at the, at the top of the lobby in HP right now. Lil Kahuna, 73 HP with over 50 gold. Socks as well, a healthy amount of gold as well and decent amount of HP. Yeah, and look here, Weijin was playing around the Ari with this champion duplicator. Here it was is. Was able to hit on eight. He's not low enough to guarantee an Ari pick off of the carousel here. And unless he takes a rather big loss, he's probably not dropping below Soju. Uh, however, if he does and he's able to get an Ari off of carousel, he gets Ari two and Weijin is in an insane spot from there. But still, he was able to kind of keep this much HP with a very cheap board and it allowed him to go to eight quite comfortably. Yeah, board value 45 right now, kind of middling in terms of the rest of the lobby. Some players are in the mid or high 50s, but look at this RE damage. It's insane. It is going to struggle to take down Urgot, though. However, if everything else is dealt with and Urgot is the only unit left alive, it should still just be a pretty easy cleanup. And there we go. The RE cast comes through to take out the Samira in the back line. So no priority pick for Weijin and looks like no RE either on the carousel. That would have been massive, but I think players are good enough to deny that in this level of play oh, even yeah. if it was on the carousel oh absolutely i mean i don't think weijin is getting one there pretty much anytime soon but we do have the warlord's palace coming up and that could give you know weijin enough gold to try and either roll down heavily or push towards nine it could give you know of course items are going to be big but there's a lot of different things that it can give um and that could lead towards uh weijin finding this ari a little bit sooner than you would usually expect yeah 100 percent Taking a look at Lil Kahuna's spot. That's the Invoker board. Invoker struggled a lot yesterday um, and the statistics uh, averaged around a 5.0, even though it had a kind of decent sample size. Um, players kind of going for that AP direction, maybe not landing on Sorks, having early Invokers with the Karma, with something like an early Galio too, but really it's just not able to find that much success Lil kahuna still rolling trying to find some of these upgrades wants all of these units to be tier three but we're sitting on what five karmas six oh no uh oh no we're on one karma away there's another karma two on the bench so one karma off Lil kahuna is probably gonna send it deep here to try to find that upgrade because karma three is where this composition really shines yeah it's actually crazy he just finally hit the sixth invoker he didn't have the lissandra on his bench or on his board uh throughout all of this time um so it, it looks like he hit it right at the end didn't get the full pivot in to play the six invokers or maybe he just didn't want to yet until level six but um yeah there should be some big power spikes if he can hit that karma three get six invoker in might give him a little bit more time to try and make it to level eight find that Ari in there is the there karma we go. three immediately karma three is gonna rng some some items on there put actually both karmas in um, does pop off the Archangels and the Trickster's Glass. And this is actually really good items, I think, that ended up on the Karma. That was pretty fortunate for Lil Kahuna. And now, two Galios away. It's like, do I sit here and roll? Maybe you still find uh, uh, upgrades like the Lissandra 2 and the Taric 2. So I actually wouldn't be surprised if Lil Kahuna still decides to roll. Maybe using this Karma 3 as a little bit of our Econ recovery point, make it back up to 50, and then kind of decide what to do from there and assess the rest of the lobby. Yeah, for sure. I mean, right, still being on Shen 1, Taric 1, I mean, your frontline is still quite weak. And yes, you have the potential of hitting a Galio 3 to help beat that up as well. And that can be, you know, make oh, or break. Invokers continues to just do damage over time with the Karma just continuing to blast out. And I mean, honestly, these items are insane, right? Getting that crit and then also the Sniper's Focus because Karma can hit you across the entire board and that will get so much compounding damage. Definitely. And before, quickly before we move on to looking at this, I want to point out that Lil Kahuna had one game in focus yesterday and they went eighth. So the confidence to be able to bring that back into day four of competition and try to find success just speaks to the confidence of knowing that play can work out. But now looking at Sub-Zero's decision points, it's just going to be taking that first one presented with the Dragon's Claw, finding some upgrades as well. Reforging the tier is going to be a rod not quite the edge of night that would have loved yep. to be on the yasuo i'm um, still gonna be three solid items but edge of night really is the most important 
yeah, I was fishing for Vest and knew that, hey, I can always slam IE if I don't find it. It goes well with the Hodge. Yep. However, it's still going to be a lot weaker than if you can find Edge of Night. It's just so important to have that effect of becoming untargetable for the Yasuo. And now, going to level the 8, try and roll down, find this Yasuo 2. Pretty solid Challengers there board, but we know that Challengers have not been doing so well. However, this was played from really good tempo and with a lot of money due to the fact that he was playing inconsistency. When we look at the Augments, having Hodge on both carries with Idealism and Social Distancing to give the flat AD to compi compound with the uh, base damage that you're getting, yeah. I, I think this is a really good setup for Challengers and it should allow him to at least uh, win a couple of rounds here, probably make it towards that top four. 100 percent but now soju one hp all of a sudden gets his carry effort but also good effort from him onto lux as well both carries are tier one ergot with double bt and hand of justice it's not going to be enough it looks like the zeri gets taken down the ari and the lux providing too much damage and soju goes fast eighth here in game number one yeah really rough game for soju we didn't get to see a ton of what was happening on his board but we know that the zeri was heavily contested and we know that soju committed to it very early on with that zon heart so it seems like he just went to seven rolled down only hit the one zeri didn't find the rest of the comp and it just kind of went eighth from there so unfortunate for soju but i, I think he's a player that can certainly bounce back as we move on but jump into connor's board freljord soul he's on four freljord with an ari to carry as well so a couple players playing that ari Oh, I really like this, actually. This is kind of what I like to uh, kind of determine to be a creative board, right? You're not going to be playing a standard cookie cutter comp like you have the Lux Ari, but it's not going to be vertical sorks by any means. It's that Freljord splash because the Freljord um, augment came through there. And that's huge. Having that Freljord stun come through, both stunning and getting that mana shred, allowing the time for Lux and Ari to deal the damage. The front line is still very good as well, buying a ton of time. I really like this board from Connor is me. Uh, I'm continuing to be very, very impressed. Impressed. Yeah, I mean, this is fantastic. Unfortunately, uh, that uh, Ergot, Ergot comes in the back line and messes it all up on I'm the sorry. Sorks. I the, the front Look, the front line is buying time. They're alive still. Yeah. <laughs> Problem is, is Ergot came into the back line and just deleted <laughs> everything. So a little bit unfortunate for him, but Socks has this really powerful Ergot, has that Death Defiance on it. He's able to find a really solid board to work with. And so Socks made it to level eight. Pretty decent board right now. We'll see if he can hold on. He's only at 27 HP as we actually lost Milk as well. So both Milk and Soju from the study wow. group that was so dominant yesterday going out 7th, 8th in our game number one. Yeah, that's a really, really sharp contrast to the confidence coming out of like, oh yeah, our study group is absolutely farming the competition. Not doing too hot in game one. It is just game one. However, I know both those players are going to have the potential to come back here. But now we got to focus on the rest. DQA, the next player. I was going to say on the chopping block, but not really. He's an eight win streak. He's saving up gold to go to nine. Even if DQA takes one loss here, he, he might survive it as well. Zeri 2 is upgraded. The board is fantastic. That T-Hex is still going to be shredding entire boards almost on its own so dq is in a fantastic spot to win this lobby if he does get to go nine safely and cap the board out with legendaries yeah and between harm assist and leech you know these re boards that are on re1 just can't do anything to him right the wave comes through exactly. and everything just heals immediately right back up so he's got a really good position into the rest of the lobby into what everyone else is playing and with all that extra gold he should be able to easily go nine dqa got the cash out and he has capitalized very heavily Definitely now players are quickly falling all around him. Connor is me on 15, Socks on 12, Vision Iverson on 7. Just gonna be one or two more losses before we have our top four situation happening. Sub Zero Arc still preserving a ton of HP at the top, has rolled down a lot and not gone to level nine, but still a, a fantastic job in the lobby. There's still a little bit more to go for DQA here, right? Diz gonna level to nine, not gonna want to wait any longer as Scion wants to make its way onto this board, especially especially because of that bruiser heart getting four bruiser with the scion is, is huge levels of power but you're not going to want to play it over something like a heimerdinger turns out he's considering the lissandra swap out as well not really going to absolutely need the freljard because there is still a little bit of shred happening with um the potential of the next heimer uh, upgrade that comes through and the senna having a last whisper yeah i mean crazy that it got a last whisper heimer off the carousel absolutely yeah. insane for <laughs> Uh, DQA to be able to pick up. It spikes his board so heavily immediately, allows him to get rid of Freljord, play a stronger front line, and then from there, he's able to just get the shred where he needs it on the Heimer, on the Senna, and wow. Socks actually looking to take a huge amount of damage. These carry items never found their wow. way off of Samira, and yeah. it looks like Socks is going to take a huge hit. Will go down to five here? 
Negative five. Okay. I was like, I was like pretty sure he is gone. I was like, what's yeah. going on here? That was a big um, loss. Yeah. Big loss. Socks goes out. Connor. Three HP in a dream. Never had the opportunity to find an RE2. I know the unit's a little bit contested, but this is kind of one of those uh, boards where you just want to kind of scam out any single placement point possible. The Zephyr cheese is going to be huge. Where does it land on? That's going to be a huge determiner of what happens in this next fight. Yeah, watching the Zephyr. Who's in his pool? We'll see. No, that Zephyr's not going to connect onto anything too valuable. Just going to hit the Casio. This is little Kahuna's Invoker board. Just gotta watch this karma. Oh, that damage so is damage. huge. And the third cast might be able to just wrap around and take out the back line immediately. Does not quite get it. So the Ari does get a cast. It will mitigate the loss, but I'm not sure that Ari can actually win from here. That is that karma three. Gonna be able to turn its attention to the back line. And there it goes. Connor not able to get much more than maybe this. He killed maybe enough. a top four. Wait. at minus 10. I'm pretty sure Connor yeah. should be a little bit, uh, a little bit more healthy bit than that. Here. Yeah, Connor. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Connor able to top four there. Really creative board to make it to the top four. It gets it over Weijin, and it felt like Weijin's spot was really great earlier on. Just not able to ever find that RE2 with the duplicator. No, was not able to find it. And, and that's kind of just the difference of a few unit kills and fights even leading from, you know, stage two, stage three. That last fight was really indicative. If that Karma um, had shot into the back line, killed the R a little bit earlier, that could have been Connor in fifth and Wage and Iris in taking the top four. It's just a one point difference, but every single point adds up, especially when we take things like bonus points into account from yesterday and things like that. But all of a sudden we're at our top three. We're going to have the neutral round, see what item picked up. And idealism for another hand of justice for the Gwen. Shadow Isles online as well, buffing up the Gwen and the Callista. Sub Zero Arc has made this composition that has placed traditionally very poorly in this meta, in this tournament, and has made it look really, really good. Yeah, I still kind of worry about its matchup into DQA. I think that's where he finally got the loss after going on yeah. a four streak. However, this is still, you know, he saved enough HP. The augments were so good that he might be in position to get a second. And hey, maybe he goes to nine and finds a way to actually beat this. But you have to watch versus DQA right now. See how close this fight is. I, I would imagine it's actually not very close. But we're watching the Gwen. The Yasuo has made it the back line. It's doing some big damage. Kaisa goes down too quick. And yeah, it is not close, no. <laughs> unfortunately. However, that's just kind of challengers. It's, it's gotten to the point where it's pretty capped out. And now Sub-Zero is just hoping that he's held on to enough HP that little kahuna will go down before he does yeah it's definitely a potential here even into the uh, 1v1 matchup with the challengers versus the invokers if yasuo finds his way into the back line takes out the karma that can be a fight win so a lot riding on the yasuo placement the karma placement and just a little bit of fight rng however dqa sitting pretty at the top there um uh, unless some crazy things happen in the karma matchup with dqa it should just be a walk in the park for a first place yeah, I think there's just far too much beef and then having the double sustain augment actually makes it so the karma, if she doesn't kill something immediately, they're going to heal back up. And I think that's the big problem we'll see. DQA is going against the ghost. So Sub-Zero Arc is playing for that second place against Lil Kahuna right now. The Yasuo um, hasn't made it into the back no, line. He dies. actually goes down too early, but we still have the Kaisa alive. However, the front line is still kicking. She takes a big chunk. She does go down to the karma. And that means this will just be a third for the challengers as Lil Kahuna makes his way into a top two with invokers which was arguably one of the worst performing compositions that actually had significant games in day three definitely even taking a step back taking a look at the holistic view of this lobby all of our, our players of pedigree you know all of them at the bottom but our newer players are lil kahuna um connor is me and Sub-Zero Arc, all finding their way into a top four is super, super relevant. Um, and when it turns into just the perspective of that old guard versus new guard conversation, it is going to be Lil Kahuna going up against the old guard of DQA here. It's going to be, you know, David versus Goliath here in this matchup. Can the Invokers do it? I'm not so sure. Look, I mean, you look at the board value and the Invokers are only five below, but it does True. feel like this is a much stronger board that DQA has with that cash out, all these extra items. That gold value does not tell you the story. Uh, completely here as we do have the Zeri just shredding through everything kind of the best comp of day three versus maybe the worst comp of day three <laughs> going against each other and DQA gonna snag that first hey they're both top two at the end of the day however so it still goes to show that invokers are not completely off the table neither would challengers as well but we're going to be taking a look into lobby d here with re-replay setsuko and robin songs all players of pedigree here finding their way into a top three situation more challenges well finding at least a top three 
three. Can they make it further? These are good items on the Yasuo and on the Kaisa. Edge of Night is on this Yasuo as well. We replay looking to make that newly signed Team Liquid proud. Yeah, I mean, and this is, you know, this is eight challengers, right? This is a way to cap this board even to the point where it can find those first. But going up against Setsuko, who oh, is on the six Shadow Isles, that is going to be Earth coming in clutch for Setsuko, one of the biggest Earth players that we've had, most successful in the tournament so far. But can he deal with the damage from the challengers? The shields are helping quite a bit, but the Yasuo is still alive, finally goes down to the Kaisa. And that is going to be enough from these Shadow Isles. Shadow Isles, Kisante as well, being able to kick things off the board. Re replay goes down. The Yasuo found its way into the back line, but those Shadow Isles shields were much, much too powerful as we see Robin Songs wins that fight over there as well. So 1v1, Setsuko playing the Earth like you mentioned as we get into Karis, so we get kind of a moment um, to talk about it. But Earth had amazing stats yesterday overall. It had way better than, I know obviously everyone, everyone plays Orin. A lot of people are going to be bot fouring, but on average, a lot of the Earth players are finding pretty consistent top fours and even a lot of lobby wins as well. And Setsuko, uh, a player that, you know, traditionally a lot of the uh, old guard players are going to be playing meta, going to be playing the Orin. Setsuko, one of the only ones to not do that and have a lot of success with it. Yeah, and look, he's playing the Shadow Isles line. We actually had a game where someone was playing Pandora's Bench Shadow Isles yesterday, and we talked about how good it is for the line since you do rely on hitting that five cost with the Senna, but also with double emblem, Cassante is a great holder because you get to go to four Bastion alongside this. And so this is a really, really well bit built board for Setsuko. And even though he's level eight, I do think it's possible he can find his win against Robin, who does have the Samira three. That has been the carry. But here comes the fight. There's not much more than that. And it does feel like she should be outscaled at this point by the board of Setsuko. The Ari, just an Ari one, does a wow. ton of damage still with these augments. And it looks like this is actually coming down to it as the Samira stayed alive through it all, survived in the 1v1 versus the Gwen. Crazy. And that's going to be a first for Robin, continuing to improve that first wraith rate with more firsts only. Robin, absolutely insane. Off of the back of the Samira 3 gang lead. Just face tanked to Gwen and did not go down. That was nuts. I, I do have to wonder. We talked about Robin Tongs being top 5 in 1st or 8th rate without a single 8th. And now <laughs> I'm like, I got to see exactly where he falls now. Definitely an impressive showing out of Robin Tongs and a great way to start the day. Now, I do want to take a step back into the first lobby that we were watching there and go back to a point that the two of you made on the day, which is that... We saw Lil Kahuna opt into this Invoker's line, and I believe Cassie you were the one that brought it up, that this is a comp that, in the data, is not great. And it calls back to something Mortdog was talking about yesterday, where he says, hey, we know all of these players can play the S-tier comps, but can you pilot these A, B, C-tier comps, which, when you have the conditions cast, you can still find success on? Yeah, I mean, I think that was a big recognition of items as well. I do think Lil Kuna, you know, you, ha you have to you have to say got a little lucky on which items popped because I do think he got the best yep. option as far as getting the JG Hodge with the Sniper's Focus, which allowed that Karma to do a lot more damage than she normally does in a normal Invoker setup. But that is still good recognition of her being able to use those because the Trickster's Glass was also a good option in giving that crit for the JG and giving you a second Karma. So I think Kahuna recognizing uh, what items were good, playing the two co karmas early to, to buy some hp with only four invoker and then finding the right time to go six invoker completely rolled down and uh really really well done to get a second with invokers which i think has been a, a very difficult feat so far i want to make a point to talk about the bottom three placements of that last game milk soju and Wajin, all of which had bonus points coming in from yesterday, Crowen. And we we talked about this at the Fairly Road Cup as well, where to some people, it depends on how you look at it, but I think it's worth it for someone like Soju who takes an eighth to say, hey, you know what, I didn't place eighth in that game. I went six. Six? I can live with a six, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. All right. I mean, oh yeah, there, there's, a, there's a big difference between, you know, going six and eighth, and especially with players try, like contesting each other. I think Melk and Soju are playing the same composition, and that comes to show when you're in part of the same study group approaching the meta the same way, um, you can contest each other sometimes, unfortunately, and, you know, sure. hold hands seventh, eighth. Kind of came through there. All right, well, the scoreboards are ready. Let's take a look at how the rest of the lobbies shaped up coming out of game number one. In lobby A, we saw DQA running that pilt over alongside Lil Kahuna. Lobby B, Casper, Wu, and Prestivant, one of the K3 study group making up for the rest of the others. HSA and AMD, a name we have been looking for since set seven, his, his rise there. And in lobby D, like we saw, 
Robin Tongs, and Setsuko. Now, Cass, I think it's worth kind of taking stock of some of the study groups that we've seen, that we've pointed out at the top of the show, right? Lobby A, Milk and Toju coming in the bottom, but in Lobby B, Prestivin and Kiyun rounding out the top three. Yeah, and then, you know, in Lobby D, Setsuko in second as well. So I, as much as in Lobby A, it was like, oh, what's happening to the study group? Are they faltering? I don't, you look at the rest of the, the field and they're still pretty dominant across the board. So they're still they're still looking great overall. Uh, and then when we look at, you know, players like Solus, Solus, uh, you know, finding an eight, that study group did, uh, you know, stumble a little bit in Shurima, even though overall they're still looking quite good, right? DQA found the first as well and, and Robin also finding a first. So th these two study groups are still, I would say, overall looking very dominant. Yeah, and just for all the viewers at home, I think it's worth it to kind of take a moment to take stock of these study groups that we keep talking about. The K3 Soju study group consisting of players like Soju, Prestivin, Kiyun, Setsuko, and uh, I'm missing Milk. one more in Milk. Thank Milk. you very much. And then on the other side, you have the DQA, Solus, Broccoli, and Robin Song study group that we saw really dominate the Freljord Cup and kicking it off with a great win lobbies a and lobby d respectively won by dqa and robin song so you know i think cast there's something so fun to watch when you can break down tft into these study groups it does kind of feel like it's a little bit more digestible because it turns into almost like a like a team game even though ultimately it is going to be like a, a solos format <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean it, it definitely helps kind of like quantify these these different players and even if they're having a bad result if their group is still having a lot of overall good results it does feel like their prep was good and maybe they're just you know, having a rough day themselves. And I think it's one of the things that did give North America the edge, and I think continues to give North America the edge, is just all these different study groups. We're focusing on these two because of how dominant they were in Freljord and how they kind of continued that here in Shurima. But there are multiple other ones that are still continuing to do very well, like Weijin's group with Basso and, and, you know, Malala and that whole group. Yes, some of them are missing here, but Weijin is still here doing well. You know, yes, not a great first game, but he was the highest point earner on day three. That's right. We'll have to see when the dust settles at the end of the day, where these study groups lie. So don't go anywhere. We will be back in just a couple minutes for game number two of day four of the Shurima Cup.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back to game number two, day four of the Stream of Cup. I'm Gangly, back on the desk with Boop and Mort. Now, Boop, we are heading into Lobby D for this game two of the day, and there are a lot of heavy hitters, right? We got your re-replay world champ, we got Robin Songs, we got Tetsuko, but I think there's also a lot of other names that are worth talking about that maybe don't get enough attention. The one I want to draw your attention to is Phoenix Ah, one of these players that made the final day in Frail Yord Cup, was top 10 in final weekend AVP back in set nine or back in set eight, but seems like not one of those players that really has the notoriety of some of the other top players in North America. Yeah, I think one of the bigger reasons is I think sometimes the stats can get a little muddled for people who are really successful on day three and not as successful on day four is when you whittle down the players and everyone's kind of the same level. It reminds me of like when I went to music school, I thought I was the best, right? And then I went to music school and everyone was the best. And so I think that is a little bit of what we're speaking to when it comes to Phoenix. Phoenix has also been around for a hot minute as well and has made a lot of final lobbies, has made a lot of final days, but putting the rest of it together to get to the finish line in that top four and represent the region hasn't quite happened just yet, but definitely something that we're going to take a note of in this particular lobby to see how clean he plays and see if those mistakes are going to be repeated like they have been in previous iterations. Now, on the flip side more, I think another player that I think we have to talk about, we haven't gotten to talk too much about him on stream, is Re-Replay, the world champion, the man who went and made North America king of the world. Now, I, I do, I just kind of want to get your perception because this is the kind of player that is actually a large part of TFT in, you know, in its history, but also was one of those players that didn't even make it to the final weekend of the Freljord Cup. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, everyone has their different comfort levels with different metas. Uh, Riri plays one of those players that doesn't necessarily grind out, you know, a thousand games per set, um, but actually was one of the players that would really deeply understand the stats and do a lot of research on the side. Uh, you know, he came into the finals of Monsters Attack just like really deeply understanding all the different lines. And so I think he's a player that as the game goes on, or as the set goes on, he'll do better and better. So. All right, well, game number two is ready. Boop, more, I will leave it in your hands, and I'll catch you later. All right, folks, this is going to be game two, like Gingley just said, and we've got a four, our defending world champion in this lobby, which is Re-Replay. And uh, something else I wanted to kind of piggyback off of you more when it came to Re-Replay and stats is going into Worlds, he actually had one of the better oh. number of games played as we go to Bandel Cafeteria uh, along with top four rates. So if those you know numbers stay the same, we already have seen the success that Re-Replay has done on an international level. Let's see if he's going to be able to recreate the that success here in the Shura Cup as we ride along with Robin's uh, Robin Songs, who has been playing out of his mind so far uh, this tournament so far, uh, Mort. Yeah, again, we talked about it at the start of the show, right? That Robin has kind of come in, starting to prove that he deserves to be talked about as much, if not more, than some of the uh, other people being talked about right now. And Robin, you know, coming out with those bonus points and a strong first place now, already sitting at ten. And, you know, just doing really, really well here. And I believe today, since there's only five games before we start cutting off, uh, you know, those points are going to matter very quickly. Mm -hmm. Three points could be the difference at the end of the day before winning and losing, getting cut versus not getting cut when we do call the players. But we're going into this early game and also want to point out, because we're riding along with Robin songs and we're seeing Samira like we will uh, for the majority of today, Robin somehow got Samira three uh, in that last lobby. And so even though it's a pretty contested comp, Robin was still able to get Samira three. Yeah, that definitely surprised me because, like I said, we've seen everyone kind of holding on to these. It's definitely the opener of choice right now. Uh, you know, even in this case here, we see a Tristana. Probably not going to start that up just because Tristana's really difficult to play here. Uh, might do it if there's no other options or no other drops. But, yeah, just everyone really leaning on that Samira. But to be able to get a Samira 3, I'll definitely be wanting to go back and watch that game and see what happened. You know, did he do a 3-1 roll down? Did he wait till everybody else kind of pivoted out of it? Uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see here. Has some interesting items here, but not really like Samira-based items as we head in and we get a gold augment, which is definitely what the Orn players prefer. But the other thing to note here is that because of Setsuko, it's Bandle City, which means everyone's going to get a spatula. That spatula is going to be used to feed people. And if you can get that started on a strong tank early, you could play that. So that could be an example where the Tristana comp could work with a very fed Maokai. Uh, but clearly I don't think that's the play here. It's looking to play that challenger line, which I like this here. Going to use that determined investor, probably place that on Poppy 
uh, who will die pretty quickly, or Maokai, either one, uh, and should give him a pretty good line into the Challenger line later. Yeah, for some of our newer players, the, uh, a lot of times what you'll see is they'll keep that Determined Investor on the bench, and when they know someone's going to die for sure, they'll pop it on so that you can get a guaranteed stack. So a lot of times at these earlier parts of the game, I think some people are like, oh, well, I'll just put it on Renekton, and sometimes you win that round and you never get that stack. Uh, we're going to do it now because you know we're the only frontliner so far, but that is something that you can do to make sure to guarantee these Determined uh, Investor stacks and become the Wolf of Wall Street at some point in the future. And like you said, uh, we are on Bandle Cafeteria, so we have have at the spats and you're going to be putting just naked spats onto your units because it's going to help stack stats onto other units on your board too so definitely make sure you're getting the value out of all the things that you can currently get value on at this point in time especially if you're trying to win streak yeah now one of the other strategies you can do on this particular setup here is if you have a lost streak start kind of like this rudir definitely with that 2-1 pilt over that everyone's loving right now uh, what he can do is hope that there is a spatula on the two stage two carousel. And if he gets that, that's going to be a free tactician's crown, which will be an upgrade as well as more snacks from that bandle, uh, the bandle city there. Uh, so again, we've definitely seen two one pilt over here with that pilt over heart be that kind of safe start. Uh, and so as long as he can continue that lost streak should be in a good position to turn it around as we've seen so many times this tournament. We've also seen these Piltover comps do very, very well, especially once that Zeri and Urgot get online. But it's going to suffer in the early game like it wants to, so it can start stacking that T-Hex for that cash out. We've been seeing 20 as the number uh, that a lot of people are going for. We saw DQA a little earlier go a little higher, uh, getting cashed out by Soju. But 20 is definitely kind of like the first break point that people consider cashing out on, uh, as we're still riding along with uh, Rudir here. And Rudir is probably the best new name that we've seen so far in the Shurima Cup came in with bonus points and you know coming in new there's a lot of things that you're experiencing for the first time which is why veterans tend to do better on final days super interesting to see if Rudier is going to be able to go against pattern there when it comes to these new uh these new players as we now are riding along with Flight Seamort yeah it's going to be interesting too we have to keep an eye on the spatulas because uh, you know we've seen a few people already lock their direction right we saw the Challenger emblem we saw the Noxus emblem uh, but what else will players be willing to build? We know things like Demacia, Shurima are not particularly popular right now. Uh, Slayer is one of those sort of B-tier options that someone could consider. Like here we're getting a glimpse of that Noxus. Um, but a lot of people are going to be locking that in. And that is going to cost them one of their components plus the spatula. So if you end up going down the wrong path a little too early, that can cost you. Uh, and so that'll be interesting to see if anyone has any creative ways to go about it. But again, Rudir and Setsuko right now, kind of our two Lost Streakers, will there be a spatula on this carousel? Really good opportunity for any emblem or even a crown to get uh, some extra units on the board. This is going to be a big deal, I think, for some of our uh, players on the lower side of the leaderboard. As we get this awesome graphic here where we can see where everyone is playing, of course we're seeing Samira's, of course we're seeing those Piltovers, and really nothing Ooh. outside of that so far as I'm taking a quick gander. Mort, what are you seeing? So the big thing here to call out is and if you look at Setsuko, that is two Sorcerer Emblems. He was able to craft one, and he was able to get one out of his Earth uh, legend that he's been leaning into here so he's got a very clear picture and we talked about this so many times yesterday right if you can plus two with the sorcerer that's going to allow the eight sorcerer option uh, that's going to be able to have a really strong late game and we saw Setsuko have pretty good success with that yesterday uh, mm -hmm. so definitely really happy to see him hit that and because he's got those two emblems he can use that to give even more snacks which I think is why Setsuko tried to one guy this portal knowing that he was the earth player allowed him to get an extra emblem extra snacks uh, and be pretty powerful here. Now on this board, we're seeing a Samira with a Deathblade, which is a great start, has that uh, Swain. Did lock in the Sharima emblem, which is definitely, again, unconventional here. So maybe gonna be looking to play something like Akshan, um, but otherwise this is an interesting play here. Yeah, I was actually tuning in, I think, who was it? Um, there was a good debate on uh, Dan's stream about Akshan and Deadeye and how Vertical Deadeye might be a pretty successful comp if you're able to run it correctly if you get something like an Akshan early, but we don't so far. But I, in terms of Shurima, I think this is maybe the first time we've seen it um, in any kind of capacity uh, so far. So we'll see how long that's going to go. It's going to be the whole time because we already committed to the emblem, but how far we invest into it is going to be the question that's going to be answered 
answered here soon. But Chris, you know, making things happen. A lot of times in these tournaments, you, ha you think you have to play first or eighth. Chris had an eighth place in that last lobby. So now it's either, hey, we got to go for it. We can't replicate that eighth place if we do, we're out. But sometimes we have to play that first or eighth style to compensate for this eighth place and get that first. So really interesting uh, position for Chris right now. I wouldn't want to be in a position like this personally. Yeah, I think, you know, he's got a really strong start here. It's just a matter of what he can transition into. Setsuko, on the other hand, trying to grief Rudir here doesn't get him, though, unfortunately. Uh, and so that is not going to work out in his favor. Is going to get his five loss streak, though, pretty solid. Probably losing more health than he wants to with this Sorcerer comp. Um, but at least trying to do the lobby a favor and maybe get that matchup with Rudir. If he had, that could have been a really big swing here. Yeah, actually, Setsuko well, yesterday also got a super early Sork spat with no Sorks on the board and went that direction, what we were referring to earlier, and got that fourth place. So it's a comp that Setsuko has already proven to run really well. Goobums had a really awesome version of that Sork comp uh, yesterday that absolutely destroyed the lobby. So we know the win potential is there. Again, you just got to get all the right puzzle pieces together and make that picture for you. And Setsuko is definitely on their way. We're going to go ahead and put this on the Soraka for now as we're still kind of just getting ready to get through Krugs <laughs> at this point. It's, so just so we're clear, it's not okay to lose by one Krug. Uh, <laughs> I think he'll be okay here, but this is definitely not a comp that you're looking at going, this is going to be strong. Thankfully, the Oriana Shield's doing some work, and so yeah, it's going to be able to win this, but definitely one of those comps you look at and you're like, are you, are you sure about this? Are you confident? Right. Let's just let's just be careful. And so thankfully, slamming the rod on the Soraka and the extra heal made a big difference there. It's going to allow him to, to win that. And so, again, level 5, 50 gold. Definitely did that full loss streak here. And so, yeah, it feels like on the bottom end, these are the two big stories, right? We've got to keep an eye on Setsuko and the Sork, Rudir and the Piltover. And on the top, we've got Chris, who had that really strong start with the Deathblade and the Samira 2. But can he, you know, convert that into a comp that's actually going to win the game? And that feels like the big three things I'm looking at right now. Yeah, converting a good start into a top four is a totally different scenario for some people. And I also, you know, want to point out that our two friends on the bottom side of the leaderboard are the only ones not playing Orn. So we have Poro uh, for Rudir, which I think really just goes to show that hey, I'm okay with playing flexibly. I'm going to try to attach uh, certain augments to my current uh, situation, so I might be able to get power levels that other people might not have access to. So let's go playing a little bit of what's, I think, the current flavor, which is Earth, as we're going through this first round. And these Sorks are doing great. We also have Cho'Gath in the front line uh, that's going to be helping out as well. And the Sorok in the back line, that HP uh, help for uh, after that Starfall is really, really nice. I think we saw uh, someone run two Sorokas once just to feed health into the front line. All right, so Silver Augment here. Not going to be a big spike for anyone in particular. Uh, it is the kind of thing where if Setsuko gets really lucky, maybe he could find Sorcerer Heart. Uh, does not. Is probably going to play Transfusion here, since he's already down a bit of health. That's going to help him in the late game get that extra health to survive. Sure enough, there we see the Transfusion. He's going to be looking for those Sorcerers. He's got the Void to kind of help him out with some extra frontline here. And again, trying to get into that late game where he can play around things like the Velkaz, into the Lux, into the Ari, with those two Sorcerer Emblems, giving him just a lot of extra power here. Uh, looking on the side here, Flightsy, uh, you know, we've been talking about that. Rudir, uh, actually, maybe the health might be a little off. 79, if that's actually right, that's in a really good spot here. Um, but Chris continuing the win streak also. Yeah, I... One of the most impressive things yesterday that uh, we heard with Setsuko was on a 10 loss streak and had 33 HP still, which I thought oh. was pretty crazy. As okay. we get... All right, Mort, you take it away. Sorry, so Rudir, uh, Piltover 2-1 start, managed to get Tiny Titans. That's why we're seeing the health spike. That is probably one of the best, if not the best, start you can get here. That's going to allow him so much extra health to be able to loss streak. He could go all the way to 10, 11 to really guarantee that first place. And so Rudir taking advantage of that Piltover now in a, just an amazing spot for him. Yeah, I, I would be feeling really great if you're a Rudir fan. And, you know, honestly, with these new players, check them out. Go check out their streams. A lot of them um, are going for it right now. And show them your support. Flightsy now is going to be who we're going to be riding around with. And it's going to be the... Oh, look at this. We have the Rage Blade on the Zeri. We have some gutter, Gunners and Dead Eyes on this board. Yeah, this is a pretty good board. And we're also starting to see the, uh, the Shimmering Investor. That's going to cash out here soon. They're going to get their Champ Duplicator, their Gold. And that Diamond Hands, just a really good item for keeping a, a frontline alive, can put it on a, a DPS person to keep them safe. 
Um, but that cash out should happen this turn here on the eighth turn, I believe. And so, yep, there it is. There's the diamond hands. Normally you can pick up your gold and even slam this real quick to get an extra two gold as it procs. Uh, and so now you're going to be getting two gold a turn here, which is why this is one of the better openers if you can get it on 2-1. It's just flighty right now on that six loss streak, 47 health, is going to need to convert that into something pretty strong here. And so now we get a look at Chris's board here. Again, still playing off that Samira with the Death Blade. And that Shurima Swain giving that extra regen is really powerful here. Yeah, I'm very intrigued to see, like, I know this Noxus comp with Samira is is super strong right now. I mean, you're seeing people playing it in this particular lobby uh, so far. But again, there's always, like, like Setsuko playing that sort comp is a really great uh, example. There's always one kind of off than a comp or a not as popular comp that you can play during these games and get your tier three units and try to compete against Noxus. But in terms of where Noxus is now, where do you kind of compare it to some of the previous kind of super strong comps that we've seen in competitive? Like, I think a good example would be Kaisa in the past. Yeah, I think the big thing is that a lot of these players really value consistency, right? Like, there are definitely comps that can peak out higher, but it's very risky if you can hit it. Whereas Noxus, if you have that opener, it is very consistent, right? You can play around, get that Darius, and do very well. And especially right now off the back of Samira, you get those stacks very quickly, and you get that maxed out in a good spot. So I don't know that it's anything wild here, but ooh, we do see the duplicator used. We hit a Zeri 2 on 3-5. This is great for Flightsy now, has his carry, looking really good. Gunblade, not usually one of the S tier items on Zeri, so that's a little worrying, but overall should be in a good spot. I also like the use of the spatula trying to feed some snacks to Zeri just to make her a little more durable. Uh, but this is also one of the comps that doesn't take advantage of the spatula, right? You're not going to be able to build an emblem. There's no Zaun emblem, uh, you know, there's no Gunner emblem that you can build out of that or anything like that. So. Definitely not one of the stronger comps. And right now, Chris just really doing well with the Swain one with the Warmogs and the Sharima emblem. Just really hard for a lot of people to take down right now. Yeah, I mean, it is... Uh it's a direction that we've just not seen uh, so far in, in this tournament. So all that HP regen going into Swain, making him that nice tank uh, for that particular comp as we're going back over and we have six Sorks online. It's going to be the Azir Teemo this time. And it's just so fascinating seeing how many times that Sork emblem has swapped off into certain people as it's going to go on the Shen this time. And just real quick, if everyone uh, wants to go on a little journey with your eyes real quick, that number uh, with, it looks like a bunch of friends uh, hanging out together, that is the total value of the board and it's actually going to be really fascinating as we go through stage four seeing how those numbers are going to change because traditionally the bottom side of the leaderboard at this point should have higher value and they do on average I'm really curious to see how this top side is going to adjust to that after we keep moving forward especially through this last pve round so Flight C on the other side this time, and we're going to get that lux and a duplicator as well so in terms of where this can go we can still go higher yeah, he finally gets his diamond hands here, wins that fight. The big thing we've got to keep an eye on here is Rudir now, right? Rudir's in at 9 loss time. Uh, will it be a win, or are we going 10 loss with that Tiny Titans? That's the big thing we want to see. Rudir now on 10 loss. Uh, so this is, you know, again, if he can cash this out, we've seen some really big dinosaurs this tournament so far. But the thing I'm seeing looking at this board is I don't see a Zeri. And right now, the key to cashing out has always been find at least the Zeri 1, slap the items on. The other thing is that we've seen a lot of successful cash outs on 3-5 and 3-6 when everyone else hasn't really done their roll down. On 4-1, it can be a little bit harder because everyone else has, you know, started to spend their gold. That's usually when they do their big cash outs. Uh, and so having a Jinx 1 here, this is going to be really important here, does find at least one other Jinx. This is going to be really nerve-wracking here. Ash is not something he's really looking for. There's at least a Jinx 2, but again, Jinx 2 at 4-1, this might be a bit of a struggle. The Sedge 2 will help. That's going to give some front line. Uh, you know, maybe you slam the Giant Slayer here. Yep. Uh, you know, but again, no Zeri. Right now, every other cash out we've seen has been based around this Zeri. So we're going to have to hope the Sedge 2 and the Jinx can be enough, but on 4-1, I'm pretty nervous. 
Yeah, I, we've seen this Jinx try this before, and I don't think it did very well. Looking on the opposing side, where we're going to start with the Eternal Winter. At least that's a Swain 1 to start. The front line doing all right so far, so the possibility is still there. If you are looking to cash this out, you definitely still have that hope. The front line needs to go down, though, and it doesn't, and that is the problem. That's the difference between Jinx and Zeri right there. Just not enough throughput on that damage to the front line tanks. Yeah, and so now we're hitting that 11 streak, which again, if you can convert this with that Tiny Titans, will be amazing. Don't get me wrong, but without the Zeri, this might be one of the first unsuccessful cash outs we've seen uh, in a while. Uh, and so there's the Zeri 1, and so you know we're going to see that put in, but now he's got that struggle where it's like you want to move all those items to the Zeri 1. You really do. I think a lot of players would do that here. Zeri 1 kind of being generally considered stronger than Jinx 2, has the gunner in, but just kind of struggling with this decision. What's he going to do here? Are we going to move the items? The Zon mod, not something he's super excited about. Uh, and so right now at 19 health, he's probably got one more lost tops, uh, which if he were able to cash that out, we might see the biggest T-Hex we've seen all weekend. Um, mm -hmm. But because I believe Solus was able to get a 50 at one point this tournament. Uh, but otherwise, oh, up against the Zeri 2, it is with a Gunblade. The front line looks a little weak, but that Zeri 2 could just melt his back line. All right, let's see if this is going to be close to that cash. And at least the Jarvan avoids the Jinx, but this HP is just not lasting for Rudier right now. We're going to go all in on the next round. It is going to be Rudier's life for this particular lobby. Let's see if he's going to be able to pull it out here on this round. So the good news for Flightsy fans is Flightsy was able to cash out. We get a look at some of the augments here. Uh, Setsuko probably is the most interesting one with the strategist, maybe playing around that sorcerer Azir, perhaps. We'll have to go see later. Uh, but for now, you know, you mentioned going all in. I feel like Rudir has gone all in, and so yeah. <laughs> it's now or never, right? This is a 12 loss cash out. If he can get it, it's going to be massive. But if not, uh, and again, I feel like a lot of people would have moved these items to the Zeri 1. Especially with the Jinx and Shop. Yeah, this is going to be rough. Up against right. Re Replay, who's I got that strong Darius. The good news okay. is there doesn't look like a ton of damage here, but I feel like the Darius is going to stay healthy enough and the Jinx won't do enough, and this might be the end for Rudir. Yeah, the Darius is going to make it into the back line. One shot that Jinx. Welcome to the jam, everyone. Darius is going to go ahead and slam that axe onto the back line, and that's not going to be a cash out for the ages. We're cashing out of the lobby instead, going out in eighth place. Unfortunately for Rudir, especially with such a great tournament so far, that's probably the worst result that they've had. Newer player really going to hone in on to how we recover from this because that's a big aspect of these tournaments is when that eighth place happens, how is your thought process? How is your mental oh. after that happens? Two players out, by the way. Flightsy also out in eighth place, giving Rudir oh, the so seventh. seventh and eighth. At least plus one, but uh, definitely a very top-heavy lobby right now, and so that's like the, the big thing I want to talk about is like most of the two one Piltovers we've seen this tournament have done very well. They've been able to cash out around seven or eight loss uh, and then convert that. And so I think, you know, going from that excitement of, oh, I hit two one Piltover to, oh, I just took a seventh or an eighth, that's got to feel really rough. And for a newer player like Rudir, can he stabilize that mental from that? Or is that going to be something he struggles with? And so now we get to look at Setsuko's board who has the six sorcerer still playing around this Velkaz with kind of an awkward itemization here, but is on a five. Okay, there we go. Eight Sork. We've got the eight Sork. This is a big boost of power. Yeah, especially even with the Sona only being Sona one. Sona three is huge uh, when it comes to this comp. So this is a really great example of someone kind of playing with the parts that are given to them, right? Of course you want a better Sona. Of course you want to itemize, you know, something like an Ari or Lux at this point in time, but we just don't have that capability. So we're going to try to get best on board and we're going to do it this way. And that because of that, we have those, uh, we have a five win streak so far. And Swain, not even just the Shurima version, but this one too, stay in, stay in alive a lot longer than I think some people might have anticipated is this is going to be another win uh, for Setsuko and this sort comp which is starting to really heat I mean it is heated up we're on a six streak yeah I think the big thing there was the gun blade on the Velkaz actually providing some extra support for that Swain I really like that slam here uh, and Setsuko has clearly played this comp a lot the secret carry of this comp when you build it this way is actually the Sona the Sona does a lot of damage getting that built-in Sork amp uh, with her high base damage, and so that could be a really cool version. Whereas Degree here, we kind of see 
what feels like a much weaker version of the exact same comp, right? You only have one emblem, you're playing around a Lux 1 uh, with not ideal items. These feel like items you're going to want on that Ari, but he, you know, he spent all his gold, hasn't found that Ari yet. It's going into this combat with five Sorcerer, so it feels like he's a little dizzy here. Yeah, maybe just got off the tilt to whirl. We really want the six, especially when we know someone in the lobby already has kind of a better version of what we've been trying to play that we see on the other side right now. But the Lux is already on the Velkaz. The Velkaz wasn't able to get through the Lux. It's gonna be Lux versus the world. And we know Ooh. there's one unit that can steal some units. It is going to be that Lux who only loses by two, but that was also a really fun um, round to watch, watching those Sorks go after each other as we see another Loss here from Robin. Chris staying on top, 59 HP, along with Robin and Re Replay tied at 45, and then Setsuko rounding out the top four. Yeah, Robin's position is very interesting here. We're seeing a Challenger Gwen. You know, you can see kind of the side effect of slamming that early, but I think Robin also showing exactly why he's considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest, NA has to offer is because you look at this board, and I think a lot of people would go, this does not seem like a, a board I would play. This board looks, you know, not so great, but he's really just showing strong units, good itemization, good positioning, and good fundamentals that hopefully can take this into a top four. And so playing around those units like the Yasuo, the Gwen with those strong augments, uh, you know, giving the, uh, the red buff, uh, the fallen augment, and so some extra stats as well. He's got that Heimerdinger. If he can upgrade any of these, like the Kaisa, uh, you know, could be in a really good spot here. Honestly, I think the Gwen... Oh, oh. Heimerdinger 2, <laughs> hit any of these. You asking you shall receive. Mort's button has been pressed. I heard it. I heard the click. Uh, <laughs> but no, the, uh, the very, very interesting thing here is that like Gwen has been a little bit of an overachieving uh, unit. We're switching off, but it got us here, right? So it got us to a point where we can get our units and our items onto someone else and now play a better board, co more cohesive board for the rest of the day, or rest of this lobby, as the Shen actually going to be elevated because of that Zephyr. For no one really walking past, though, but we do have the Katarina in the back line already. Is anyone going to be able to deal with that? The ult goes through, the cannon is gone, and finally the Heimerdinger does turn around, but has enough damage been done because of that Katarina. Really great ult from Kaisa as well. This is pretty close. If the Heimerdinger is going to be able to steal one more unit, it's going to be right here, right now. The Challenger proc is going to help out, too, and it's going to be Samira versus Heimerdinger. That's Ooh. a one-unit loss for Robin, but that looked pretty precarious because of that cat in that back line for a second. Yeah, that was surprisingly close, but, uh, you know, really good itemization from Robin, understanding that giving Heimerdinger that attack speed to help deter it attack faster, really cool here. And so props to Chris, by the way. This is not a comp I think anyone would have expected to see a lot of here. Seven Shurima playing around the Akshan. Unfortunately, only has four Akshans, uh, but also has the Azir. And so Seven Shurima, like we said, not really a popular comp, but he did so well in the early game that health might at least preserve him to a top four. I just, I worry this isn't, you know, the board that's probably the strongest board in the lobby. On the other side, we see, do see Degree, who was playing that Sork comp, found his Ari. Uh, and so that Ari, once they get that big cast, here we see, is going to get some massive damage here. But anything it doesn't kill, that 7 Shurima is going to heal through. But unfortunately, the front line is just melted down. And so Ari almost getting a second cast here, but the Shurima trying to do its work. Hextech Gunblade MVP on that Azir. Ooh. Look at this. This was a lot closer than I think any of us would have thought. And it's going to be Aatrox on its second go around. The Aatrox could have taken that if the ult wasn't ready. Two less auto attacks from that Velkaz in that fight. I think the Velkaz ends up dying. But that was really, really close, Mort. Yeah, definitely really close here. Uh, and I think this is also showing that like some people aren't as comfortable with this particular portal. Uh, you know, you look at some of the positions around the emblems, you know, are you feeding that extra health to the right units, or are you feeding it to an itemless cled, things like that. Um, but overall, has this Noxus board that seems okay, but we've seen this Noxus board really struggle to cap out without that Darius 3, and so Phoenix, unfortunately, might just drop down into a 6th here, unless he has some really good matchups. All right, let's see how this matchup is going to go. Pretty curious about it. The Eternal Winter in the front line is going to help neuter that Azir at least for a little while. First ult from Darius doesn't really do much either because of that Gargoyle Stone Plate. <laughs> Man, that Nasus is not being a lazy Susan right now. Absolutely producing some good tanking right now. And that Azir just got enough time in order to make that work. Are we, are we currently witnessing a little bit of a shift? Is this a certain situation that we're not going to see again today? After seeing kind of like these, uh, the Sherm 
Comic-Con, and as year go through, anything about any of those stats that you've seen on the back end change at all? I think the big thing here is it was, you know, the, the portal, right? It was the Bandle portal that allowed for the Shurima emblem, which allows you to spike up much earlier. And I think that in particular has allowed Shurima to succeed here compared to other games where it's not. Now, Chris did just get another Shurima emblem, and when you have two, that does open the gateway to nine. However, he's only got 11 gold, so the odds that he can get to nine are pretty low. But if that were to happen, that does seem like a way to try to slam into that first place. All right, I think that is going to be an opportunity. Let's see if the cost is going to be too high. Chris probably going to try uh, to develop some economy for now. And speaking of economy, Robin's the richest in the lobby, 31 gold. That's a lot of money compared to everyone else who's still alive who've invested completely because they're very close to one lost territory. Phoenix in at that one lost territory. Setsuko getting very, very close as well. With all the Aries that we've already seen, it's probably been a little bit difficult for Setsuko to try to get to that RE2, but Phoenix might be leaving us on this lobby in this round. We have a traditional Noxus comp as well. That Darius is getting close to that Ari. Is the Ari going to be able to cast and take him out? We shall see. The answer is no. Yeah, kind of some rough positioning on the side of re-replay, but it didn't matter. It is the stronger Noxus comp that is going to knock out Phoenix. And the big thing here is that's going to put some Darius's back in the pool to maybe let him cap out and find his Darius 3 and so be able to turn that around. And so now we get to look at Setsuko, who again has that Sorcerer, but wasn't able to get the Sona 2 going and is now playing around the Lux. And again, 8 Sorcerer to me always struggles when you're playing around the Lux because of the single target damage. It's hard to really go. You need that AoE damage from the burst of Sorcerer. And so without the Ari and without the Sona 2, this feels like a much weaker version of the same comp. I think we had a little bit of this actually last time Setsuko played this, where the Lux just had to be the, the carry for a round or two, and we already had a Sona 2, and I don't think we had a Sona 3 at that point, so oh. a little bit of history repeating itself. Uh, the oh, Lux, no. though, Oof. Is, okay, so it does look like the Lux is going to be able to get another ult off on this Darius. The Bloodthirster has already procced, but no, that's going to be one shot, one kill on the Darius, and you're seeing what would have happened if the Sona 2 was around and might have been able to get a couple more units off the board. The degree survived. Setsuko did not. Let's see what the final uh, HP totals might be. Here it's going to be Setsuko who falls down. Degree does win that round. We have a top four, folks. Yeah, Degree's got to be feeling really good about that game because, again, most of the game it felt like Setsuko had the better version of the comp. Uh, but by finding that Ari, gets a bit of a bailout here and is able to use that Ari. Uh, and this is what I was talking about where, again, it feels like Lux in a, in a vertical Sorcerer comp is just too slow to really get through key targets and so Ari pr providing that big AoE that extra mana read as well to slow down those opponents and so gonna be pretty happy with the fourth place here and I think the big thing to watch is Robin songs with that 76 gold you know is he gonna push to nine with this challenger comp and then Chris can Chris get that nine stream I think those are the big stars of the lobby right now Right, uh, degree and this is where board value is gonna be really interesting too because Robin sitting at 66 but a lot of gold. Chris also trying to get up to that gold once more because we are trying to push for that Sherman 9, it looks like. So 39 HP, 37. They got a couple mulligans to, to help out with as we get this awesome split screen. It's going to be Robin in replay, a little bit of R&R &R on that side, and it's going to be Chris in a degree on the left. I'm going to be casting the Robin replay round on that side. I'm looking at that Yasuo and that Darius in those front lines. How much damage are they going to be able to do? But the Darius, you know, Darius, whether it's Darius, whether it's Gwen, some of them have been able to literally walk into the back line and take down those carries and that's exactly what you saw on that side i'm going to be moving my eyes to the other side to this azir now the ario does go off and the azir still stays alive this hextech gunplay is absolutely doing wonders for this team any damage that those sorks are doing the hextech gunblade seems to be able to get back yeah, for sure. The Azir was able to heal so much of the damage combined with the seven Shurima. And that was kind of best case scenario for Chris to come out ahead with a win. That's going to buy him another turn where he might be able to get to that level nine. So kind of exactly what he was looking for here. Uh, meanwhile, Robin ended up taking the loss. And so now it's Robin in replay. And even if Chris loses the next two rounds, he's probably not going to get knocked out with 40 health. And that maybe will give him enough time to go straight to level 9 here, and so it's really going to come down to positioning. The fact that the Darius was able to just kind of walk back straight to the Heimer felt like something went very wrong. Really curious to see 
how the rest of this is going to go for Robin because we did do that roll down. We still only have, you know, that Challenger Emblem on the Heimer, which is going to help the turret. And they're going to be doing a ton of damage to that front line. This made the Azir look like a tissue paper, to be honest with you. Wow. So much damage. It was, it was still the Ghost, but that was still significantly better than any other round that we've seen. And we do see a Samir 3 uh, as well on the other side. So power level still creeping up. Gold also still on Chris's side. So Chris definitely could be looking for that level 9. We we're already level 8. I wonder when you're going to be able to lock that in, turn the ignition, as Robin now has the highest Borg value, but no gold. Look at everyone investing except for Chris. That's why these graphics are cool, because you get to see exactly when people are saying, hey, now is the time. Now is when I have to make the play, because everyone's separated by one HP. The top three right now separated by one HP. And with it so close, replay probably feeling great about going up against the Ghost. So I'm going to be looking on the other side. It's Chris versus Robin more. You take it away. Yeah, and so a lot of the times we talk about how Sharima is a little weak. This is the fights we expect to kind of get run over like paper, right? Challenger just kind of mows through that Sharima front line, isn't particularly strong here, and the Kaisa just doing a ton of damage, and ends up mowing down Chris here. The Azir still alive here, barely holding on. Azir finally on the Kaisa, but that Kaisa cast is going to clear it, and so that looks like Chris's last life here. This is why a lot of people aren't investing in Sharima right now. He feels like the weakest in the lobby, but that was a double loss. Uh, Re-Replay also losing, so they both lost oh. health here. Robin in a really good spot here. Re-Replay gets the Zephyr. Chris not looking too happy about that. Goes with the Juggernaut to maybe help his Nasus uh, be a little tankier, which is going to be good here if you can get that on someone else. And so I think the big thing here is let's try to look at Chris's board. If he, oh, does hit the Darius 3. That is huge for Re-Replay. Uh, but will Chris have enough gold? Will it get spent? We see it level up. Uh, go to 9. Will this be the 9 Sharima board? That's the thing you really want to see here. Yeah, also, thank goodness we replay Lost Against the Ghost, right? And then we got the opportunity to actually see some improvement there. Robin now. No one has gold. This is it, folks. 5 and 4 on the bottom side. 22 for Robin. We are an elimination station for two of our players. Going to be looking uh, on the board without the Ghost. It's going to be r, r once again. Who's going to be relaxing and who's going to be a little bit anxious after this round? Now it's going to be the Yasuo on the front line. We do have the Darius 3 is starting to welcome to the slam, folks. It only gets two in terms of making them come together, but Robin trying his best to stay alive right now. Is it is it going to be enough? The Darius does make it into the back line, and Robin does survive this round. Does Chris survive this round? Nope. <laughs> it was really close. <laughs> it was really close, but that Katarina healed right through it. <laughs> and so, unfortunately, that is going to knock out Chris. We didn't see if he actually hit uh, 9 Sharima, unfortunately, but it was, looks like it wasn't quite enough. It was going really well, and then all of a sudden the Katarina pulled out a slam here. So now we get our final fight here, Challenger versus Noxus. And again, once you hit that Darius 3, Katarina 3, usually the Noxus is kind of, uh, you know, favored a little bit here. Also, there's those two Zephyrs. If those Zephyrs can hit a key target, something like the Heimer turret, something like the Kaisa here, that can also make a very big difference to slow down that Challenger damage. The one thing we have going for us here is the red buff. And so we see the Zephyrs. Looks like they're going to hit Callista. And so, oh, the turret and Senna. The turret, not something you'd want to be hit here. So it's going to be all about the Kaisa and the Yasuo. Can they slow things down? Uh, are they going to be able to do enough damage? And so it looks like the Kaisa may have gotten caught, unfortunately. And so that's going to leave Yasuo. Yasuo trying his best against this Darius. The Heimer turret also doing work here. And that is going to be another first place for Robin. Just really well played, showing again why he might be one of the goats of NA here with back-to-back -back first on the final day. Yeah, and just before we get there, I, I want to take note that Kaisa went to the right, and for some reason, the entire front line, including the Darius, went that direction too, and then everyone else suffered because of it. So really well done by Robin. That was some good stuff. Got to call it out. You said it yourself more. So Robin with that win, 21 games in set nine, nine first place finishes. This guy's got a over 40% first place rate so far this set. Definitely something that's worth talking about. But I want to throw this to you, Mort. So something I noticed in that game is that a lot of re-replay success kind of came off the back of this three-star Katarina, right? You have, the, you have the tempo of Noxus carrying you through the early mid and the Katarina three-star with what I would consider a relatively interesting build. A lot of times you see people build Ionic Spark, Hodge, Gun, uh, 
Jeweled Gauntlet. But this time, Katarina had Spear of Sojin, Rabadon's Death Cap, and uh, the, the Hand of Justice. And something I just want to point out before we go to the scoreboard is that this is a really interesting build where it kind of covers everything Katarina needs, right? It has your mana generation, it has your damage, and it has your healing. And there's something to be said about even if you're not using what is the quote unquote best in slot unit, you can build item combinations that do exactly what your unit needs. Now the scoreboard's already, let's take a look at how the rest of the lobby shaped up after game number two in lobby a connor is me and sub-zero arc our resident uh caitlin and ezreal players taking the top two of that lobby lobby b casper Wu and jason java and lobby c ymdn and goobums lobby d robin songs and re-replay like we saw now i do want to i want to bring your attention to this one more lobby a ezreal and caitlin finding success does this, does this surprise you uh, it doesn't surprise me. I think we've talked about this a lot, that the Legends are a system that feels like it's still being explored. And there's been a lot of group think, right? Where it's like, okay, I believe Ornn is the best. Let's all go to that. But slowly over time, we're seeing a shift, right? We're seeing some people prefer Ezreal. Some people prefer Caitlyn. Some people prefer Earth. And it's been interesting to see people who have found success. Even that game we just watched, Setsuko used the fact that he was Earth and Bandle City to try to, uh, you know, take advantage of that and had some clever plays. And I think... As this system gets, you know, explored more and more, we may start to see even more explorations around these things that players haven't tried. Things like Master Yi, Vagar, and other things like that. Now over in Lobby C, Boop, I want to draw your attention to YMDN. This is one of those players that is making their debut this weekend in their first official Riot-sanctioned TFT tournament. I, 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 I imagine, especially when you're in a lobby with some of these really big names like Goobums, Malala, Solus, it has to feel good to come out on top in such an important day. Yeah, I mean, I think we can all kind of put ourselves in a situation outside of gaming where it's kind of similar, right? Like, have you ever met a celebrity? Have you ever just, like, sat next to someone that you, like, really, really respect? For some reason, some of us, and I'm including me in this, change their entire personalities <laughs> in order to, like, accommodate the people around you, right? So to not do that is actually, I think, pretty significant. But now is also something that newer players have to deal with. Also, what happens after a win, right? So I used to teach piano. One of the most um, common times that someone makes a mistake is after they fixed something, the very next thing that happens is they make a mistake because they're like, oh, I did it, right? And they can lose complete focus. So definitely going to be looking out there. But overall, we can talk about things that can go wrong, but obviously a lot of things have gone right. And we got to give them props because, again, it's tough being around people that you respect, that you play on these ladders, and you know just by name but sometimes just by seeing them and their little legends, right? So really good stuff from a lot of our newer players today. Reminds me a lot of what you were actually talking about yesterday, Boop, which was when we saw Rainplosion taking the eighth place. And you come to this pivotal point where it's, do I switch up my game plan? But more importantly, do I still have the confidence to continue? And I think you can run into a similar issue on the other end of that. When, when you take a first, you can't take your foot off the pedal. This is the time where you have to show that you deserve that placement. You can carry it on for the rest of the day. Now, we are going to go to a quick break. And when we come back, we will have more games for you. So just stay tuned for game number three of the Shurima Cup.
Hello everybody, welcome back to game number three, day four of the Sharima Cup. I got Casanova and Crowen back on the desk with me. I'm still gangly, but we're going to talk about the upcoming lobby, Lobby D, going into game number three. Now, Cass, there are a lot of players to talk about in, in this upcoming lobby, but the first one I want to talk about is Jason Java. The last time we saw this guy on broadcast was 13 points with only ga two games left to play, and somehow this player found himself all the way into day four. Yeah, one of the big things with Jason Java is he started the day yesterday playing Orn. He got two bot fours, swapped to Aurelian Soul, found a top four, swapped back to Orn like, okay, I've stabilized, takes another bot four, and then finishes the day with two Aurelian Soul games, uh, both of which were a one and a two, which let him get to today. Today, he's decided to fully go to Aurelian Soul. He's had a, a pretty good day so far. He got a second in that last lobby, and I'm just interested to watch another player who is taking a unique legend pick because we've seen such great success so far today from Connor's me on Ezreal and sub -Zero Arc on the Caitlyn. So these kind of off meta picks are actually doing quite well for these players. I think it's worth mentioning, Crow, and you know, the uh, Jason Java Aurelian Soul pick is not the only person who's not playing Orin. Obviously, we've seen a yep. lot of Orin this tournament, but it's worth calling out Setsuko, obviously one of the resident Earth players, but YMDN also one of those Earth players. And I think it's interesting to kind of see how these different uh, legend approaches really do affect the game, and in particular, how it affects portal picks. Oh, 100%. There's even another one, Master Ukanon, an Earth player as well. So we're going to have half the lobby playing not Orn. That's going to change up the lobby a, a decent amount, I think, especially around Earth players looking to get plus one of these trades. Um, Setsuko, I think in the last game, did go Sorks and ha had a bot four off the back of that. But still, he's comfortable with that game plan. Even more interesting to note the fact that Setsuko is part of that study group with Milk and Kiyun. They're all in the same uh, lobby here in this game and having different approaches to the Legends because that approaches the, the, the or differentiates the game plan a lot there. But but especially impressive here seeing YMDN and Master Uknon, this being their first tournament ever and approaching it with that unique style of play. And the stats from day three do back it up. Earth was played 43 times, has a 4.16 average. So the stats do definitely back up that Earth is a very, very viable style of play. And the win percentage of Earth is like almost double that of Orn um, as well. Definitely worth calling out, like you mentioned, YMDN and Master Uthon, the two remaining players at the field who are making their debut at this tournament. So, you know what? Maybe you could say they don't have a lot riding on their shoulders, but there's something to be said for a player who comes out of the gate swinging, making a deep tournament run, and making one that nobody will ever forget. But game number three is ready. Casanova Crowen, I will leave it with you. All right, thank you, Gangly. And that all starts here, right? Game number three. We'll see if they can continue to have good tournament performances they've already done great making it to the top 32 players here in Sharima cup and it looks like a unanimous decision to go to yorta portals <laughs> this might be one of the first times i've seen just a fully unanimous we're going here everybody agrees for once in a game of tft nah that never happens but we're going to yordle portals so just a standard little bit of econ for everybody if they don't actually like the unit that is given to them um but ymdn like we talked about they are one of the few players playing earth it has a very very high success rate and ymdn's doing amazing today with it has a third and a first already on the day so they're off to a fantastic start yeah, I mean, sitting in fourth place overall, and that's behind Robin and Casper, as well as Prestivant, who have all just been essentially winning their games, right? Uh, yeah. Robin and Casper both going 1-1. Prestivant had three bonus points, but has had two very good uh, placements in this first two games. Yeah, and to be amongst players of, of that caliber, right, and going toe-to-toe, -to -toe, that, that's amazing for your first tournament ever. Why well, I'm even making it to a final day, maybe even going so far as the final lobby. This might be one of those rising success stories that we see pop up. You know, in the past few sets, there are always players that stand out from like Asa, Appies, Rainplosion, Kyvix, players like that. Why well, could be making their name for themselves here in the Sharima Cup. Well, and, you know, they were dropped to Swain here on 1-4 to go yeah, alongside their Samira and their Cassio. So certainly uh, looking like a good start for this. Um, and we'll see if YMDN can utilize those to find a win streak or if the whole lobby ends up getting to play some Noxus to start things out. But this is at least a, a start that you're happy with. 
Oh, 100 percent going to be leaving the option open for the poppy too as well probably not going to be seeing anything like a you know kill reroll or anything of the sort or, um but still poppy two going to be a serviceable unit if you don't mm, get that items. noxus opener five item opener as well and items that are okay to slam there's a decent amount of options for both the ad and ap trees and i think that tome of traits assuming ymdn does stick to the earth game plan here is going to find some direction from that first and then pick what route to slam and it's just going to be yeah playing six tra or seven traits even at two one not playing just three noxus it means you get one tailored trait in um it's going to you know not be any amazing decisions picked up here however it is going to be two freljord you get to play the ash lasandra for three freljord on two one not something many players would do but this is still a, a solid opener and leaves ymdn pretty flexible for what composition they can go yeah, this is cool. I mean, you know, Freljord, this can be the Zeri or the Aphelios. We also saw someone playing Freljord with Sorks because they found uh, the uh, Ari and Lux to go with yep. it. And uh, with the Emblem, it's really good to have the plus one, getting to go for Freljord, get that stun. And the items were really flexible too, right? Being able to slam Morello on Ash, actually a very good uh, carrier of this, being able to hit the entire board with that relatively quickly and get that burn down. Uh, it feels really great. Uh, good open components, even while still being able to slam a sword onto the Samira. It's a pretty solid board that's been put together by YMDN to, to start this game off. Yeah, could even win this round, assuming Cassiopeia kind of wastes a cast here. Um, Ooh, and nah. uh, not quite. That was really, really close to being around win. Not quite, however, through failure, not quite enough value in this game. Mana shredding just a couple of units, like the Cassiopeia um, to cast doesn't really do all that much. But taking a look over at Amdi's board now. Amdi, a player that we talked a lot about after winning that mid set and then not really having too, too much they were doing after. But Amdi's back competing has made it to a final lobby again really want to see amd back in peep form because we know that he can do you know that we can he can compete with the best of them and win out on top yeah i mean surely we were questioning right because he was a bit absent in set eight even 7.5 it didn't feel as good as world's performance left some to be desired but coming back here in set nine currently in 12th place in this event and uh, of the games we've seen of ambi it felt like he's he's a bit back it's not fully the dominance that we saw at the start of set seven with amd but at yeah. least he feels like a very competitive player and that's always a lot of fun for us to see 100 percent not gonna be able to carry any noxus win streaks forward um but that's okay because he's very rich right now 20 gold before his stage 2 carousel md is in a very very fine spot so i can look over at jason java now we could be seeing a rexai reroller coming through yeah jason java on that aurelian but ends up taking you know that bard augment to kick things off trying to get those extra oh, components true. and uh, yeah, has some very good items for the rec side. Potential for the reroll surely could happen, but those are also great Noxus items. However, without the early win streak of Noxus, it doesn't feel as great to put that in. Um, but also, uh, Yasuo can use these items, and we did just see Challenger uh, find a, a win in that last game from Robin's Songs. Now, of course, it takes a lot to make Challenger's win, but Edge of Night could happen from that sword, and you've got, you know, pretty, pretty great Yasuo items there. Yeah, definitely. Rek'Sai actually wrapping into the back line right here. Could be seeing a round win for Jason Jabba. It is also important to note that, like you mentioned from that Bard Augment, the Caretaker's favor, you start getting components at level 5. So Jason Jabba basically is playing down an Augment for the first few rounds, um, which 100% contributes to the fact that this is a lost streak, at least for now. Might be snappy it because Rek'Sai oh, living with 1 HP and goes. gets the execute there. Wow, a, a huge fight win, especially because if he goes to level 5 next round, finds a component, slams more items, it could be carrying this three streak forward into Krugs. Yeah, it certainly can. And there's a Rek'Sai on the carousel with a glove. Has the sword open. Rek'Sai really likes to play, i.e. Hodge plus the Titans. It's a very good build for her. So uh, Jason immediately kind of having this Rek'Sai with a pair. It does yeah. feel like this might be a, a good Rek'Sai angle to play. The stats weren't great on day three, but we have seen Rek'Sai 3s win lobbies. It is a comp that can do that. It just heavily relies on hitting that Rek'Sai 3 at a reasonable time in the game. Yeah, fair. It actually found no wins yesterday. So like you're kind of saying, the, the stats are are okay for top fouring if you're in a spot like uh, like Jason. But yeah, we'll have to see exactly where that does end up because a pivot out, like you're mentioning, into something like Yasuo is still on the table. You don't need to 100% commit to it. It just kind of depends on where the rest of the lobby is at that point. Surely no one is contesting 
Um, so the option is still open. Taking a look at Cambly's board. One of the Orin players who are going for that standard kind of style of play. And the blue buff is on the Cassiopeia because of that Deathfire Grasp, going to be giving her a lot of power in the early game. And it's only a Samira 1, so not as much value that we generally see with the blue buff Samiras. Yeah, and you can see uh, Kembuli is holding the Tarek and the two Malzahars. This is a, a really great angle to pivot into Sorks. Blue buff DFG is really good for Lux, but also Ari. So uh, this is this is a, a fantastic spot to go towards Sorks. It's going to win streak for quite some time. Try and find your way towards that level eight. So you even have a better chance at hitting the Ari and capping out that board. Uh, definitely a great Sorks spot, but we did see other players angling that line as well. So we'll have to see how contested it is. Yeah, Kiyun was one of those players. I uh, had a Trickster's Velocause, was just playing Void right now, so not 100% committed, but with a pair of Velocauses, uh, could very much go that direction as well. Kambuli is such a strong board, right? Playing every single item slam for Tempo, the blue buff, the Sunfire, and the um, Ionic Spark there on the front line. Setsuko, a Pilt over player. So we get to see yet another really really strong player piloting this piltover line we saw dqa do it in game one all the way to a first place if another player is going to do it i think it very much could be setsuko and playing it from the earth angle as well got the tome to get the piltover emblem yeah another big thing uh we talked about this in the dqa game when we looked around it didn't look like lost streak was contested whatsoever and once again here in this game setsuko doesn't seem to be contested for lost lost streak at all it feels like everyone else in this lobby was playing for a bit of tempo you can see that by the hp values the next lowest is Jason Java, but he was definitely not in a spot that he was playing to intentionally lose streak from that from, yeah. from where he was. There was actually, while well, no one was full loss streaking, Milk did sell a bit of his board to be weaker to contest that, uh, snap that streak in game That's one from true. DQA. Yeah. Didn't quite hit that matchup though, but Setsuko is still going to be looking out, or was still going to be looking out for players to, to do that. But now we made it to Krugs, and Setsuko is on that five loss streak, he's much more safe because people are not going to be opening at 3-1. At Their board's going to be strong. Setsuko is going to be able to go for that 7-8 loss streak um, and, and then snap that right after the stage through carousel and look to cash out. Yeah, and I mean, I guess we did just see Rudir as well take an 8th, or well, a 7th actually, trying to play uh, this yeah. line after not being able to win a single fight. The Tiny Titans allowed him to hang on a little bit longer. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I, I feel like Satsuko is someone that I, I don't expect to take a risk that will end up in that spot. We'll have to see, especially on the 3-2 augment decision. If you get an augment that allows you to extend the lose streak into stage four, that's where True. that risk comes in. I think Mort set it up beautifully when he said, you know, you get into stage four and these boards start to get very strong because everyone's rolling down, getting powerful. Whereas at the end of stage three, people may be greeting and you can get that win. So that's yeah. just something to look out for is what augment does Setsuko get on 3-2? Is it something that makes him greet a little bit more? And if he does, does he still cash out maybe on 3-7 instead of looking at the 4-1? Yeah, no, that's definitely a great call because as you're mentioning, while a lot of people are going to be waiting until 4-1 to level up and like Mort said earlier, there will still be some people, depending on how rich they are, going level 7 at 3-5, rolling down a little bit. And I think players are more tempted to do that when there's a Piltover player in the lobby. If you grief their cash out for a couple of rounds and then get into stage 4, then that makes the rest of the lobby ca cash out, or excuse me, catch up and then prevent the cash out. And nobody wants to see a Piltover player cash out. It's like a 1v seven at that point everyone's a little bit on the same page be like okay let's let's try our best to send this built over player in, into eighth all right and it's going to be prismatic so this can open up a lot of avenues for you know a lot more gold or something else that Setsuko can use to live i think we've seen tiniest titans be a, a thing that people will pick up even at three two uh, yeah. for the built over line and that can put you in a, a, an interesting spot but giant grab bag what the forge, what the forge? The crown from master Iknon. <laughs> what the forge uh not a lot of lines that are playing that right now no, not quite. So it's going to be a Sharima angle. Chris did that in the last game, got a third place playing vertical Sharima. And, um, you know, these Earth players are going to be looking for those lines, very practiced on going vertical um, vertical traits. And I think Sharima is one that can find some success, Cast, I know you liked that towards the start of Runeterra Reforged, uh, playing vertical Sharima. Yeah. And I think Ukshan is still going to be a great carry right now. Hopefully find some Azir items a bit later. But five stream in the mid game is still really, really good. Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Look, I loved Sharima at the start of Rune Terror Reforged. I was playing a lot of Earth before a lot of the like really OP legends were, were found, and uh, I was using it uh, on my initial climb, playing a lot of Sharima. I don't like it anymore. I don't really play it that much. It's, it's, I, I just, I feel like it's too hard to get to the spots where it is incredibly strong, but we did see Chris get very close to that like full cap and actually winning out yeah. if he made it to the nine Sharima. So 
I, I don't think it's bad if you can get that early seven Sharima it's worth it a lot of times it's just hard to get there and this spot to me doesn't feel like amazing to get into the line but we'll see if he can find a lot of the two star Sharimas maybe get to seven Sharima and then it actually it, you know feels like a really strong comp Definitely, I got a chance to see how fat, how quickly the seven streamer can get online. As you're mentioning, still wasn't enough to win that last round. The Akshan won, not being strong enough to carry. Even though the items were very good on him, Deathblade and Rune, and some of the best two items um, to work on that unit. However, taking a look at the other side of the lobby, the top side of HP preserving players is Kiyun going for a fantastic early game build with this three item build cause, Tricksters, Infinity Force, and the Shojins. This is gonna be dealing a lot of damage in it. It's no surprise why Kiyun's on a four win streak right now. I need to draw attention to what was happening on the augments there. We actually saw a Piltover soul for Setsuko. Oh. I think he's gone to six Piltover, which we were talking about. Hey, what ways can he kind of extend this streak? He doesn't actually have to extend it longer. If he plays the six Piltover, he can just get to a stronger cash out at an early time and continue to play with that. So Setsuko playing the six Piltover on an eight <laughs> loss, incredibly scary. Oh, as, uh, as well, I wanted to call out a golden ticket for Jason Java. So committing to the reroll line yeah. uh, for the, the rec side, golden ticket's actually a really good way to make that comp strong because you just need to hit her earlier than oh, a lot of other three Sitsuko comps need to be Zeri. hit. Sitsuko gets Zeri a Zeri with a bow? With a bow on Carousel. Oh, the no, stars that is crazy. are aligning for Setsuko. Six Piltover gets a Zeri for free. Was on his side of the carousel as well. This is going to be such a treat to watch. I hope it doesn't come crashing down because so many things are happening so so well for Setsuko at this point six pilts over we see on the left hand side there it's going to be a roll down to try to cash out this board could be one of the strongest we see this whole tournament he's got an open bow on the Samira as well look at these three items for Samira right out the gates RFC Giant Slayer and the Hodge that's really solid Zeri items just to wow. kick things off yeah. he's gonna be able to make such a strong board immediately already has some, some like a bt uh for the ergot hasn't found the ergot quite yet however but has legendaries to work with if he so chooses the belveth is in there the Cassante probably won't find its way onto the board um is going to be yeah putting the six pilt over back in the oriana goes in over the belveth three really good items for the zeri like you said isn't placing the hodge quite yet it's actually oh. gonna be hodging the jace once leave that third item open is this enough to cash out right now yeah, I guess he wants to hold Hodge probably for Urgot later. Likes it a little bit more there. Maybe keep that item for Zeri to be some more damage. Doesn't cash out here. Loses by five units. He goes down to about 20, 20, maybe 15 HP. Uh, 18 HP 18. for Setsuko. Yeah. Really wants to cash out um, right now, right? Because as we were kind of saying earlier, at 4-1, players are going to be so, so strong. Setsuko gets Pair. another Zeri in the shop. Is going to send it down to zero. Try to find the there upgrade. And he hits it. Setsuko, Zeri 2. This could be exactly what needed to cash out that nine Piltover Law Streak. And this is going to be absolutely insane. Yeah, and Mort is giving us the stats real quick on uh, on Piltover as well. The the 60 energy on this is equivalent of a 12 Law Streak instead of this being a nine. So he gets three extra for free here by being able to go for the Piltover. I mean, I guess it's not for free. Sacrificing some early power by taking the Piltover Soul and trying to bank on being able to cash out. But this board looks pretty strong. Going up against the, the Freljord, going up against the Sharima of the Akshan. The front line has a lot of HP, oh, wow. but the Giant Slayer will help get through it. The Warwick might be tanky enough, but this is a very close fight. We'll see once that Execute comes through, if he can get towards the Akshan, but the cast is going to break through and kill the Zeri. It's not so enough. Setsuko still doesn't find the win, and he's going into neutrals. He's going to have to try and win on 4-1. Oh, no, that's not what we want to see for Setsuko. That's one of the matchups that was the worst to run into. The Shrima board was so powerful with the Shen 2 Shrima online. It lived for way too long, even though Zeri does splash around to the rest of the board. The Shriman's all ascending. It, it just was not quite enough. Setsuko has a lot of work to do, needs to continue to roll down all of this gold, hopefully find something like an Urgot, find the Sejuani upgrade, and find some good tank items as well. He has dropped the six pilt over. He needs to just focus on cashing out right now. 70 power on the T hex it's equivalent to a 13 loss mort is giving us the details and setsuko needs to find this win immediately yeah i mean he's finding a couple upgrades but not the ergot and the thing is is he actually has tank items but only in the context of using an ergot because they're bloodthirsters they're they're drain tank items they're not actually tanky on something like a sejuani but they will make an ergot a lot stronger being able to find that it is just ergot one the upgrades aren't huge 
Once he gets the items down, who's the fight? Who's the person that has to try and not catch him out? Oh. This board looks beatable. It's a three it is just Kaisa. The Kaisa, the Kaisa is very strong, but Milk, other than that, doesn't have much. It's only the Kaisa with three items. Is she strong enough? The Freljord comes down. A lot of damage. It's Kaisa is not enough. It's and a that's cash a massive out. cash out for Setsuko. 70 energy on the T-Hex. And what can he do with all of these orbs that are going to arrive on 4-2? Okay, Setsuko is a player that, you know, sometimes does get dizzy on these massive stuff, on these massive cash outs, but I think he's going to be well in charge of this here. That's so much gold, that's so many items, and the, 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 the augment coming through is prismatic as well. Golden Egg, Jeweled Lotus. Jeweled Lotus is the pickup. That's still going to be very, very good. The Radiant Bloodthirster on something like an Urgot is fantastic. There's already a BT there, but still going to be a lot of power. He's rolling down to find some upgrades. Hit the Nasus to Tacticians Crown to be able to immediately play that and can consider putting in the Warwick for Forzon and for that oh, it already has Juggernaut in excuse me because the Aatrox was found but then the Radiant Gargoyle Stone Plate as well Dvara Paula Stone Plate is going to re-roll that one and it's a Radiant Blue Buff rolls it again Titans. and gets the Titans oh, Radiant for the Titans, Radiant BT on Urgot you gotta be kidding me Wow, Setsuko just hit. The two Reforgers were exactly what he needed. It's still just Urgot 1, but those items are absolutely massive. And the 70 power T-Hex cast, nothing can stand to this right now at 4-2. I don't think anything can stand to this for the rest of the game. 6 HP is infinite HP now with this board. And you just <laughs> don't want to be on the receiving end of all this damage from Setsuko for the rest of the game. I cannot imagine someone beating this outside of maybe three starring a legendary well three starring a legendary right that, that'll do yeah, it yeah yeah that, that will do it but uh, i don't think anybody else is going to have the time to do so because they're going to be getting hit so hard by setsuko um so this is uh n nothing can really go wrong uh at this point unless some crazy you know zephyr or something something we get a Cassante kicking off the tx but that is going to mean setsuko miss positions as long as he doesn't make a mistake protects the T-Hex away from that positions, you know, Zeri on a correct side. This is looking like we're going to see Setsuko for a while in this game. So turning our attention to everybody else, uh, Campbell only has a lot of gold there at the top, Cass. I just want to know, 101 gold? Um, is Master Yukon a 75 gold? Players are going to be sending it after this carousel and really, really trying to contest uh, with everybody else in the lobby because this lobby tempo has changed so rapidly. Oh, it's hedge fund. Okay, I was wondering. It looked like our, our icon was a little different there. So it's hedge fund level up for Kambuli. He's going fast 10. So, hey, we were talking <laughs> about a three-star legendary, Crow. <laughs> Kambuli on happen. 82 HP going fast 10. Hey, maybe we got a chance. Fast 10 legendaries. Three star five cost. I, I really want that to happen right now. Level eight, 101 in gold. Um, still a good amount of HP as well, right? Yeah, 68 HP. Thing. Kimberly is in a spot to be able to take Setsuko out. If he hits pretty early and, say, gets the thing like I was talking about, gets that Kasante onto the T-Hex, um, uh, we could be saying goodbye to Setsuko in a bot four in a crazy world. But I, I, I like, for Setsuko's sake, I hope we don't see that. But also, it'd be so cool to see it stopped at its tracks. Yeah, I think by the time Kimberly gets to that kind of board, uh, enough people will have been knocked out by the power of Setsuko and just yeah. the rest of the rounds that it, it should be a top four. But I, I, I'm really at this point, just like there's a world he doesn't go first from yeah, this, this insane spot. And that's I mean, that mm -hmm. is just absolutely crazy to me. It 100% is, but no, it, it's these players like Setsuko and DQA that if they're offered the Piltover, they're able to make it uh, go into first places. Just it, it just looks so easy to do it, right? And Campbelly, yeah, is greeting out a little bit longer. It's not Campbelly being like, oh, I have to be the one to grief Setsuko and get strong enough to beat him. No, Campbelly is playing it for themselves. They're playing it for it even if Setsuko kills the rest of the lobby. That's a good thing. They preserved enough HP so that they can, you know, even pre-level to nine with 100 gold left at 4-5 go to 10 in stage 5 and find all those legendary units uh, Campbell's in a fantastic spot here and that's where we look at the conversation of that board strength look at the right hand side number there Setsuko has 68 and Campbell has 22 for the board strength that board efficiency is absolutely nuts yeah, I mean, he's still killing units, right? Because the, the items that he has on this Lux having blue buff Deathfire Grasp means you will always kill some amount of units yeah. Uh, with the locks, right? She's going to kill some amount of units 
in every single fight and uh it's allowing him to save a lot of hp on just like an absolutely horrible board with 22 gold right but that's mm -hmm. that's fine because you've got these items you're able to play around that as we see jason java has oh, hit has that hit. rexai and is in a pretty good spot with this comp however the hp is a little low and because of the existence of setsuko this starts to feel like a much worse spot than it generally would be yeah, we have the four bruiser in there, so not able to get the six bruiser capped kind of version of that Rek'Sai reroll right uh, so far. But still being on Rek'Sai 3 at the end of stage 4 is very good. Camberley is going to start to find some pieces, upgrade that board value. The board value jumped from 22 all the way up to 56 already <laughs> in just about 50 gold. So he's going to be able to econ back up uh, more if he wants. Didn't find an Ari, a little unfortunate, um, but does get one shred. Gets these upgrades like Scion 2 and Jarvan for the front line to buy Lux one uh the times even if they're not going to be lo or round wins they're going to be not terrible losses at this point yeah and still conserving 70 it does really feel like Hembuli does want to make it to 10 here just 100%. needs to have a strong enough board to kill a lot of units and even honestly he he'd like to find a board that finds some wins at this stage he doesn't want to actually be continually tanking too much because then you run into Setsuko and lose like yeah. 30 health and uh that's not where you want to be no it's probably be pressure to roll just a bit more here can do it next round is already selling units he knows he wants to replace to make that uh kind of econ break point here um going to be looking for 90 gold if he gets some of the gold from raptors has the edge of night and a bow for belveth if he gets dropped another bow that's rfc belveth one of her best in slot items just depends on what happens in this next can roll down because like you're saying dropping hp very rapidly for lost streak does not want to make that even more and it's a bow so rfc belveth is here Already yep, snap. Yep. Snap makes it. Oh, he as well. That's great. Oh, and he gets his Heimer off of Yordle Portal. Yordle Portal is actually so perfect for this because now you're just getting drop five costs every single time and you kind of just want all the five costs. You don't really care. Yep. Skipping these sh There's uh, an shrinks. There's an Ari. That's amazing with the blue buff. Okay, finds the Belveth. That was the thing that he was digging for. Now yep. he's got Ari items, Belveth items, but doesn't have the two stars on either. And it Cassante looks like he, he does feel he it. needs to commit further. Yeah, does pass the Cassante. And like I was saying, that's maybe one of the equipment conditions when it gets Setsuko, but he's not worried about that quite yet. Just he's worried about stabilizing for himself right now. Going to be going up against Kuhn, who is still stuck on a Zeri 1. But this is a triple item Belveth and triple R item Ari. Yeah, hasn't found the upgrades for the carries, but the fact is the items are so good on them and his front line is quite strong with the Scion 2 Aatrox 2. So able to still make it work, especially with the Heimer continuing to help pump that damage and maybe Embuli can start to re-econ back up, but it does feel like the tempo oh, of the lobby Java. spiked too high. This Jason Java is going to be our first victim. Yeah, the Rek'Sai reroll is not going to be powerful enough. The stats from yesterday don't quite lie. In fact, they're pretty accurate. Not being able to find lobby wins and struggling to find top fours as well. Jason Java, the first one to be eliminated, unfortunately, with the ASL. Even though he didn't really go the, the ASL uh, direction. Going to be Setsuko, next person, lowest HP, but... He's in a very, very comfy spot still as we get to see this board's power yet again. Hasn't found the Urgot too, which is a little bit unfortunate, but everything else is fantastic on the board so far. Yeah, he can oh, even smell. easily replace the uh, Vi with Scion when he finds it because he has four Piltover in due to the plus two Piltover that he has. Yep. Exactly. Urgot versus Milk. Milk actually having a very strong board. That Kaisa, if it got one more cast, actually would have made this fight pretty close. Doesn't quite get it, and that Urgot still just, you know, full health at the end of the fight, as you'd expect. Urgot 1, uh, looking like an Urgot 3 with those items, honestly. Yeah, pretty much. Urgot's being contested by a lot of players in the lobby, however, so might have to wait a little bit to be eliminated for Setsuko to find that upgrade. But man, Darius is trying to do a bunch of heavy lifting here in this fight, but the Morellos on the Ash is going to send Amdi out in seventh place while Setsuko just gets to passively upgrade this board yeah Setsuko just finding that Heimer 2 there's two Heimer 2 so uh we know that that's not going to be the uh the three star candidate for Kembuli yeah as we do actually see Belveth 2 just getting hit by Kembuli on the side that's a massive upgrade considering those items and realistically that is the board that Setsuko has to watch out for and you said hey he could still bottom four I think that is true I actually think Kembuli's board at this yep. point has a chance against Setsuko, Ooh, even with it. the 70 power 
uh, T Hex, but this is just going to be the Freljord. This is seven Shurima, yep. which is a big power spike for this with the three star Akshan. This is actually a very good Shurima board. Yeah, three star the Akshan, finding a bunch of upgraded frontline and a Zier 2. Zier doesn't have any items yet. Um, the Akshan <laughs> tears through the T Hex, <laughs> but gone. there's still so much more on this board. That feels like you were robbed, Master Uknan, for taking that uh, seven Shurima board and going six with it. But that's what happens when there's a Piltover player who cashes out huge in your lobby. Yeah, I mean, you look at that and it feels like in any other lobby that that is maybe getting a top four, at least a fifth. It, it doesn't look like a bad board whatsoever. You know, yeah. upgraded Nasus, uh, three star Akshan, great items on both seven Jirima, but nope. Runs into Setsuko, takes like an eight unit loss, loses all your HP. Master Ukon going to fall in that bot four. Yeah. Uh, five remaining players, Setsuko, Milk, Kiyun, Kembuli, and YMDN. Setsuko not looking to be the next victim. It might just be Milk. Kian finally able to go to level 8, still sitting on Zeri 1, Senna 1. Not even a Zeri pair, however, um, even withholding units like a Ari and Kimberly finding the Ari 2, finding the Belvet 2, like we just saw on that last graphic. Kian, really good frontline items on the Scion, holding an Urgot 2 as well. Setsuko wants to see players like Kiyun fall if he's going to be finding these upgrades, but Setsuko is trying to econ back up at right now. Um, we're going to be winning this round. It looks like finding 20 gold, looking for a level 9 to maybe try to contest Kambuli later on. Yeah, I mean, dodging Kambuli still, it's the only player that I feel like potentially can take out Setsuko. I still kind of feel like Setsuko's favored in that fight, but with the Belveth 2 RE2 hits, it, it starts to get a lot closer. That gap is probably quite narrow between the two boards yeah definitely milk winning up this matchup the challengers ionia do still find some success it's gonna be hard to kind of break into that top four but uh milk has i think found a really good lines build to do that with it's just players going to be around uh you know one or two lives left with the exception of ymdn and Camberley. Kimberly, of course, that fantastic legendary board. It's not going to be losing any rounds against anybody else besides perhaps Setsuko. So does Setsuko dodge the matchup yet again? They're in each other's pools to face each other, surely. Looking at the matchup. No, it's not going to be Kimberly. It's going to be Milk. I mean, Milk and yet again, not finding their Urgot 2 actually sells the Urgot pair. I'm, I'm actually very interested in that decision. Oh, um, really? Wow. But... The, the, because of that, this, this Urgot is still, you know, it's so strong right now with the items, but it kind of falls off, I think, against the legendary boards. I mean, it is just a one-star unit. I can't, I, I, those items are crazy, but I, I imagine it has to stop somewhere, right? It can't, it can't just yeah, go forever. True. It can't go quite forever. It feels super powerful right now because it is, but I think towards the end of that round, he bought the Belveth pair. Yeah, the gold is very low right now. And yeah, Sissiko even just hits Belveth too. Oh, Belveth Wait a too. minute. Okay. Replacing just, the Urgot with Belvet 2 with those items. Yeah, that, that's a high roll hitting the Belvet 2 there, but Setsuko played for that out and kind of got bailed out, you know, praising Mortag. He just hit. All right, looking at Kambuli, nowhere close to three starring any unit. So we're probably not Unlucky. getting our three star five cost here, even on Yordle portals, where you're going to be getting those extra five costs jumping in. However, should be able to build a very good uh bench for rise yeah to start throwing things out has a lot of extra gold to do so just a jarvan oh, two on the bench immediately there's a pair of aries hey maybe <laughs> three. maybe he's too soon Cass. i don't know i've aries a lot of gold a lot of gold to work with 100 percent 50 gold five aries i don't believe anybody else is contesting the ari at this point so if they're all freed up, surely players are going to be contesting them soon once they see that Kimberly is going for that RE3, but you still need to find some in the shop. And that's a hard thing to do when there's already five out of the pool. Yeah, and especially with a lot of players being stuck on level eight as well, right? They're not even yeah. on the nine shop zero odds gold. going for it. And here's finally the fight, Kimberly versus Setsuko. This is the one we wanted to see. But with the Belvath having those items, Setsuko even found an RFC for his Belvath. She's going to be doing a lot of work going up against the side of Kambuli. And it does look like Setsuko is getting the better of this fight. However, the Belveth did kill off a lot of the board. So it is just the Belveth and the Zeri remaining. 
that is an incredibly close fight between these two players and i think that would have been a Cambuli win had Setsuko oh, not yeah. played to that Belveth out, and yep. it wouldn't have been close. 100%. That is a Belveth diff through and through. BT, Radiant Titans, RFC. Absolutely fantastic unit pick up there for Setsuko. Played to the out, and, and if not, he would have gone fourth here, right? It would have been a barely fourth place with that insane Piltover spot, but Setsuko gets to live another round and probably, with that in mind, go for that first place. And Kambuli sells out of Ari to try and make it to 10 faster as he runs into Setsuko once again. Wow. <laughs> immediately just fighting this. This is not where he wants to be. He's going to be taking big hits. Yeah. But on the other side, MDA, can he beat the ghost? Probably not. That board looks insane. So let's take a look at Kambuli because <laughs> the fight was close last time. See if it's close again. Ari almost takes out Zeri, but she has a little too much HP. We look at the corals, though. It's going to be jumping around. Does get onto the Zeri, makes it a 1v1. Is going to be the Heimer going down. There's no Corals left for Kambuli. So that does mean it's just going to be Setsuko winning. But it's just one unit once again. Well, MDN goes out in third. 1v1 between Kambuli and Setsuko. Kambuli is saving up all of this gold to go level 10. Try to cap the board. He might be able to degrade one more round, right? He knows that if he loses, it's only going to be by one or two units probably. So I think he, oh no, decides not to greet. Actually, is just sending it right now. Um, is weighing the risk and thinks that it is not quite worth it. Building a bench for Rise to throw in, trying to find some unit upgrades, but not really finding much of anything, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm curious about skipping, you know, the Cassantes as well. I, yeah. I'm not sure what he's looking for. I feel like Cassante 2 is actually a pretty reasonable unit to 100%. throw onto this board. Even if it just takes out one of these tanks early on, that's great. And best case, it just lives a long time and randomly kills one of the big units. So uh, I, I like trying to play for that out. Doesn't go for it. Instead, it's going to be another close fight. Kambuli should still have one more life, but his Belveth gets targeted too fast. Actually goes down. Looks like there is still enough, though, to take out everything except for the Zarian Belveth once again. Yep, Kimberly is going to lose out, but still be alive as we get into stage six carousel. But I I'm with you. I think Kimberly rolling down, not hitting anything, not taking things like the Cassante to bail him out, um, being thrown in by the Rise. I think it might just be a Setsuko victory march to first place. Does pick up a blue buff, and maybe there's some kind of world where he can cheese um, a blue buff Cassante, find some uh, very powerful um you know or lucky positioning i suppose lucky r fight rng as second rise two gets thrown onto the board yeah and i guess maybe he was searching for rise three maybe he felt like that was the out to play for but not able to find it gets the blue buff on it and that's the thing if you had the cassante on the bench that i really like that you called out is rise pulls it in kind of halfway through the fight and so some of the initial damage and some of the initial units are gone and Belveth may have jumped into the back line and actually just get caught by a Cassante exactly. yeah. throwing out its initial cast. And I think playing to those kind of niche fringe outs is where you are at this point because Setsuko's board is so incredibly strong with this double radiant item Belveth and it just doesn't feel like anything else is going to be able to deal with it. No, it doesn't look like it. Belveth is still alive, however, getting pretty low here, but it's that Radiant BT healing. She's able to tear through everything else, tear through Kambuli, and Setsuko goes on a 14 win streak to win this game. Amazing play by Setsuko, recognizing that six pilt over slot and then being able to actually cash out even on 4-1. Very, definitely fortunate to hit that Zeri too, but still impressive plays alongside Kambuli with a really cool level up hedge fund uh, line to go for that level 10. That's right, Setsuko in his time of need calls upon his study group partner and brother Milk <laughs> says, you know what? I got you. <laughs> Definitely uh, pretty spicy, pretty exciting. And I think for a lot of people, they are probably sweating when it comes to, to 4-1. And I think you both made a really good call out, especially for people who are not super fami familiar with this set. Cass, cashing out on 4-1 versus cashing out on 3-5 or 3-6, especially when you're playing double uh double piltover soul the double yeah. piltover plus ones meaning that your board naturally is going to be a lot weaker you have to be afraid going into four one if you're Satsuko. incredibly high risk spot uh you know uh, there's argument that there was probably people in his pool that definitely beat him he, he did recognize that someone in his pool was weak enough right milk was pretty weak needed to try and hold on a little bit longer to stabilize and to milk's credit he did he actually placed a lot higher than when yep. you see that board initially you would think he was going to place so he absolutely could not afford to just roll it down and try and beat Setsuko there um and, and he recognizes hey this guy's in my pool maybe i hit him and then i go first and uh well 
He went first. <laughs> <laughs> On the flip side, Crowen, we did see that really cool hedge fund build out of Kimberly. Oh, yeah. I would love to just kind of hear your thoughts because it's such a niche spot where your two augments work so well together with the level up going into the hedge fund. And that's the kind of games that you really don't get to play every day. No, you don't. And I think a main factor of why it was able to work out was because Camberley did so well at preserving HP in the early game. I think he even made his board weaker at some points to be like, okay, I want to make these uh, econ breakpoints, maybe push a level to throw in a unit for some good synergies, but not necessarily um, much gold, you know, kind of built into that board. He was like 22 board value at some point where he was level uh, 8, 100 gold, and everybody else's power in the lobby, I think, was at least double of his board strength there. So it's absolutely crazy, but he was still top of the lobby like top two or top three in hp that is not something you're be able to do every game um and so it's really impressive that campbell is able to recognize that spot play for that level nine stabilize then go level 10 wasn't able to quite take it home because piltover from that spot from sissy is just so dang powerful but campbell played that game i, I think perfectly Something I think is really worth talking about is that the power level in these prismatic lobbies, is, or honestly, not even just the prismatic lobbies, but just when you have this Piltover cash out and then you have this really unique combination that we saw with Cambu Lee, it makes you think that players like Kiyun, who were running a Zeri won the entire game and still got a top four because of how much AP, uh, HP they were able to preserve in the early game. You know Kiyun has to walk away feeling quite happy about that top four. Now, the lobby scores are ready let's take a look at how the rest of the lobby shaped up as we see in lobby a lil kahuna and degree taking the top two soul is coming back from a few eighth place finishes to win his lobby alongside dqa in lobby c malala and chris in the top two and like we saw in lobby d Setsuko and Campbell Lee. now Cass, crowen the overall standings are ready so let's actually go straight there and kind of dissect what we're going to be seeing as we go into this over halfway point for the majority of the field and then we start to eventually break down into this top 16 as we see right now now Setsuko and Casper alongside YMDN one of our, our our breakout players making their debut this weekend and Prestivin a lot of representation from the K3 Soju study group with Setsuko and Prestivin but Crowen I want to draw your attention to this bubble as we're seeing players like yeah. Chris KPK Solus HSA all on that bubble yeah, these are players that we haven't talked about, uh, at least for Cass and I haven't talked about too, too much, like Chris and KPK. They've been having some very consistent results, and that's kind of the consistency is what brings you to those final two lobbies. They need to have your breakout. Okay, I'm going for my first places. I'm going to be going for that top four to get invited to mid set. So definitely don't be sleeping on those players. The bubble is very, very kind of thin margins here. I think technically everyone can still make it in. Uh, maybe not on like the very, very bottom side, but at least um, for players like Sox and Phoenixa uh, with 12 points. Still only four behind DQA. Um, they're, they're still very well within reach, and players like that can be able to do that with a couple firsts back to back because we've seen players start the day off with the first first with Casper and Robin songs and that kind of solidified themselves being in the top eight right now um uh, on the left hand side of the screen even if their game three wasn't that great Robin took an eighth Casper I think took a fifth there but they're still kind of sitting pretty so the, all the standings could still flip flop very very much around that bubble Excellent point, Crow. And I do want to draw a little bit of attention before we go to a quick break. Vile, one of the players all the way at the bottom. We do have to math it out a little bit to see whether they are still in contention. But Vile, one of those players that consistently has made day four of competitions and has not quite found that final day result that he's looking for at the Freljord Cup. We did see Vile with a 30th place finish right now. Does look to be on that track. So something to keep in mind. We saw Jason Java with a huge comeback in the final two games of his stretch yesterday would not overly surprise me to see that once again with Vile. Now, Cass, before we go into this break, any last thoughts on the players that we saw in those standings? Look, I mean, for me, I know I'm going to be a bit of a broken record here, but I was looking at Sub-Zero Arc, right? This is his first time making it to Day 4. He's playing a unique Legend. Yes, I'm biased because it's the Legend that I <laughs> like to play with Caitlyn, but he's in a fantastic position, 19 points. And to add to that, we've been kind of grouping him with Connor is me, uh, somewhat as someone playing a unique Legend with the Ezreal. And he's also on the bubble. He's still in contention. And both of these players have just been impressing me a ton on Day 4. I've odd reviewed all of Sub-Zero Arc's games on Day 3. And honestly, I wasn't super confident in his Day 4. Or, but I was confident in him as a player continuing to grow because his mindset is fantastic 
and he had a lot of really good things going for him already and how he piloted spots like a fast nine and a pilt over knowing how to win from those spots when he's given those high rolls so there's a lot of things that impressed me about this guy and the fact that he's popping off today it makes me happy all right well we've got a couple more games before we cut the field down to 16. excited to see players like sub-zero are to see if they can build off of that momentum now don't go anywhere we've got game four of the Sharima cup coming up in just a few minutes
Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Sharima Cup. I'm Gangly, and I'm back here with Boop and Morton. We have just crossed the halfway point on the day for the majority of the players. We have seven games on the total, but five games before we start to cut down the field. Now, Boop, we are going to be heading in to a very interesting lobby. We believe it's lobby A, where we're going to be featuring one of the players that we just talked about before the break, Sub-Zero Arc, one of the players who's not sticking to the meta, not playing Orin, instead doing things kind of his own style, playing Caitlyn. How, what are your, some of your thoughts on that? So I think a lot of times this is a really great time to have the conversation of what are you going to play, what you play well, or what the meta is, right? And so the way that Sub-Zero arc is playing, I think you can kind of do both versions of it, but you get to invest a little bit. And, then, you know, this is my style. This is the way I'm going to do it and, you know, and put on the blinders and not let other people influence your play, right? I think some people will hear one thing like before a tournament and then try to do it in the tournament. And, you know, it doesn't work out that well. But what Sub-Zero has done is kind of take a unique perspective, try to apply it to the meta and work it the way that he does and i think that's really cool now mort some of the players in this lobby are going to be on the bottom half of the bubble and some players like flexi really on the outside looking in but something i do want to talk about the fact that the bubble is relatively even right now you don't need to be playing first or eighth and so a lot of these players right now are playing orn right so personally i'm not i'm actually not a huge orn player i'd love to kind of hear your kind of keys to success when you see this legend in action yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people are playing because there's like three or four really good Orn items that if you can get a good start, you know, Trickster's Glass Samir kind of being the biggest of them, um, but, you know, you can get an early collector, there's a couple other options, and so you're looking for those to kind of give you just a solid start, and it feels like a very safe gold augment, right? A lot of people like to look at the stats, and it's like, five, you know, 53% top four, so that's what they're looking for. All right, makes sense. Well, game number four is ready. I will leave it to you. Boop, Mort, take it away. Will do, Gangly. Thanks for the permission. Appreciate it. Warlord's Palace, Immortal Bastion, and Vandal Cafeteria are the choices. Every lobby deserves a one guy, Ooh. and this time we get two. Yeah, you see Robin there with the last-minute sneak uh, playing into that. Uh, they do get their Warlord Palace, though, and so I think that's the one that everyone's kind of happy to play, a very safe one as we get our Star Guardian Squink entrance. Perfect for Sub-Zero Arc. <laughs> Sub-Zero Arc, we've been talking about Sub-Zero uh, a lot in the bottom of play, but one thing that's actually really cool about him that's outside of a TFT is he seems to have a really great reputation of just being a good guy, really good person, and just out there to be a good person in the community. And you gotta love that. But like you said, Warlord's Palace is going to be the portal. And we already have an Oriana here, so a lot of people pulling uh, up on the Piltover. Let's see if we get some more Piltover units on this next time. Doesn't look like it so far, but we do have a gold, which is pretty nice. I mean, look, one, two, you've got an Oriana. You're locked into Piltover or Sorcerer. <laughs> there are no other options from this position. Uh, so we're just going to have to hope he hits. No, but uh does have the Bruiser start. I always like putting in the Cho'Gath here. If you can get a Cho'Gath early, you know, you can get an extra two bonus stacks of health. That's an extra 60 health here, just in case you find yourself going down the Void Path uh, or anything like that. You know, we haven't seen anything like a, a reroll Cho in this particular meta, but even just having that extra 60 to 90 health can make a difference. Unfortunately, gets a very different shop the next time, and so this isn't really kind of the start you're looking for. All right, and so we, we have that start. We're going to be able to kind of go through this early game. We've talked about before, the early game is pretty standard when it comes to how we open up. A lot of people try to go for the Samira at first. A lot of people have access to the Samira at first. Is what we do after that a lot of people are trying to make those decisions. So if you start Piltover, you know we're going Zeri, but there's other ways and reasons to go into that direction uh, with those Zons as well. Let's see where these do end up, but as of right now, we're gonna get to our first augment, and here's Caitlyn. What color is it gonna be? It's gonna be gold. Yeah, so you can see very quickly, he kind of knows what he's going for here. Unfortunately, he doesn't get a two cost in his shop, which is what he's really looking for. Ends up with that Karma that's a three cost. And when you're playing this Augment, you're really trying to grab one of those quick two star two costs. And this is one of the times where a lot of the Caitlyn players will tell you, even though it's almost never true, this is one of the times where maybe you buy one of these and then you press roll once. It can be very risky, but if it pays off, you can get that thing very quickly. Isn't going to do that here. Is going to play around the three Ionia. Has the Renekton 2, the Aurelia 2. That should be in a front line. Uh, maybe you have the Jeweled Gauntlet for the Karma here. But if you throw that down, you're kind of locking yourself into that AP line. And so right now, you're just hoping that the two two-star frontliners 
plus the Ionia is enough to buy you another win to find that two star two cost. Ooh. Nope, the, Caitlyn should help us out in the early game because of that front line, and now we have that Karma, who's already a very strong unit at this point in the game as that three cost, and so we're definitely going to be looking to streak out, and Sub-Zero likes to, let, hey, we're playing Caitlyn, let's make sure that we keep our HP nice and healthy, and so even if we do run into some um, unfortunate shenanigans, uh, we have enough HP to try to force a top four anyway. As you move a lot over to Robin Songs, has had two total placements so far in this tournament, through all of the lobbies that's first and eighth uh, so far so uh, almost all of Robin's bonus points have uh, I mean they've gone to use because because of that eighth he's actually not in first anymore so definitely trying to make some of that up sitting in that fifth place bubble position so looking at the augments we see six players went with portable forge so it'll be a question of who got what portable forge but the more interesting one is Rudir with that Rift Walk. And we've seen at least one game this tournament where a Rift Walk casted and got to that position, you know, with barely enough health left, was able to cap out and win the game off of that. So we'll see if Rudir can make it a repeat performance. But definitely the very unconventional pick, even though it has had success this tournament. Meanwhile, we're looking at Robin's board, who clearly has that 2 1 Piltover with the Echo and Jace, which is a little bit one of the ones where you might accidentally lose. Uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that. But on the other side, you see Goobums with that Trickster's Glass Samira that we talked about. It is a Samira 1. If he can get that to a 2-star, he'll be pretty happy and can accelerate that into the endgame. Okay, we are going to get a Samira oh. 2 now with the Trickster's Glass. That feels real good. This is the start that you want, right? This yeah. is what everyone came into all of these lobbies wanting that start with. Because that Samira 2 can do wonders. I mean, I was watching Samira 1's the blue buff crush some uh, what you would consider potentially stronger comps, but this is going to be very, very good for the Samira. So we get two of them. We get an extra unit pretty much with the Trickster's Glass, and that's going to be helping that front line uh, stay alive a little bit longer because the back line is going to be doing a little bit of extra damage there. We do have a lot of money on the bench. I wonder what we're going to end up doing with that a bit later, but we have a good front line. We got our Samiras. This should be easy going, especially this round. Yeah, for sure. There's definitely going to be an easy win against Robin here with the Piltover. Uh, one thing to note here is you see the Shojin Samira, and a lot of people may not realize, but blue buff uh, Samira is good, lowers the mana down to 20 and makes it two auto attacks, but Shojin is actually just as good. Uh, with the extra five mana per auto, that means 15 mana, so two autos per ult, which is really good for Samira. So Shojin and blue buff both very good, and so that Trickster's Glass is going to be shredding that armor doing a lot of work, and I kind of expect Goobums to be in a really good spot here, because like you said, that is the exact opener you want. And kind of looking at all of these boards, we get to see all the different Orn items that were picked. Goobums got that Trickster's Glass. Uh, Flightsy hasn't locked it in, or hasn't put it on yet. Uh, Sub-Zero Arc, we saw playing that Karma. Uh, Soju getting that uh, Infinity Force degree with that Sniper's Focus, that's another great one. And then Little Kahuna still hasn't put that on either. And so the people that haven't put their Orn items on right now are the ones that I think are a little worried. Uh, the other thing we'll want to keep an eye on is Rudir versus Robin Song. Rudir, like they're going to both try to get that five loss streak. And so do we see one of those accidental cash outs that can really mess up, uh, you know, a, a Piltover player? Wildly, that actually hasn't really happened. Uh, every time that we've seen it, we've seen a lot of times yep. where that could have happened. But um, yesterday, we had uh, Dish Soap and Jason Java avoid each other for like eight rounds yep. uh, or something like that. And they were both on Elimination Station that whole time. So uh, maybe it's going to happen right here and right now for them. But we're going to be riding along with Flight C going up against Sub Zero Arc. Flight C is looking at that Rek'Sai right now with that Collector. So that Collector should be working pretty good. It's about how much gold we're going to get after uh, those ults, if any, if they, if they do drop. So that one is going to be a miss. Let's see if we're going to get another ult through, potentially, on this Karma. and doesn't kill him, so unfortunately no extra gold just yet, and won't get any for this round. Yeah, 4 Bruiser, though, is a really good start. 4 Bruiser does very well in Stage 2 and a little bit in Stage 3. Combine that with the Void here, and now you're looking at a really powerful board. You know, everyone talks about the Samira board as the S tier, you know, opener because it is. But this is the kind of opener that actually can compete with it. And so it'll be interesting if Goobums, uh, you know, fight and Flightsy end up fighting. Uh, will it go the other way, especially with this Redemption, this Collector? It could actually go the other way. So it'll be very interesting to see. You want to keep an eye on that. And again, the Rudir Robinsong fight. Does this go? Do they both get their loss streak? 
what's going on there. You can see Rudir basically sold his board, the board value dropping all the way down to four, uh, but ends up going up against Flightsy here. So like you said, it doesn't happen again. Neither of the Lost Streakers have to face each other. They're both going to get their five Lost Streak most likely. And they're going to get max value in terms of that economy. And if you look through, it's actually pretty impressive that Sub-Zero um, has the same amount of gold as those loose streakers. Because usually in order to win like that, uh, you have to invest that money, as you can see with Goobums at Flightsy, both at 20. But because Sub-Zero got that Karma in that first pack in 2-1, right, I think we're able to get here instead. Yeah, for sure. And so now we're getting a good look at Rudir's board here. He's got the Soraka, and this is pretty much what you want to do, right? You're playing the four Bastion, two Targon, maybe get the Invoker in, but Soraka is going to be healing that Kassadin, and that Kassadin is going to stack up. We saw some really good items being the Jeweled Gauntlet, the Hand of Justice, get an Ionic Spark on someone. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see if he can pull it off. But again, this is a very risky comp, because if you don't hit that Kassadin three, you are going to be in a lot of trouble. Yeah, even if it's a cast in two with perfect items, it's still not going to feel that great. Uh, you need this cast in three to go. I mean, uh, I think it was Jason Java who played uh, this yeah. cast in yesterday, uh, ended up winning the lobby through it, but it was precarious until we locked it in. That cast in three was very, very close to not working out, but we do level close to six. We're going to passively level for one more round, maybe get a little bit more on that lost streak and have a little bit more to run with when we do try to find this cast in. Yeah, I think this is the correct play here, giving himself as much gold at level six. Level six is going to be that key level where you're going to be rolling for that cast in, that Soraka, try to get those going. And I like the void slam here. He's done trying to lost streak. Now it's about health preservation. How much health can he save? Unfortunately, up against Goobums, who is, you know, running, it looks like, four Samiras. Always got to be careful with that Trickster's Glass. Has that Warmog Swain. Kassadin already dead here, so clearly not going to win the fight, which is fine because that means he's going to keep his Lost Streak going and get a bunch of extra gold. And so it's now it's how quickly can you get that Kassadin 2 at least, working towards that Kassadin 3. Do you get lucky and get something like Golden Ticket? What is the augment that maybe bails you out here? All natural Pandora's Bench and Army Building. So All I, right, so yeah, I like this it. choice here. The army building is going to give him that duplicator, and so just in case things go wrong on the roll down, he can be able to use that to get the cast then three. The one thing to know is it takes, I believe, it's seven rounds before he gets the second one, uh, and so it might be a while before he's able to get, you know, that other one, and he needs to survive that long. That's going to be the trick here. Honestly, if we were playing Void, this roll down was pretty great. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> it's going to be that cast inversion. It's because we have an early Kaisa right now at 3 2. So, uh, in terms of extra time, we might have been able to squeeze a little bit more, uh, leaving this cast in on the board where we're at. Because I don't really, if we lose, it's going to be, I don't know if it's going to be to max units, uh, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, decent start, actually. He strengthened up his board, trying to preserve some health, hit the Taric and the Soraka 2, as well as the cast uh, you know, and he's got essentially five Kassadins, four Sorakas, as well as he'll get that other one in about seven turns. So again, at 50 health, you just really want to make sure he starts winning a few rounds here. If he can get out of stage three with at least 30 health, that's kind of ideal what he's going for. It looks like he is on his way. And uh, this might be a win uh, as well. That Soraka does a lot, uh, especially for that Kasten. It was Jason Java who was running the two Sorakas when the Kasten just wasn't quite there and stole, I think, a round uh, to make it to the Kasten 3 because of the uh, health regen that the Soraka gave that front line. So we're going over to up and coming streamer K3 Soji. Um, e evil twin of K3 Soju, <laughs> would you say? Yeah, something like that, uh, <laughs> you know. Not sure what the name changes from, but uh, we'll have to see. Uh, and it seems like him and his study group has been playing a lot of this comp. Uh, you know, this is the Noxus comp here. Uh, other things worth calling out here is that Flightsy and Sub-Zero Arc both took Tiny Titans. That's going to make it a lot harder for people to, to go out early and drop out. Um, but the other one to call out here is Goobums getting Young, Wild, and Free. When you are at 100 health, this is the best augment you can hit for a Silver. It's going to give you that early access on the carousel. You can grab those four and five costs, which not only strengthen you, but they remove the bailout options for that seventh and eighth place player. And so if someone like Robin is looking for a Zeri, uh, Goobums can just deny that straight up before he can even have a chance to move here. And so as we watch that carousel, watch what Goobums denies from those seventh and eighth place players. 
right, we're going to take a look at this graphic now on the bottom. Let's take a gander at all of these uh, squads. Robin still rocking with those one stars, but that's exactly what we would expect. Robin has been good playing at a bunch of different positions so far, minus that last eighth. But for the rest of the tournament, that has definitely been the case. Uh, we just saw Soji, who uh, is her Soji, who's playing uh, that Noxus. Looking at Degree going Sorks there. Uh, so we do have some variety versus some of our other lobbies here where it's not Samira, Samira, you know, Samira, Samira the entire way down. We do see a couple more Piltovers and a couple more Sorks in this one. But in terms of comps that we see, those three are definitely going to be the common ones. Yep. Now, Robin does manage to get very lucky here on the first roll, hits the Zeri here. And again, this is where we've talked about, right? The 3-5 cash out, roll it all down, has a rise here, which is okay. Uh, it gets a second Zeri. If he had one more, he'd be feeling really good. But he's going to try to get that cash out here. The items aren't bad. Not the best chem take add-on, um, but decent items here. And as long as he gets a one-week matchup, which this is not it, uh, up against the Swain and the Samira. So I don't know that we'll get the cash out here. Samira's probably going to wreck through these really quick. One thing to call out here, though, is Gubum's... Uh, you know, has seven Samiras, it looks like, even if you look at his bench. So he is going for that Samira 3, which might slow him down a bit. And has built the Last Whisper, which is not typically very good on Samira. But yeah, so now Robin Song's finding himself in a position we've seen all too often. Nine loss, 12 health. Can Robin stay alive? Or is this going to be another Piltover 2-1 crash, which might be like the third one we've seen today? Yeah, uh, a lot of the Piltovers that we've seen have actually Whew. not been able to Whew. cash out as Rudir does get the three-star cast, and I think I saw a glimpse of it um, in that last round as we were scouting around these other boards. But we have the Zeri one, we have the means, but do, can we get to the end when it comes to cashing this out? The matchup is going to be important. We did pull a very strong comp on the last one. The Zeri items are all right for, for cashing this out. The Urgot in the front line oh. should help as well but it's going to be up against the Lux in the Voids. I think this was the best matchup he could have looked for, and I think he's going to get bailed out here. It is just a Lux one. He's up against the Zhonya's Urgot, which should block a lot, and the Zeri's going to be able to mow through, I think, a lot of these weak sorcerers, and I think we are going to see Robin get bailed out here. And so this is going to be one of the two ones that turns out very well. Robin looking really good here, and the rest of the lobby has to be very frustrated at the weak sorcerer board for allowing that. Oh, man. No PayPal is going to be shared today. Uh, but Robin's also going to get some more items. Oof. Three TGs. That's going to be a lot for some units that don't normally get those items. And a Radiant Last Whisper. I think the Radiant Last Whisper in particular here might be a little triggering, right? You've already built the Last Whisper <laughs> to get the Radiant isn't ideal. You can't even slam that on the Zeri. So the three Thieves Gloves likely going to go on like Sejuani and Jace and things like that. But now you're kind of stuck with a Radiant item, which was a big budget of your cash out that you just can't do anything with. And so you're really hoping to find a Reforger, which didn't happen. And so as far as cash outs go, this is kind of a low roll. Uh, we're going to continue to roll, but we do get to the Zeri too. And like you said, it must feel awful to s be staring at that Radiant Last Whisper on the bench right now. But at least we get the Zeri too. Our team comp does get a little bit better, and our front line got a little better as well because of that Sejuani too uh, that we got during that last round. But we still have a ways to go in order to kind of tap out here, or top out when it comes to this comp. So we're probably going to be stronger than most of the comps that we see. This looks like it should be a win, but how how much time have we actually gotten for Robin, right, with this cash out and kind of just wasting an item on the bench right now because there's really no home for it? Yeah, I think if you look at the situation with the three Thieves Gloves, uh, I think not getting the Radiant essentially takes it from a nine cash out to like a seven loss. So it's definitely not as strong as it could have been, but it is still a seven cash out. It's still three, uh, three Thieves Gloves. And the bigger thing is he did manage to hit the Zeri 2 and the Sejuani 2. So I think overall Robin is very healthy right now. Um, just trying to look for something, you know, it's almost worth rolling some of these augments to see if you could find a reforger, oh. hilariously enough. Um, Gunner Crest is going to allow him to be able to go for Gunner, which is kind of nice. Um, you can see he uses the Radiant Last Whisper, at least for now, to try to get some budget going. Um, but overall, I, I don't think he's too worried at this point in the game.
All right, we're going to swap off some Zons. That's a new change. More I think a lot of people liking it uh, so far. But we also have <laughs> weird item components uh, as well to deal with. Two rods and a belt. Where's that going to end up going? Because the Thief's Clubs are on yep. all of the rest of the units that potentially could use it. But th that power level is going to be higher because of those Thief's Clubs in the front line because those units don't normally carry those kinds of items. But... Man, this is a very interesting position that we've not really seen many other Peltover players in so far. We're going to really need to focus in, and this Cassidy is going to go right into the back line. That was bad news for Robin, along with the CC with the Jarvan. Things aren't looking that great right now, but the Cassidy is not on the Zeri right now. That can be uh, maybe the out that Robin needs at the moment. Yeah, this is probably the hardest matchup he could have got. This Cassidy is really low, waiting for a Soraka heal. If that Soraka heal comes through, this could be the end of Robin. Doesn't quite come through, though, and Robin barely able to win this fight. That was definitely nerve-wracking, though. Not the situation he wanted to be in. I think if that had been a three-item Kassadin, that could have been it for Robin. All right, Lokahuna in eighth place. One of, I, I believe, Lokahuna's like best performances in a tournament like this so far. We are going to upgrade that Nasus uh, at 4-3. That's really good timing. But in the back line, we have the Akshan, who, in terms of appearance, definitely finding himself on the boards a lot more today. Uh, again, a, a lot of people thinking that maybe the Gunners are going to have the best kind of access to the Zeris and the Aries in the back line because of that ult that Akshan has. So maybe this is going to be a specific counter to some of those backliners. Yeah, this has been an interesting one that we basically saw no Sharima yesterday. It was very little, if any. And today we've now seen it multiple times. So people leaning into the Akshan. So maybe some dark tech got leaked somewhere. Maybe someone figured something out. Um, but overall, seeing a lot more of it here and seeing some of that power here with that collector getting some extra gold, those Deadeye procs also getting the execute here. Ooh. And definitely getting a win here for Little Kahuna. If this can become an Akshan 3, that can start to do some massive damage in the late game. Yeah, that's the win condition, right? When it comes to TFT, what you have on the board right now is not going to be what you finish with, most likely. You have to spot those win conditions and try to play your outs to get there. When we mentioned being dizzy, it's kind of like, oh, not really truly understanding what I need to win this certain scenario in this lobby. So uh, those win conditions, for specifically for someone like Ekshan, is that Ekshan 3. We're going to get to see everyone's comp. We know that Rudier is playing that Cassidin uh, 3 Riftwalker that just lost to the Piltovers of Robin's board. But slowly but surely, Robin on that four-game win streak, even though it's felt a little precarious, like someone almost falling off a balance beam, he's been able to stick the landing regardless so far. Yeah, it's interesting to see Rudir's board because he hit the Cassidin very early, but he doesn't have a lot of the backline support. Uh, the other thing to call out here is we already saw one Akshan board. Now we're seeing another one here. This is another collector, uh, Flightsy, playing it as well. Not the Sharima version, but instead the Frailior Deadeye version. Uh, and so that is going to make it harder for each of them to hit that Akshan 3, that sort of win condition. You can see him holding on to the Aphelios is here, but Aphelios has not had a ton of success this <laughs> patch compared to Zeri. And so we'll have to see if he goes with that. You know, there's no Ginsu's, which is traditionally a uh, strong Aphelios item. Uh, has this Juggernaut emblem, which isn't doing a ton other than protecting the uh, Urgot. And so goes up against Robin Songs, who now has that fully stacked out uh, Heimerdinger. Has that Zeri 2 with a gun blade. And so overall, I don't imagine this will be a hard fight for Robin. All right, Robin, going to continue moving forward. That always feels good when you see that your team moving forward um, in front of those hexes, unless it's the early game and for some reason your Ash is in the other opponent's back line. Uh, but no, we're going to get that Collector Akshan with another win, and that's going to be one of the best ways to get gold with that Collector. That ult's so good along with the Gunner procs as well. So r that's doing a lot better than I think some people might have anticipated, unless you were those people whispering about those Gunner comps. We're moving back over to Sub-Zero, who we haven't quite seen since the first part of the game this karma has been around since literally 2-1 and so we're that's why we're so close to finally locking it in but once that does that has taught forward and we are going to pause as well so we'll tell you why in just a second but taking a gander at everything else right now what's kind of your take on what you're seeing yeah i mean again i think the the robin song situation is pretty standard right someone got the 2-1 pilt over has managed to cash it out and is now the biggest threat in the lobby and so it feels like everyone else is playing on a timer trying to survive, trying not to have their matchups against that. 
and so it's going to be rough here. We did see that Karma board uh, one or two off of Karma 3 with the uh, Invoker Augment that allows them to get even more AP every time they cast, so that can have a pretty high cap. But again, especially the three Thieves Gloves cash out that Robin got, it's just going to be really hard from sheer item value for a lot of people to beat. And so right now it's everyone trying to rush for that win condition. I think we also saw the Rift Walker, uh, you know, again, has the three star cast in but was missing that third item and then needs that Soraka three to help keep it alive. Because the way that works is every time he casts, he gets more and more AP. So you need something to help you survive that initial burst before you kind of go infinite is how that comp works. That's why it likes four Bastion. That's why it likes the Targon to get that healing going. Uh, and so we'll have to see if all those pieces can come together. Because if it can, again, we've seen that Riftwalk comp manage to beat some of those other really capped out boards. Uh, and so yeah, that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah, I mean, the last time we saw it, it won, right? And it probably wasn't the, the prettiest version of that Riftwalker comp, at least for half the game. Uh, but, you know, and that just goes to prove, like, if you have all the pieces, right, you know how to set them up, you're going to be able to set up those carries in order to bring you through any surprises that you've seen or not seen so far throughout the games today, um, yeah. you know, for you personally. Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest surprise, we talked about it briefly there, was Sharima. We're starting to see at least one Sharima player per lobby, at least on the stream, which is really surprising because, again, no one's really leaning into the Sharima Azir. I think everyone sort of figured out that that takes a little too long to ramp up, doesn't do well against the Zeri matchup. But we've seen some shifting into that Sharima, uh, you know, Akshan a little bit here. I think it was Chris, though, that did manage to get the Azir going for a bit. Um, but overall, pretty solid... Uh, and so we'll just have to see, you know, if that Shreema board can do anything else. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, like, that is kind of the question when it comes to Shreema, right? Is just, like, we know that in certain aspects we can, it almost feels like it stole a top four, but are we kind of undervaluing it a little bit? Because that Azir with that Hextech Gunblade, you know, is a little old school when it comes to a set that's, you know, three or four months long, right? But when, it, when we first started out, that Azir comp was super strong, especially with that Hextech Gunblade, because it was consistent uh, HP help across the team. So is that something, was it more of the Shreema or was it more of the itemization of those units? I think some of it was the itemization, but at least for the Shreema games we've seen big success on, it was the plus one emblem, right? The ability to go up a level that you might not normally be able to reach, uh, trying to hit that seven Shreema with that extra emblem, uh, things like that. And so I think that's been the big difference. The other thing is that if you can get three items on like your Nasus, and that Nasus absorbs the stats from the enemy tanks, it can actually be extremely tanky. And we've seen some very tanky Nasuses with that Gunblade uh, Azir in the back, keeping it alive, that have actually been surprisingly tanky. Again, doesn't quite cap out as hard as like a Piltover comp or a Zeri comp, uh, but can still do pretty good. And I think if you've got that strong start early with something like the Collector Akshan, can turn that into a top three at least, which is what a lot of these players need. Yeah, so, you know, a little bit more about the macro of TFT right now. You just uh, came out with your uh, patch notes. And so uh, what are we kind of looking forward to as, as we move through the rest of the set, which is not that much longer? Yeah, I mean, we basically only have one more patch. Our next patch is like the mid-set finale patch as everyone heads into that across the various regions. There's a lot of stuff to do there. And so I think I'm just trying to get everything into a, a decent spot here. You know, I think we're seeing a lot of, you know, the Samira, Zeri, and Urgot uh, that we've seen here. Uh, some of those things will probably shift down. That should open up some new comps. Maybe things like the Sharima or Sorcerer we've seen will do well. And so I think that's the big shift. But overall, uh, you know, you don't usually see a ton of major shifts at this point in a set's life as we head into our final mid-set. Uh, and so that's going to be getting ready for all of those big changes coming down the road that, you know, excited to reveal once they're ready. So, you know, I, you know, if I was, I would love for you to reveal them now, but I know you can't right now nope. but nope. you know what <laughs> what about um when it comes to the rest of today right we've talked a lot about the new guard and the old guard and we know what's coming up you know when these players come into the final day what is something that you wish that you could kind of tell them in terms of prep hey if you um are going to go after one particular thing right in terms of mindset how to get you know ready for these things because you've been in this industry for a really long time and you've been able to witness and see a lot of these players uh go after it but if is there one thing that you'd like to tell the players uh right now as we're kind of waiting for this uh, to get resolved I think the big thing is when you get to this level of competition, right? These are the, the top 32 players out of a massive field of players, out of millions of players who are playing the game. 
you know, it's very easy to go, well, I'm only the 25th best and that's not good enough. And, you know, sometimes that can get in your head. You can really knock yourself down. I think you and I were watching, I won't name the player, but we were watching a player who was in a really good spot and yet all they could seem to do is sort of talk to their position and how bad it was. And it's like, focus on the positives, <laughs> keep a strong will set and, you know, you can do it. And so that'll be, that'll be it for now. And so we can finally get back into game here and see how it finishes out. All right, we are back, and we are ready to go, or as Gangly likes to say, we're ready to blast off. And so Sub-Zero Arc now is going to be who we're riding along with. We started with Sub-Zero Arc. Let's go ahead and start here again. We all have uh, – let's go ahead and take a look at everything once more because we did take a little bit of a break. Robin was on the way back when it came to those Piltovers, five-game win streak. This is exactly when you would assume the top side of that leaderboard would start to sack some HP in order to develop some economy, just like Flight C is at 92 gold. You know, to keep going on this journey with me, if you're wondering what some of these symbols mean, the colored fire is going to be the streak that there are. Red means win, blue means lose, and then the one where a bunch of friends look like they're hanging out, that is the total value of the board. So you can kind of see the total value of the units that those players are currently playing that are Ooh. active on the board and see how that works with each other as we get to see some more items and hopefully a reforger for a Robin. <laughs> Yeah, the big thing here is this is Warlord's Palace, uh, and there are three variations. The normal one, the radiant one, which comes with a radiant item, and the shadow one, which can come with things like emblems. And this is the shadow variant, and so it'll be very interesting to see what we get. So, for example, Flightsy was able to find a Freljord emblem out of that. That's a big spike. That's going to put him up to four Freljord, which, you know, is normally not achievable. And so that's going to feel really good to find. And so we'll have to look around and see how everyone else was able to spike with that you know sometimes in the shadow one you can even find a radiant item which is what it looks like we saw on that karma board here uh back to flight c again with that frail yord the big thing here will be like i said can robin song find a uh reforger uh can rudir find a good item for that cassidy and so those are going to be kind of the exciting things to look for here all right so flight c and all that gold getting spent right now moving into the heimerdingers we have seen some five cost units and we're going to go ahead and put the Heimerdinger onto the board. This x Sean still doing pretty good. I mean, we're in second place, 62 HP. So we're pretty much vibing at this point, and we are not going to get the Aphilios 2, even though we are playing Dead Eyes. Uh, it looks like we're in the midst of a pivot that is moving moderately slowly, as it should. If it's failure, it's probably cold. Yeah, I think, again, without the, uh, the Ginsus in particular, the Aphelios just doesn't seem like it's going to be something he's interested in. So instead, going to play around that strong Akshan ult. And now with the four Freljord, at least, is going to get a bunch of that true damage. He's going to get that stun to buy himself a little bit of time here. And has that Sejuani 2 now with a strong front line here. So a lot of time for the Akshan to burn. This is not a bad spot to be in, even with the three Deadeye. It's going to be about trying to optimize, you know, upgrade as many units as you can. Maybe get this Heimerdinger in. Heimerdinger, always great for capping out a board. And worth calling out here, both Robin and Rudir just lost. Hmm. That's not good uh, for, for either of those players to know that there might be two people because Robin is probably going to be afraid of whoever Rudir just lost with, right? So yep. there might be multiple people in this lobby who could eliminate Robin or Rudir right now as we're moving back over to K3 Soji, K3 Soju's twin or something. Same picture. It's very interesting. Um, but we're also going to be going back to Rudir here who is running that cast in. In terms of itemization, this is a little different than what we saw before with a double uh, hand of justice, I guess one for each hand and it's thematic or one I Kassin only doesn't really have two hands, though. But let's see if we're going to be able to get through into that back line. Remember, the last time we saw this, the Kassin went straight into the back line and then did not touch them anymore. But the Kassin has to be able to produce that damage and produce those unit takes. And so he's going to get, like you said, more powerful every time we do that rift walk. And now is going to be the time where we are going to get those one shot, one kills. And that Katarina is not going to be around for much longer. And they're out as Soji is going to take the L there. Yeah, so Little Kahuna out in seventh, but Robin Songs, first, first, eighth, eighth. And eighth with that Piltover cash out, I think is going to surprise a lot of people. Uh, you know, again, we talked about the three Thieves Gloves and the Radiant Last Whisper. Apparently wasn't able to convert it enough. 
Um, Rudir's board, I do like the setup there. He had six Bastion, three Targon, and that Targon's going to amp the healing from the, uh, the the Hand of Justices. It's just a question of does he get bursted down before he can stack up. Now on K3 Soji's board here, we do have our six Noxus with a very well itemized Darius. This is exactly what you want to see if you're playing Noxus. This is, I feel like, the board that that study group is the most comfortable with. You've got some great items here. You just want to make sure that you don't get bursted down, uh, but you can go infinite. You can heal up off that Bloodthirster. You've got that Titan's Resolve. And the fact that he has double Cybernetic Leech, that's another thing worth talking about here is all this big damage is going to be healing him more and more and more. Oh. So with nine health, he's capped out at a pretty good spot here. Uh, so this feels pretty good. Just hope to not find a bad matchup. And I think his worst case matchup might be Rudir of all people. Oh, so never mind. <laughs> it's not going to be because he's out of here. So the Kassadin is going to fall. Much different result. I think a lot of people pick up that Riftwalker expecting a little bit of an easier kind of, hey, I know what the point is. I know what to build. But some of the outward factors on the edges aren't really that polished for those particular players. And the experience isn't something that you can depend on because it's an augment that you have to choose. But we are in our top five. Soji is going... <laughs> I read Soji and I see Soju, but 9 HP uh, right there uh, on Elimination Station. 32, 38, 41, 62. Flightsy's still at 50 gold as well. Yeah, Flightsy's got to be feeling in a really good spot here. He's got that gold. He's got the health to work with. It's going to be able to go 9, whereas like Goobums, if you look, has like 5 gold left. Uh, and so isn't going to be able to go 9 here. So Flightsy looking well positioned. And especially with Robin and Rudir getting knocked out, <coughs> that's a lot of those threats gone. All right, so now that those threats you know, you have to take out those threats as quickly as possible. And something that we've seen, especially with these Dariuses and sometimes Gwens, is there aren't a lot of people keeping them from getting into the back line. They're pushing everyone over to a certain side, and then the Darius will just walk into the back line. We don't see it here, but that's definitely something to take note of as we keep on going. But these uh, Darius ults are not getting those kills right now as, <laughs> as this... Uh, Bramble's doing a ton of work there, and now it's dead. Who would have thought that the Karma 3 would take down the Darius 3 in that scenario? Yeah, the big difference there was, again, that Invoker Augment that allows them to get more AP every time they cast. That made that board have a much higher potential than normal. And unfortunately for Soju, the Darius got stuck on that Bramble Vest and just couldn't get through it. That's one of Darius's big key weaknesses and so unfortunately that is going to knock him out in a fifth and he can't be happy with that performance because again that's the board that he's very comfortable playing he really likes that noxus board was able to hit everything and still only convert it into a fifth so pretty rough finish for him there all right we do have our top four the sort board seems to love this fourth place spot uh it's been fourth or fifth unless goobums is running it and that was an insane sort comp with augments that specifically went with it in the past so goobums should actually know exactly how to work against this as well but we're gonna watch degree with this eight sorks and for some reason Sona 3s have been unable to be found by any of our Sork players uh, today, but the Sorks are going to walk forward, they're going to do their thing, and they're going to take the dub there, and we're going to keep on going here with Degree. Yeah, it's pretty impressive how Flightsy's been able to turn this board uh, as well as he has, but now 33 health drops down to third here. Really, it's probably about the time to convert it after the PvE round here, and we'll see what he can convert that board into, because an Auction 2 is not going to cut it in stage six here. And so do you turn this into a Belveth? Or are you trying to go for this Urgot three? Because that's the other thing, actually. Now, looking at this, it looks like he's not going to go nine. It looks like he's playing around a win condition of Sedge three, Urgot three, which I do think is smart here. Going to nine isn't going to change a lot. You're stuck with these AD items that aren't particularly great on any of the five costs. Even something like a Belveth doesn't benefit from it that well. Aatrox is probably your best bet, but Aatrox isn't really a, a game clencher by himself. And so I like this play of trying to hit one of these three costs, but it is going to be a massive roll down that he's going to have to be quick. So I want to see how this goes here. We're at six of each. Oh, that's good. But, you know, how far is he going to go this turn? And are we going to hit any of them? So stops it for no. Nope. Okay, we're going to see more. Uh, the big again, that's the big thing we're looking for here. And this is where it can make or break a lot of roll downs here. It's going to stop at 30 for now. Has five Akshans, six Urgots, six Sejuanis, and seven Lissandras. Uh, so has a lot of options, but maybe a little greedy to go another round here. 
Okay, we're going to be doing the split screen because it is the top four. We're going to be looking over to the right because Flight Scene Sub-Zero arc are so close in that HP total. I'm also curious how this Froyord and this Akshan is going to be able to go through this. I bet there's been a lot of money coming in from that collector. And if you do get an opening into the corner unit, that Akshan could take down a, a carry just like it did just then. So, you know, the idea that Akshan is one of the best ways to access a backline unit and to potentially get them out of the way rings true here for this Akshan too. But sometimes the units aren't in the correct positions and you just hit tanks the whole time. Now everyone has to remember that this Akshan is here and he's ready to do some business, but you got to position against it. Yeah, that snipe on the Karma 3, taking it down just shows how good that ult can be and why you need to position the tanks in a way that you can protect that. And so unfortunately it gets knocked out and that is going to buy Flightsy a little more time now, sitting in first place here. And you can see now we're at seven Sejuani's. But again, I think as soon as he loses one fight, you know, I think that's where we're going to see this big roll down, and I really want to see if anything gets hit from the big roll down. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the ghost who we were, we cast a lobby earlier where the ghost went, the ghost went two and zero oh at the last parts of yep. the game. Is it going to be just as good this time? But I'm looking at Goobums and Flightsy as well. The Akshan once again it gets CC but does take down one of the potential units that could take you down, but not enough damage to that front line, and that is the give and take, right? You got to sneak that damage to the back line, the Akshan. But if not enough is done otherwise, the opposing front line will end up collapsing upon you. And that's exactly what we saw. Yeah, it does manage to get a component with that Sharima Rise. If he can get another one, that'll be a nice little boost. And so again, here, as we head into 6-3, how far are we willing to roll down here? Uh, you know, he did finally lose a round. So like I said, I kind of expect a full roll down here. Hits the Lissandra. We're not seeing any Urgots here. Is one off his Akshan 3 here. I expect we're going to sell the Urgot, keep rolling. Uh, the Sejuani seems very unlikely, so yeah, we're going to sell that. Try to find that Akshan. One Sejuani off. Oh. Now we're in this tough position. Eight Sejuanis, eight Akshans. Sells the Akshans, trying to find the Sejuani. <laughs> does not hit, and that will likely spell a third. Two Urgots in that pack, though. It's probably the Urgots that he sold. Uh, right back into the pack. Let's see if this Akshan is going to be able to cheese this Ari away, which could happen if that unit in the front line does go uh, down. Where is this Akshan going to go? It's going to go towards Ooh. the Ari. does take it down. So one of the big damage healers is no longer here. Now it's going to be up to that Karma, who we've already been able to beast in a previous uh, PvP round. It's going to be the Ghost this time, and it does look like it's going to be close. We're going to get rid of one more unit, one more ult for the Karma. It's going to be over for either side, Ooh. and the Akshan is going to beat the Ghost on that one, and Goobums, I think, takes the L on the other board, so it's going to be Sub-Zero in first place still with Flightsy and Goobums following. Yeah, it was really close, and unfortunately now he's really regretting selling that Akshan, I think, a little bit, trying to hit that Sejuani because he was one off, uh, you know, might have been able to pull something out here, but now he's going to have to do another roll down here, trying to find just one more Sejuani. Didn't get bailed out by the Carousel, unfortunately, and so again here we see just a little bit of gold to work with here. Not much, uh, you know, going to do a few rolls here, but yeah, it's just not happening. And so again, even uses the duplicator to try to just get a few more rolls, but nope. Uh, I imagine the Bloodthirster is going to go on the Urgot, which is a great item to get here. Uh, so I do like that item helping a bit. And the Lissandra 3 is also a nice bit of bonus damage here. He's got that 4 Freljord. So this is good positioning and a good build. Uh, you know, it's just maybe not enough. It's going to depend on how it goes against the Goo Bum. We might have a bit of a Paper, Rock, Scissors situation here also, where the Akshan's great against the Sorcerers, but not so great against the Challengers. Okay, so the Sorcerers have been very vulnerable to this Akshan so far. Let's see if he's going to be able to take down Sub-Zero Arc like he was the Ghost a little earlier. And yeah, the back line, it's just the way you position those Sorcs. It's super vulnerable to the Akshan. That's an easy win. Is that it? No, Sub-Zero Arc is barely alive. Is Goobum's going to be able to take this back? Looks like it's close. Nope, or not really nope. as the Aatrox is going to fall. And so, so does Goobums. The Ghost doing really well. Who, who's that player? Ghost? Yeah, I think. pretty well today. I think this is the kind of game that if you look at, uh, can make you question your read on the meta, right? Because if you look at this board, this is nothing that crazy, right? It's a standard Freljord with an Akshan 2. And yet you're keeping up with a lot of these big time boards here. You know, it's the kind of board that makes you wonder, like, is something going on here? Has people figured out how to beat some of these other, you know, really good comps? Is that why Robin got knocked out quickly? And so maybe we'll see a shift even as we head into like game five today. 
Okay. You know, sometimes that happens when it comes to tournament uh, processes. The lobbies determine what the meta is. And yeah, they do go along with what's popular, but sometimes individual lobbies do represent or can represent something totally different. And this is another good example of the difference between uh, that front line being able to handle the Akshan ults versus not as we do finally take the L there for Flight C. And Akshan 3 would have been the biggest difference, and that's going to be a win for Sub-Zero, the person that we came into this game with, talking you know, their praises, and they continue going. That's awesome. Now, Morit, we've talked all day, yesterday and today, about how we see so many times these players playing these meta compositions, right? These S-tier compositions. Last game, I think, was a great example of exactly kind of what you've been preaching all day, right? It's when you can pilot these a-tier, B-tier compositions, yep. suddenly you find new lines. And I, I imagine most people were not expecting the top two of that lobby to be six Invoker versus four Frailyard Akshan. Yeah, I think Invoker in particular, people kind of knew about a little bit, but an Akshan 2 going to a top two there, and honestly probably could have won out here if he'd made a different decision, sold the Sejuanis and went for the Akshan instead, instead of greeting for the three star four cost. We might have even seen that turn into a first place. And so, yeah, I think, again, someone who came in with a little bit of extra game knowledge knew a little different way to go. Uh, you know, there was also some extra things that went well, right? The fact that we got the Shadow Warlord's Palace giving him the Freljord Emblem. Definitely a big boost there. But again, the knowledge of the line is the thing that got rewarded here. And so really well played from Flight C. Uh, but also Sub-Zero Arc with that Karma 3. Just really good positioning, turning that into a first as well. Bouncing off of the Warlord's Palace being chosen there. I think I, I want to give a little bit of attention to the fact that Robin Songs, after getting this cash out of three Thieves Gloves and a Radiant Item, well, you know what? There's a huge difference in, in power when you have 10 items and someone has six. But that power level is skewed when everybody has 12 items and you have 15, right? Yep. So yep. that is the risk that you run when you are playing Piltover. Now, the scores of the last lobby are ready, or of the other lobby, so let's take a look at how the the rest of the lobbies played out like we saw in lobby a with sub-zero arc and flight c taking the top two oh. lobby b we got socks and re replay taking the top two lobby c preston and chris tft and lobby d Suko having a great day with another first alongside jason java now boop i did hear i heard some sounds there what stands out to you Pegot's having a day. Pegot's having a really great tournament. Came in with uh, bonus points. You also got to give props to Setsuko, right? So, like, that's a, a, Setsuko's been playing some uh, very stress-inducing comps, right? Has played the Sorks, has played Piltover, was, I believe, our 70 cash out Piltover player. So not only just pushing the envelope, not only within the tournament, within himself, too, making sure that these comps do end up reaching their top power level. So good stuff from both of those players so far. Yeah, I think I want to jump in here. Like, Setsuko is the kind of player that you look at the worlds from Monsters Attack, and we always talk about how Riri plays the world champion, but up until the final day, Setsuko was kind of outperforming him and playing really, really well. We know Setsuko's peak can be really high up there, if not even the best. It's just a question of that mental, right? And at worlds, he crashed on that last day, but when peak Setsuko shows up, it is great, and I think that's what we've got here today. Yeah, and after taking a win in set eight, it, he would be in a position to, you know, join that very elite club of players who have two wins in North America. Now, as we look at the overall standings on the day, now keep in mind we have one final game before this bubble pops, and we cut the field down from 32 to 16. Now, Boob, looking at this bubble, you've got you have to imagine that pretty much anyone can uh, has to be afraid, but I would say 21 points, maybe down to maybe 16, 17, is still within reach, right? Yeah, I mean, unless you're, you've are you been told you're mathematically eliminated, you still got to play your best, right? So, And even at the end of these lobbies, whenever we get right before a cut or at the last lobby, someone who is not eligible will win it. It's one of those True. things. The yep. person who interviews has a worse day the next day, and the person, if you're not eligible to win, you're going to win your last lobby or the one right before the cut. And so, uh, you know, anything can happen. You know, shenanigans happen, and that's unfortunate for, for some of these players. But the 
overarching thing is a lot of these players are having really great days. That's a co pressed event, Sub Zero arc, right? Doing such wonderful things when it comes to coming in here with multiple outlets and ending up being able to use them while they're playing in this particular type of a tournament. So we're not just seeing, you know, hey, Samir is really good. We're only going to play that. That might be the opening for a lot of these players, but a lot of them aren't finishing that way. This is a great time to call out YMDN, one of those players who, again, is making their debut this event. And I think it goes to show more, it's something that you were talking about yesterday, yesterday, that people don't always give credit to how many good players there are in North America. I think YMDN showing up this far in the tournament and making a really deep run is a prime example that there may be even more talent in this region than we know of. Now, we have one more game to play before we cut the field down to 16 to don't go anywhere. We'll be back in just a couple minutes for game number five of day four of the Sharima Cup.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Game number five, day four of the Shreema Cup, coming up in just a minute or so. Now, Cass, this is a really important inflection point in the tournament, right? We've got the final game before we cut the field from 32 all the way down to 16. And yesterday, we got to see kind of this comeback come around for Jason Java, right? Who made that change from the, uh, I believe he was playing Orn to Aurelian Soul and then got those two back to back top twos to make it into that cutoff. So it would wouldn't be that shocking if we saw someone in this lobby try a similar strategy, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, I expect anybody who's on the bubble and needs like a very high placement. I'm looking at our, our, our pointers at 16 points, Milk Solus, uh, are towards the bottom of people who could probably still make it into that top 16. Uh, needing a big game, maybe they have a, a way to do that. I know Solus is someone who actually played River King, played Tom Kench for a while. I know he's <laughs> experimented with other legends. I'm not saying he's going to play River King. I don't think Tom Kench is really in a great spot, but... He might have another strategy that he, he's happy to go to when he's in a pinch and needs to look for a first. Crow, and this is one of the most exciting parts of the event because as I'm looking at this lobby right now, we've got Goobums, Robin, Kiyun, Weijin, Solus, Milk. All of these players are essentially living on this bubble, right? And yeah. so the most fascinating part about this is that depending on how the placements fall, it can actually change the top 16 of the event quite wildly. It definitely can, especially when there's lobby with this amount of talent and so close six players being in the bubble. I was even hearing uh, Setsuko talk about a little bit uh, on stream during the break about how, man, like this is like what he thinks is the strongest lobby by far amongst the four. And he's like, nah, it's okay. I'm going to have a buff. I play better in stronger lobbies because I know what to expect with that lobby tempo and things like that. Um, So it's really a lot of confidence. I'm sure all of these players, right, are going to be experienced playing in super, super strong lobbies. So it might just come down to, yeah, that approach that Caps talking about. Are there some other legends? And, you know swap ups because this is the point of the tournament where you need to do that if you're on the bubble or on, especially on the lower side of the bubble like uh milk and solos that's an excellent point crow and i think it's worth pointing out literally every single one of these players is someone who has found themselves in the final day of a gigantic oh. tournament even broccoli i think one of those players that doesn't always get the credit he deserves cast but like you think back to set five broccoli was i believe fifth place fourth place in the mid set finale of set five went to the piltover cup in the beginning of set six immediately found himself in the final day and sometimes does kind of wear this curse around his head where people point out the fact that he has placed towards the bottom of multiple events but broccoli is in fact one of those players that when he can turn on the jet does find himself at the top yeah and he's consistently near the top of the table so he's definitely a threat in this lobby but i want to point out that goobums has a chance to put his money where his mouth is right now he's got three of his dogs in this lobby to see if he can take him for a walk so we'll see if he can uh, you know keep milk satsuko and kiyun on a leash for this one and uh and actually take them down have a better placement than the rest of them I think another player worth looking at, Solus, on the day, currently with only one top four, but that top four happened to be a first place finish after starting the day 8-8. Eight, eight. And so this is not the first time we've ever seen someone with a with a bad start on the day come back and swing it around. But Crow and I do feel like there's something to be said about those players who have the mental resilience, right? To take what happened at the start of the day. And even if it's bad, even if it's tough, say, yeah. you know what, I'm gonna stick to my game plan. I'm gonna because I'm confident myself and I'm gonna I'm gonna ride this out because I know I can get there. 100%. Uh, when it comes to that resilience, the player that comes to mind 100% is going to be Kerem. Now, we're not seeing him here here on, on day four, but all, so many times he starts off the day with a butt four, but then is able to bring it back, right? And I think Solus is a player who can still do the same things. His tournament, you know, uh, placements have been a little wishy-washy. Sometimes he pops off, sometimes he just kind of uh, rides out into the middle of the pack, but I think Solus can still bring it back here. He's on the bubble, so it's time to make it happen. All right. Well, we'll see how it all plays out. Crow and Cass, I'll leave it to you for game number five, day four of the Sharima Cup. Crow, no shot. All right, thank you, Gangly, but I'm looking at this and I see so many people on Halls of Nine. <laughs> Halls of Nine, it's time. <laughs> it's time. Oh, Vandal Cafeteria, go. though, that makes sense for Setsuko. I'm hoping we get a Hall of Nine. That's a very crazy new location. Oh, no. That is, but instead, it's Immortal Bastion. Goobums gets it. Uh, for any chatter who doesn't know, Halls of Nine on stage five, everyone gets a two star legendary. So it's kind of creates some crazy situations once you get to that stage five. Hey, Milk was also on Immortal Bastion. That's where we saw him in Freljord Cup and be the yeah. lobby assassin there. But it's going to be not him alone there. And we get to go to the Immortal Bastion. We get the Noxus Portal coming through here. People having to place their units around that placeable flag. Yeah, last time we saw a lot of Noxus, right? Being very strong. That's what Milk ended up finding success with. It was actually interesting. Milk 
uh, ended up watching that game back from his perspective. He wanted to play uh, towards Kale on Immortal Bastion while running oh, Lee true. Sin. And once again, Milk wow. in the spot. He's, He's doing swapped it. to Lee Sin. This is a repeat of that game in Freljord Cup where he needed a win. He needed a first place. And he went to Immortal Bastion playing Lee Sin with intention of going Kale. He's in the spot once more. Now, last time he ended up on a Darius Katarina line. He didn't get a Kale spot, but... We'll see if he gets to go the full direction that he wanted to with that prep on the Kale. And if I remember correctly, Milk did go first that game, right? Talking about the fact he that he he was the lobby assassin, went Immortal Bastion, caught everyone kind of off guard, and it ended up going first. And that's you know what Milk's going to be leading for this time again, although albeit maybe from from the Kale line, like that Lee Sin does indicate. So we're 100% gonna have to make a look at where Milk decides to go to, but that legend change conversation that we just had, we are seeing Milk be the one that is committing to it, and he needs to have a big game, right? Being on the lower side of that bubble at 16 points. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about it was Solus and Milk, the two at 16, and you know, I mentioned that Solus was someone I would expect to potentially go in that direction. He's just kind of sticking with Earth here, and in fact, it is Milk that does it, but I should have remembered that Bastion game. It was it's the one that I loved casting live, and I did go back and watch, so... Yep. Uh, the fact is, he's going back for it. Finds an Aurelia too early on for Milk. Uh, not, we'll, we'll end up seeing if he has a kill spot or not. But at least here, Setsuko has gone for branching out and has a challenger angle with that challenger spat. Yeah, he's able to potentially reforge it if he wants to. But challenger angle has been played to some, you know, kind of decent success if we're thinking about top fours. And Setsuko... He's not worried right now. 29 points, well in first place right now, is be, is, is going to advance into game six. Now we got to take into account how many you know points does he have in the lead once he gets into that final lobby to clinch a top four or even a win. Setsuko is certainly hungry for another tournament win, finally getting one not too long ago. Um, but he's in a solid spot right now. Nothing too crazy on this board. It looks like it's going to be a challenger commit, however, and look to find those Yasuo Kaisa items a bit later as nothing's really slamble at this point, albeit okay. maybe a Hodge. Kron, I want to talk about what was across the board there. That was Solus, who, uh, you know, you may remember was known for a certain uh, reroll composition. It was a two cost. Is that yeah, true? That is very his true. His branching out has hit a rogue, <laughs> and he's got a pair of Zeds. He's got a slammed spark, which is really good with yeah. Katarina. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is a comp that can do quite all right on a more yeah. Bastion. It's not bad as far as positioning. 100%. This feels like Solus might go in that direction because a lot of players would see that Rogue Emblem and they would hit that Reforger immediately. But not Solus. <laughs> he's, no. he's looking at this Z angle, potentially looking for that reroll. He needs a first place. This is a comp that can find first. But I'm curious, would it ever be for Rogue? I mean, it has been buffed couple of times usually though people do think it's still pretty terrible so we'll see. i mean yeah. we'll see we'll see we'll have to keep our eyes on solace to spot you would even be okay to just run three rogue and put rogue in something like a like a darius right and you have a few of the extra items you can itemize him four definitely doesn't need to come through but it could if anyone's gonna be comfortable with this line it is solace solace has played so many games of zed when it was in the meta 100% no surprise to see him be comfortable with this angle and not reforge that rogue emblem. Again, right, like we we're saying, it doesn't need to be that four rogue. It still could just be, you know, played for the three. Um, and we saw Rain Plosion plot Zed earlier in day three of this event and find a top four with it. So it's not like Zed is completely out of the meta. It can still be good. And I think Solus is the perfect person to try to pilot that. Yeah, and unfortunately for Milk, let's look at Broccoli's spot. This is a very good Kale angle. Oh, having yeah. consistency for the lost streak and already being on a pair of Kales with Ginsu's and Startup, both of the frontliners, the two-star. This is an incredibly good spot to play Kale from. And that means if Milk was looking to play that line, if he wants to force it, it will be contested. And that's really unfortunate for Milk's spot. He has to find something else to work. Um, it, from that spot and he did it before like you're mentioning he landed on the Noxus when he tried that in the Freljord Cup to um, some very high success Broccoli however is in such a fantastic spot doesn't even need to slam the Ginsu for Kale because he's just being concerned with making sure that consistency is getting value he's benching the Maokai 2 benching the Poppy 2 not slamming any items and it's okay to go low HP you know it, it's fine because once this composition gets level 6 hits the 3 stars it stabilizes until hopefully level 9 where Kale really turns online and fully ascends yeah and immediately we can take a look here and call out that Milk did probably notice that from scouting as Broccoli may have had this spot very early on, and Milk ended up going for a Zonheart instead. 
and he's got good items for it you know potentially can go for a last whisper but you don't have to slam that yet right you can play for the lose streak as we see him doing and keep those components which are great to build out the bis items for the composition yeah 100 uh mel going for that zon lean we know that that kind of the whole study group uh maybe besides for even setsuko right even with playing earth you're able to go into that plus one zon sometimes but they all value zeri very very highly um so it's no, really no surprise there take a look at Weishin, however going to be with that kind of standard noxus challenger open even thing small things like playing double samir as they're both able to shred armor which makes that be able to deal damage a lot faster even if it's just a samira one that armor shred is so so valuable and a big part of why Wage Iverson is able to be win streaking right now. Yeah, it's big and definitely. I mean, the, the funny thing we always watch in Immortal Bastion is just this positioning. It ends up that everyone's just in a cluster and uh, the early stages of the game, it doesn't matter that much because there's not a ton of, you know, attack on everything uh, coming through. But uh, as this game continues on, this is a big positioning puzzle and challenge that we'll get to see um, because, you know, you can't just clump everything as the game goes on uh yep. too much crowd control and aoe damage will just smack you in the face if you end up keeping this cluster yeah 100 percent. and even going back into the you know plus one zon point if we're able to get six zon online get the uh unstable chem tank and especially oh, yeah. players placing around this club that's gonna be a you know a jarvan jumping in and exploding and, and killing pretty much everything in sight so players are going to need to be really really wary uh, about that positioning but yeah like you're saying once we get into later stages of the game right now it's still okay to clump there's not really that aoe damage aoe cc to worry about so we just see these death balls all coming around it's gonna be keyun playing towards a, a initial sorcerer line has three sork online with a blue buff so hoping to find that re late game but also lux uh, can utilize that item very well um having three sork red buff very good for the early streak and kian's been able to streak with it right he's on a four it looks like he will be able to get this five streak into krugs as well uh it is just that samira left but with the one more cast from that Tarek, it's gonna be playing yeah, it's interesting because Kiyun didn't play any uh, sort games yesterday. No AP lines, but today leaning into it multiple times. It could just be the spots that he's given with, right? Early blue buff. It's like, all right, I'm going to slam and carry a Malzahar. Maybe you can go in something like a, an Ari later on uh, or a Lux, right? And so it, I think it goes to show Kiyun has been very prepped on just multiple lines with that start of the group. They're not just going to be, you know, leaning Zeri, leaning Aphelios, right? They're able to still go whatever lines are open with their openers. And uh, Broccoli's spot just looking better and better, right? I mean, he's already on four poppies, five Maokais, got three Kales, and the Ginsu's really good slams, right? Ginsu Bramble, and he's made it to 50 gold here right before the Krugs. Well, he's 49, so if he doesn't get dropped any gold, it can be a little bit less than perfect there. But with the inconsistency, taking so much money, there we he'll go. be able More to have money. a big roll down here on 3-1. And we'll see if he can just fully hit the Kale, maybe plus the poppies in a good spot to do so. Yeah, 77 gold starting this roll down immediately finds a KO. We're still a long way to go, but players will oftentimes be rolling pretty heavily until 30 gold on level four to try to find everything in time. One Maokai away already. Still far from the Kale and the Poppy. We need uh we need a bunch more Kales. We need three more Poppies. Still gonna be rolling to looks like 30. Finds yeah, another Kale. You know, Maybe going poppies. deeper actually. Yeah, oh wow, he's going all the way down. Finds the Maokai, finds one more Kale. Two Kales away, two Poppies away. There's the Kales. There's the Kale, wow. At this still point, sending though, he it. does have to find the Poppy. Uh, can't really not go for it. But the fact that he's still sending it is quite interesting to me, going all the way to zero. Yeah, a lot of players would have been okay, I think, with just the one hit to try to recover economy. But sending it even further is wow, one, one poppy, poppy away, finds a Kale by selling that Kled. But Kled is a unit that you really want in this composition. He's going to be trying to snap the streak, especially if he wins here. Yeah, he wins right here. He Oh, there it oh, is. Oh, there's a poppy. He got it in time. Yes, he did. Everything has been found. And buying the Tristana is actually pretty huge as well because it's going to be able to um, just need one more Yordle to make that Poppy a Poppy 4. Unfortunately, the shop doesn't give a Teemo or a Kled, but as soon as that Kled is found, especially giving Slayer over to Kale, that's going to be such a power spike. Um, even another Rod already um, to, to be making that double Rage Blade, or if he's okay with a Gunblade. Gunblade is this very serviceable Kale item as well, and two really good Poppy tanks items so broccoli is actually you know he did roll really deep but he's still in a good spot because he hit everything with exactly zero gold left the only scary thing for me is selling the cled because i'm having flashbacks to that <laughs> appy's game where he lost True. he couldn't find a cled the oh, entire no. game yeah. and it just absolutely lost him a spot that looked like it could be a first so i mean this is just you know one example of that happening i do think it was a very good play by broccoli to ensure he just hits everything while he could still roll on four 
and uh you know odds are he can find a cled right you just make yeah. the roll back you, you if you have to roll down on six roll down on seven try and find a cled you know, make it happen the happy spot was unfortunate as soon as you said it i just have like this visceral reaction i'm like oh yeah i remember he was rolling for so much it was like where's my cled i just it, he just never saw a cled after that point um and so hopefully broccoli not finding himself stuck in that same hole but taking a look at solace here playing the six noxus not finding a round win at three two goobums was a little bit too strong but something that i wanted to call out really quick is that because that rogue emblem is still on the board at level six he's able to uh, run with the six noxus and the two rogue and the three items Darius with one of the items being that rogue emblem is still really strong yeah Darius is actually great at holding that item especially when you can get two really strong items with him and if you can find some good combat augments to add to it to make up for the loss of combat stats from the third item and Darius can actually utilize that get on the back line find resets easier when just dunking on you know some of the weaker backline units if he gets on a carry obviously that's ideal but if not sometimes just hitting a weak backliner that's there for synergies he gets a reset and then he gets to jump to the carry from there so a lot yeah. of good things can happen from rogue darius 100 percent goopum says three reforgers for somehow one from the uh branching out and um it's gonna be a freljord emblem so having three failure in the mid game is really good it's when that mana shred does really start to get value there even delaying the samira cast delaying the cassiopeia cast in the back line while allowing his own samira to ramp up with the rage blade i think has a lot of good things uh coming along together and that's actually this fight might just be a three failure diff honestly yeah, it's very close. You know, all these hits are actually giving this uh, Cassio so much yeah. to, to heal up, right? Having that Hodge, having the Sharima continuing to crank through, but just not quite enough to win that fight. So that's huge to pick up that W. Taking a look at the carousel. See Broccoli spot. Broccoli has found the Teemo. So that Poppy 4 is online. That super tank going to be so, so rough to, to kind of break through. There are a bunch of Samiras rolling around, though. So armor shredding that Poppy means that she's going to be falling a lot faster than maybe uh, is expected for sure. Um, Setsuko rocking the challenger, but another player has challenger as well. And that's Robin Song's actually taking the challenger crest from the uh, gold tier augment. Yeah, maybe we'll see that line contested. Generally, that hasn't been the case, but if the spot is good enough, you go for it. And now we're jumping on board with Milk, who is primed for this level seven roll down. He does have the Jinx with very, very good uh, items for the Zeri. We'll see if he can actually oh. hit one, finds two Urgots. And yeah. continue on with this roll. No Zeris yet, has a lot of the supporting pieces, a lot of pairs. Yeah, had the shop of four, four costs, but not a single one being Zeri. Found like two Nasses so far, but skipped by them pair of ergots this is kind of a, a rough spot he gets the uh unstable chem tank for zon mod in and just gonna be trying to itemize the ergot a little bit with that titan's resolve but melk is still not quite stable at this point um even though the jinx has really good items right it's jinx too it's still able to do a decent amount of work but where is the zeri right being about 10 gold you can't really afford to just keep rolling down a level seven forever that's not gonna end up in a spot where milk can get first place and again milk is needs a first or at least a second to try to advance on into the final two games yeah yeah both milk and solace are kind of in those spots that need to be playing for first milk has a spot that is very good right a lot of pairs hasn't found the zeri though but this champion duplicator does help quite a bit if he can continue to roll through find you know a zeri pair he can make that into the zeri too especially since trying to look for two zeris he should likely find uh completions on these pairs on the ergot and on the sichuani he's at least kind of close to it but just not finding it as he continues to roll all the way down vi potentially can be an in right now yeah it does replace that Ocho. Ocho. The bruiser some yeah. upgrades at least and Melk's in a weird spot where if you're rolling down, you don't hit any Zeris, but hit a lot of Jinxes, right? He could just go for Jinx 3. That reroll style of, of uh, the Zon isn't played or prioritized as much, but is only really seen in this specific situation where you're not finding the Zeris and you find a bunch of Jinxes. He is still three Jinxes away with that duplicator on the bench, but I think if he does hit a bunch and only, say, hit like one Zeri, he's just going to slam the duplicator on the Jinx, try to use that to then push levels. Um, He's still just behind when it comes to the economy very, very heavily, though, so even still, that might not be enough. And it's rough because it feels like the only times we see that top two uh, for Jinx is when you have robotic arm and i don't think True. that milk had robotic arm there it looked like it was like a purple glow right which is either virulent or um it's the other mod that has the purple glow it's the uh adaptive, adaptive i think yeah. purpley glow uh we'll, we'll get an update get from, from production in a bit to confirm what his uh zon mods are but um yeah i didn't think it was robotic arm at the very, very least it is adaptive okay 
Yeah, so that, that Jinx spot, it's, that's definitely a great point to bring up. It's way less likely that Jinx 3 is going to have that kind of power without the robotic arm to carry at 3 star. But now taking a look at Robin Song's roll down does find a legendary at uh, seven and Aatrox kind of fits very well into this challenger style board. It's going to be enabling Juggernaut for work to be a bit tankier and just giving that power once Aatrox dies and especially if it lands on a unit like a Yasuo have the extra uh, HP lifesteal. It's going to be really, really good. There we are able to get six challenger in doesn't get a lot of value from the immortal bastion on this one but at least gets it onto the two carries i think robin was just kind of in the middle of this whole transition right now and gonna run into broccoli who should still be at the point in the game where this board is just insanely strong having all of those three stars of upgrades but he has yeah as you said he has lost i guess it's kind of maybe hitting that in between power trough it feels like at level six with all these upgrades you tend to win for a little bit and then you start losing again yeah. Um, and this one is a win, but I'm curious what boards Broccoli was facing up against that he ended up losing to, or maybe he wasn't able to get to level six until more recently because he did go to zero on those roll downs. Yeah, definitely. Maybe it was up against Goobums. I know Goobums like 10 streaked into Wolves. Um, that's actually a really insane spot to, to call out there. But now seeing this last augment, it is a gold tier augment. Juggernaut Crest, should Lois, or Job Well Done. Job Well Done might actually be a strong consideration by Robin um, to be able to itemize everything. Um, he's going to have three items on the Aatrox and actually have the, the Tricksters on it to get another Aatrox buff spreading around, but needs to really be thinking about the Kai'Sa and the Yasuo as well. Says that's not quite quite worth it however so it's probably just going to be leaning towards the uh the jeweled lotus i believe for just an extra little bit of damage making sure they can crit and that's exactly what is going to be the case here oh he also does have three items actually it's just the kaisa that would really uh, be benefiting from that orn augment yeah yeah the kaisa definitely needing some more items but also jeweled lotus does synergize really well with that hodge letting the ability crit and it does open up your item option quite a bit instead of wanting that jg it's definitely just look for Sh uh, shojin with the tier and then from there, I mean, there's a lot of flexibility in what that last item can be for the Kai'Sa. If you find one more glove, you can actually just go Guard Breaker, Shoujin, plus this uh, Hodge. And with Jeweled Lotus, that's actually just a very good build to have. Yeah, looks like Milk used the Duplicator on an Urgot 2 to try to stabilize. And that's really strong right now. My only worry is that it's going to fall off really heavily. I mean, taking a look at that, you know, third number there on the right hand side there's the gold there's the streak and then there's the board power level milk is well above everybody else by a 10 at least so he has used all of his gold all of his resources right with that duplicator to just try to stabilize again still worried if that's enough to go for that first or second slot like he needs yeah i mean we'll really just have to see if uh milk can natural some zeries and stuff in his shop as he's going towards eight i think with committing all those resources he has to go towards level eight at this point I think trying to continue to just roll down on seven over and over again while you have this strong of a board doesn't make much sense. So uh, we also see other players spiking, right? Kiyun rolled down to zero on level 755 is the value of his board at this point. So he did go up quite a bit from even oh, yeah. just us talking about milk in this round. Exactly, yeah. He's going to have an absolutely fantastic board. Uh, we see Setsuko, the other challenger player, going up against Goobums, but it's a challenger Gwen with three very, very good items. Um, so that's going to be enough to allow Setsuko to uh, start winning out. So he's to snap that loss streak and just does, or does just that. Yeah, we jump on board Weijin. Still having a lot of HP, right? He's our leader at 94. He's gone to level 8. His board is still actually winning. He's on a 7 streak. Make that 8. Yeah, that's crazy. Asian potentially going to be able to look for a fast nine with this and then try and find uh, good uh, legendary carriers of these items after that fact. The fact that he's winning 20 gold, he's still making econ and his board is still strong enough that even if he loses, he shouldn't be losing that bad. Makes this feel like a very good fast nine spot. Yeah, that, that's actually really, really insane. Great um, board efficiency, uh, I think, is a term that I've grown to like over this tournament, um, especially with that board value stat. That Weijin and other players like that are just so good at being able to utilize the highest effectiveness. Um, getting last pick on Carousel, you know, it's a little unfortunate, but still, he's going to be able to make that cloak work out, I think, pretty well. Taking a look at Weijin's board, yeah, he's going to be just slamming an extra runans, exactly. Weijin playing this item tempo to its highest effectiveness, and that double Samira like he's had in Sense 2-1, you know, that Samira 1 is upgraded to a Samira 2, but even a Shed 1 frontline is able to get the job done here. This is just kind of insane in terms of board efficiency. It's like, yeah, you have options with the Samira as you hit that many early, and it's like, oh, you could roll, try and go for the 3-star, or you play it tempo like this, because with both of them, they're stacking that armor shred, getting the frontline to the negative so quickly, the rest of your board is able to just wipe through everything 
lets you deal plenty of damage and now that shen having three items even though it is shen one it's buying so much time that even though these other boards have scaled quite a bit the samiras have the time to shred through all the armor and still win the fights this urga is taking so much damage from a bunch of one costs and the fact that he was able to jump in the back line is the big difference in milk actually yeah. winning this fight right his, his board is worth more gold but also the positioning around immortal bastion really came to bite Weijin there because ergot got into the middle of his team and that lets all the shotgun knees pop off yeah the shotgun knees came through then the zeri aoe milk did finally find one zeri to come through and robin songs finds the kaisa upgrade that is absolutely huge it is going to be yasuo 2 kaisa 2 with two good items right that hodge and now the guard breaker coming through even more synergy with that jeweled lotus every single cast is going to be critting a lot of the time um six challenger three ionia two juggernaut that's where robin's kind of stuck for now but he's going to hopefully be strong enough to stabilize go to level eight and try to find some more legendary units to throw and maybe a Heimer does synergize well at this stage of the game with a challenger board. Here we go. Robin fighting against Eun. That's the Sorx. They're all clumped in the corner. But Robin's board was clumped as well. And the Jarvan hits onto every single unit. The Kaisa and the Yasuo both surviving quite well. So they do have a lot of time to deal damage. But that means the Sorks are going to get a second round in just a moment as the Jarvan jumps once again. But this Yasuo has tanked for way longer than I ever could have imagined. And because of that, it is going to be Robin finding this fight win over Kiyun. Yeah, I'm exa hit, hit exactly when he needed to. And that was the power. That was probably the difference in that fight. Broccoli towards the bottom of the lobby, 8 HP, but has a two win streak going on. Broccoli, however, probably isn't in contention to move on. It's really just that six person race and Setsuko being the one that's on the other side on top with so many points. But everybody else, you know, it's starting to get really scary, especially as we look at that lobby HP towards the bottom four. Robin being at 25, Solus at 24, and, you know, Setsuko at 10, even though he's gonna, gonna be that one that's still very safe. Yeah, and it looks like Goobomb is just hard pivoting into a Zeri board as well. We know this is heavily contested. Milk definitely just committed to this line. Uh, it's at least those two players. I'm curious if there's actually any more because I know we have a couple people re-rolling different things, right? We have a Kale, we have a uh, Rogue slash Noxus player, and then we have a couple challengers. So maybe this line is actually a little bit more open than yeah, it usually two, would two be. Two-way contested this two lobby. Players. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this Goobums and Melk. Um, Goobums does the nice thing of not denying the Zeri away from Melk. Tries to find some more of their uh, own upgrades to fit in. Uh, the Aatrox pair is here as well. Only one Urgot, so it's going to be the Nasus go again for the Juggernaut frontline. But for Freljord, that is a big, big thing to watch out for. How much value that has in the fight, especially against the Mirror matchup with the Zeri 1 versus Zeri 2. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I'm looking to see how Goobums utilizes this champion duplicator right he does have the pair of atroxes he could just make an wow, atrox too Urgot. but also an ergot too would be very nice for his board and, <laughs> and you know there's a lot of things that being upgraded would be strong and even though yes atrox is a legendary unit a lot of the value of atrox is when he dies and he gives that buff to another unit on your board so maybe he isn't actually the best target for that duplicator as broccoli actually losing to one of the challengers and just going down immediately on 5-1 yeah the poppy cast maybe was trying to hit a dead unit there but it i don't know if it would have been the difference um i don't think it could have killed the kaisa anyway next kaisa cast would have taken her out but yeah the kale just wasn't powerful enough broccoli if we think back right sent it all the way down to zero hit everything but that still wasn't enough because he didn't have the gold to go level six probably took a few more losses at that point and wasn't even stable in the mid game at level six because he had taken a couple losses when we were at least our last talking about it um it doesn't work out broccoli does go eighth well, we said two-way contested, but make that three. Weijin has pivoted into Zeri as well. Oh, okay. He had a very wealthy spot. He rolled down. He found a couple of pairs for the composition and decided, hey, here we go. But Zeri is going to be hard to hit. He, he's found a pair of Urgoth, a pair of Sejuanis. Uh, he does have the pair of Zeris as well, but with both Milk and Goobums contesting and Goobums already hitting, especially Weijin going down to three gold here, it's going to be very tough to actually find that unit. And it looks like uh, positioning in that corner. We talked about clumping for Mortal Bastion. This Jarvan is having a field day on everyone's board for Q. Yeah, that Dvar Paula stone plate plus the uh, the vow is just so, so tanky there in the back line. Even when it's like Zeri and all the rest of the gunners turn to him, it's just not going to be uh, enough as I kind of had it locked in my mind that Weijin's going fast nine from the spot that he was in. But no, I said I can't quite make that decision. I have to roll at level eight and Zeri was the Zon was the route that he found. Does hit the Urgot too, as we see on the right hand side there, but not a Zeri two quite yet. Still 52 HP is 
is enough to stabilize hopefully until hitting that Zeri 2 and looking for a top four placement because he's on the the top side of that bubble doesn't need to like exactly a first place but does still need like a top three to be safe well, and someone who did kind of need that top placement, Solus, has fallen as well. That is likely Yost going to eliminate him uh, from the tournament. Won't be able to make it in that top 16, but still another impressive showing from Solus. I think over and over again, he has continually made that day four, having very impressive performances. And still, you know, even if he doesn't make top 16, it is still a good performance to make it to that top 32. And Setsuko going to win a fight against Milk here. Milk being the other player who kind of needs that top two spot to feel comfortable making it into the top 16. Yeah, Milk taken out by Setsuko in that fight. Robin Song's beating Kiyun, it looks like as well. So Robin doing a, a pretty great job at stabilizing in a composition that doesn't really find a lot of top fours, doesn't really find a lot of lobby wins, even with it being contested there. All right, looking at these pickups, Robin grabbing an item, the Sakaisa item. We talked about how it could be a little bit flexible on what goes for Kaisa and just ends up finding an Archangels. To go towards that direction or actually maybe no the kaisa is fully itemized i wonder where that's going if that's uh going for callista yeah could be I for mean, rise noxus probably, rise probably just callista i mean the noxus rise giving some uh items over to the rest of the units they're not gonna really really that valuable though you already have three items on your main damage dealers and everything else is kind of just there uh, honestly to provide the the synergies maybe throwing some items on like a, a warwick or a callista is going to be giving a little bit of value but yeah, yeah the archangels does and in, in fact go onto the callista as repositioning but still positioning that clump around this immortal bastion flag the thing is challenges get away from that though because kaisa dashes away and yasuo dashes hopefully towards the back line yeah it's actually maybe why we're seeing two players on this challenger line and we see them both in this fight it's Tsuko going up against robin Tetsuko does have these spatulas, does have the ability to go even more vertical on the challenger's line and has a Belveth challenger, which I do think is much stronger than that Aatrox. Yeah. That is a challenger. So Tetsuko going to win that, put Robin very, very low. However, Robin, I think, does still have a strong board. It's possible he can beat a lot of other players in this lobby. The challengers are For doing sure. really well here on Immortal Bastion, getting that extra attack speed, that extra health. It just kind of helps them do what challengers already do best, even more, even stronger. So even though this comp has been a little weaker, Mortal Bastion does beef it up quite a bit. Yeah, that, both of those are great points. And I think one thing really to hone in on is the fact that, yeah, Robin's board could still beat a lot of these other boards. And everyone's quickly following this lobby, right? About 31 HP on Goobums, a little bit less for everybody else. So it could just be a couple rounds before players start getting eliminated. So if Robin can hang on for a couple of rounds, could be getting that top four that he needs to feel safe. And he's up against Milk, who's just on the Zeri 1, but that Urgot is the most terrifying thing on the board. We have to watch where it goes. It jumps in, knees oh, yeah, not hitting down. the main targets. It gets CC'd a little bit. However, the Zeri has stayed alive the whole time. None of the damage no. is able to get there, and Robin goes down. Milk finding another placement, buying some more health, eliminating competition, and Milk trying to set himself up for that top two. If he can find Zeri 2, his board is so strong with that Urgot already. It might make all the difference. Yeah, definitely. Robin, that Yasuo was not able to make a lot of things happen um, in the past few fights, right? It was able to get to the back line, but then taken out by the Zeri. Um, unfortunately, goes six, but we see Kiyun on the bubble right now. Three losses in a row. Setsuko on a five streak. All the board strengths are about the same in terms of gold value. So a lot of it is just, you know, what comp matchups are going to be better. A lot of things they, like I mentioned earlier with the Goobums, that four Freljord, especially into that mirror matchup and a lot of other matchups. Four Freljord in this lobby is so, so valuable. Absolutely. I mean, getting those stunts, getting that time is so incredibly important as we take a look at Setsuko on the roll down. It's kind of looking for two star legendaries on eight, which is a little bit tough, but also the Kaisa two does find the Aatrox two will actually make that. It's going to increase his power a little bit. His items look real funky as well. And the Gwen yeah. items kind of want to be on the Kaisa. However, the Kaisa is only one star. It's a funky board, but it was able to take out Robin's challenger board. And now Weijin, another one of the Zeri players. Going up against them, and all of his units are hitting onto that Eternal Winter Shen. However, it gets deleted by the Belveth. And now it's down to this Urgot that keeps surviving, but the Belveth just does so much damage. She's able to carry Glenn's the fight. The back. That is the big difference maker in all of these, is Setsuko's Challenger Belveth. It is just a Belveth one, but with the Gunblade healing, with the uh, extra survivability from the Edge of Night, 
And then the attack speed from the Immortal Bastion and the Challenger, she's so scaled up that she's doing an immense amount of damage. The God Setsuko strikes again, says 29 points isn't enough. I want to carry that forward. So I am a lock to get a top four in this tournament, doing it with challengers, doing it, playing the earth, the off meta pick. Setsuko coming out big to even top four this lobby. Let's see how much further he can go. That repositioning to left hand side. Some may say even the Aatrox 2 is weaker because it takes longer to die to spread around that buff, but doesn't seem like it made the difference in the last fight. Let's take a look at this one as the Yasuo gets Zephyred. Yeah, great Zephyr from Milk hits the Yasuo, trying to deal with this Belveth, though. That's the scariest thing. And there was a Coral in the middle of the team in the clump of the back line, able to take down the Zeri immediately. And now it's down. just a bunch of other Corals to jump to. Milk gonna take a big loss from Setsuko there is, as you said, Goobums falling in fourth. Yeah, Goobums took a big loss on the other side of the fight as well. So again, Setsuko climbing up and Milk actually somehow has gotten to this point where he's able to contest that top two finish. He really needs to look for it. Third might not be enough. A zero gold rolled down everything. Everyone has rolled down at this point. So it's just going to come down to this last second positioning. Do we start to spread around some of these units? And where does the Yasuo jump to? The Bastion only lands really on Yasuo to get a ton of value. Let's see if that's okay for Setsuko. Go ahead, yeah, I'm looking the on the other side though. Milk, Milk going up against Weijin. That's a big fight. Trying to get these placements. Milk needs this. It's the Zeris, but there is the Eternal Winter making a big difference. However, the Urgot has gotten into the back line for Milk. It's hitting on to Weijin Zeri, but it's not enough. No. Weijin takes the fight. Milk takes a third. And that may be enough, but it's going to be very close considering he started this lobby at 16. Yeah, plus six points means Milk's going to be at 22. Not sure that's enough. We'll have to see where everything else does land. But Setsuko versus Weijin Iverson two players Weijin actually we you know we didn't talk about it that much Weijin needed a big game as well he was at 18 points so you know on that bubble as well seems like he's gonna be pretty safe after this top two finds even more upgrades with the senate two as well um Weijin played this game super well actually i want to want to give some some props to that um playing that early efficient board pivoting into zeri even though it was contested but making it work hitting everything and that shen now being upgraded is just a fantastic front line a lot of pieces came together really well as he 1v1s now setsuko with the challengers yeah the big thing to watch is this belveth it's what beat Weijin last time the clump is still rough because it does give the corals right in the middle once something goes down there's the first drop the first coral is jumped to belveth trying to make it into the back line i think there was an edge of night proc there but there's still so much hp comes down to does the zeri have the damage she's trying to shred through it's just the belveth remaining oh, jumps the away. zeri might be able to do it oh uh, they're targeting oh. onto the zeri that was the best target that she could have picked and it's gonna be enough to win it one more, one more coral and that's it the belveth is going to win the fight Weijin will still survive though there were three targets to pick and belveth picked the very best one Oh, that was crazy. Oh, no, it's Belveth too. too. Setsuko makes the impossible happen. That fight was so close. He wins it out and now gets Belveth upgrade. This next fight, unless something crazy happens, it should very, very much go the way of Setsuko. Belveth 1 was enough to get the job done. What about a Belveth 2? It should be able to handle this easily, right? I can't imagine that Weijin's able to find the win after the Belveth 2 upgrade comes through. That's the problem unit. That's the thing that he can't deal with. He came very close in that last fight, but the Zeri ended up being the target of the Belveth. And now once again, the positioning has not changed much. Jumping to the Corals. She even has the Aatrox riding aboard this time to give the extra healing. There it goes through the back line. It's not even close. Easy. Weijin's just going to be taken down by this Belveth. Just has to get through the Urgot. And there we go. Setsuko finding yet another first place. This time on the Challenger's line here on Immortal Bastion. I believe Setsuko's the one who called his shot alongside Milk and was standing on Immortal Bastion. Once again, <laughs> the person who asked for that portal finds a first. 
incredible gameplay coming out of Setsuko there. There's a lot to talk about in that lobby, though, obviously. That was the bubble lobby going into the fifth and final game, right? And after this game, this is the point where we are going to be cutting the field down from 32 in to 16. So got to talk about a lot of those players that were looking, that were sitting on that bubble. You had Robin Songs who came in with the six. And it's important to note, I do want to acknowledge in the game before that, Robin Songs did experience a pretty significant bug that may that certainly had an impact in his overall placement, sending him eighth before that. However, coming in six, definitely still a player that has a chance to move on. We'll, we'll talk a little yep. bit more about that as we see the standings. But the story of that game, I would say largely, is Weijin playing this really interesting early game of... I mean, we see two Samiras all the time, right? We see it all the time, Crone, when we when we see the Trickster's Glass, but no Trickster's Glass, two Samiras <laughs> on the board, turning into a really interesting level eight board. And I think, personally, I was kind of surprised to see him opting into the contested Zeri line, but Weijin Iverson able to pilot pilot that into a top two with Setsuko coming up in first. Yeah, I'm sure Weijin was open to a lot of outs in that situation. He had to uh, assess that whole game in a very kind of weird way because he could have gone so many directions, be it Aphelios, be it Zeri, be it to pivot into something like random, like, you know, Gwen carry like we saw, um, uh, like we saw Setsuko do with the challengers. Um, but also he could have gone level nine as well. He had the HP and gold to be able to do so, but who knows if he would have just gone nine, rolled once or twice and, you know, just died off like the old Soju special kind of thing. Um, but no, he played I think really intelligently found the Zeri even if it was contested he was in a spot where even a Zeri uh a Zeri one um or Ur got one like if one of those were upgraded then he could stabilize and we saw exactly that happen and so while he wasn't able to get the first place he almost did right those fights against Setsuko were so close at the end I think he played that really intelligently and uh, I'm impressed to see Oasian still be you know having success in further sets than we saw him really break out here and still making very intelligent plays like that it, it bodes super super well for just any talent in general I continue to be impressed by Oasian Let's take a look at how the rest of the lobbies played out again for this fifth and final game before we cut the field. We saw Lobby A just now with Setsuko and Weijin in the top two. However, in Lobby B, we had Chris TFT and HSA coming in the top two. Lobby C, Sub-Zero Arc with another wow. first place finish. The Caitlyn player making <laughs> a stance with K3 Soji in the top two. In Lobby D, Malala and Casper Wu. Hey, it's a good day for the Weijin Malala study group. But we do have the overall standings ready and now we can see how the field has been cut and on the bubble it wow. looks like 23 is that point robin songs continuing on because he has the tiebreaker win but we saw them in the game kiyun milk 22 points cast a lot of these players just barely missing out yeah just barely missing the cutoff the tiebreakers would have been harsh especially you know robin having two firsts i'm sure there was other firsts as well. we saw a little kahuna pick up first earlier right so uh, making it in really, really rough to say goodbye to all these players. But that's what happens when you get to the top 32. Everybody that you lose uh, the bottom 16 are also really good players that you expected could have made that top 16. It's all about celebrating those who are having a, a great day here. And I mean, you know, I'm, of course, going to keep shouting out Sub-Zero Arc. I didn't have a ton of faith going into day four, to be honest. I thought he was playing really well, but maybe not the level of some of the other players. But he came in here and proved me dead wrong amazing performance here so far and makes me happy to see that that different play style coming through i want to yeah. draw some attention to casper Wu here crow and casper mm -hmm. is one of these players who has been in the scene for a long time has competed in a lot of tournaments but has never really found that shining top eight placement however is still highly regarded for being incredibly good at the game and so it does feel nice to see casper making his way into a top 16 and in a good position to make that final lobby yeah, very good position for a final lobby and it could be any tournament right someone who's on the outside cusp looking in in so many events this just could be casper Wu's time and players like you know sub-zero kind of making a case for that um as well even though they're a little bit newer to the scene it still feels good for both of them uh, i did also real quick want to point out and i like to harp on you know what players failures of getting eliminated but uh, i did want to quickly point out why mdn started off this this day really really strong unfortunately did go back to back eighths to miss out and moving on by one point but especially it being their first event ever the first official yeah. tournament that's still nothing to be disappointed about um it feels so bad to be that close to you know advancing it and not make it but i think that still bodes really well for mtn knows that they can really compete with the best of them had a couple of unlucky games right we didn't see exactly what happened but it shouldn't be a discouraging factor at all just want to you know hopefully keep the spirits up and hopefully we'll see them again in the future 
Definitely shoutouts to YMDN and Master Uknam, the two remaining players that made their debut this weekend. Both of them, yeah. unfortunately, not making the top 16 cut, but still an impressive showing to make it this far. Now, we have got two more games on the day, and we are going to be coming up with the top 16 in just a couple minutes. So don't go anywhere, and we'll see you soon. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Game number six, day four of the Sharima Cup coming up. This is the top 16. Now, Boop, this is one of those lobbies. I look at it, at it and I say the sky is dark for all the stars are in lobby A. Everybody that you may have heard of in TFT is sitting in this lobby competing for one last game to get into that top eight. 
we have like different generations of success in there as well. But like you said, I think we got the world champion. We got potential world champions. We got Piga, the set, what it's supposed to was nine, 10, maybe 11 is a world <laughs> sure, champion. Yeah, yeah. But like, at, at, you know, but you got, you know, I joke, but Piga's been having a really great tournament so far. But yeah, like you said, the stars are here to play. It's the Hollywood Boulevard of TFT for this lobby. I'm excited to what they're going to do and how they're going to play against each other because not all of those stars are going to end up going back into the sky. Some of them might supernova. I want to call out Mort. So this is the first time this set we're seeing uh, Sox play, right? He did not compete in the Freljord Cup. And, you know, I have heard many people talk about the fact that Sox is not maybe in the same form that he once was, maybe uh, does not have the same availability to really play TFT. But the thing that always draws me to TFT is the accessibility of it, right? When a new patch drops, the game does change. And it does kind of give an opening for someone to kind of master a patch and kind of find themselves right back at the top. Yeah, and I mean, TFT is the kind of game where you can talk about, like, the champs have changed, the traits have changed, the balance has changed, etc. But deep down, if you understand the fundamentals of, like, what type of champion is looking for what type of stat and how to position and things like that, the learning curve isn't that steep once you've mastered that. And let's be real, all the way back to, you know, set 2, set 3, set 4, Sox was the master at those fundamentals. He really understood the game, he was doing tutorial videos, he was teaching people. So that's never been a problem, and I think that speaks to how much that, that knowledge can transfer. And Sox is a really smart guy, and so it's not that hard for him to pick up and keep going again. So it's great to see that he can perform really well and get right back into it. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point. I think a lot of people don't always quite give Sox the credit that he deserves. You know, it may feel like a long time ago, but there was a period of time, like you are mentioning, where Sox was basically the guy on North American Ladder who was consistently holding both rank one and rank two at the same time on two multiple accounts. This is this is the kind of guy who just gets the fundamentals of TFT. Now, Boop, there's a lot of different storylines we've talked about this weekend, but something that I keep coming back to is the study groups, right? And looking at this lobby you've got three people in the k3 study group you got setsuko Prestevin, and mr soju himself does it surprise you to see that much success coming out of these players not at all actually when you have like-minded individuals working towards the same kind of goal and you're able to kind of move egos away and really just help elevate each other i think the phrase is a rising tide lifts all ships right and i think we're seeing that right here and right now i would love for them to kind of start kind of branding themselves i'd, I'd buy a jersey of a study group i think like <laughs> give yourself a name or something like let's get going i think that'd be awesome that's right. Yeah, I'm here for it now. We have been told the game is ready. And so game number six, day for the Sharima Cup is here. Boop, Mort Dog, take cool. it away. All right, here we go. The Mort God is here. This is going to be our last lobby for the day, but it's going to be an amazing one as Robin wants to see some prizzies, Mort. <laughs> yeah, we have a Robin and Setsuko both in Jace's workshop. And that is what we're going to hit. I believe we hit Jace's workshop here. Out of position. Oh, no. It looks like we're going to go Targon. So uh, <laughs> due to his, where he was standing, it didn't quite trigger the right portal, it looks like. But we are going to be in Targon. So not triple prismatic, unfortunately. Not going to be as wild of a game. Instead, ending up in that Targon space. And so uh, we'll have to... What? That's a Vi2. Okay. Have a Vi2. Uh, <laughs> okay. What are the chances of that? Wow. You know, the really unfortunate thing about that is that, like, when you're going Piltover, you want to lose, and you don't really want the upgrade. Yep. So now we have the Vi2, who might be leading into a different type of uh, scenario. And we also, even if we choose to sell it, we uh, don't get to full max go because it's already combined. So uh, yeah. very interesting uh, position here as we're going to lean towards Piltover still, but have a very strong front line. Yeah, I think when you get something like this happening, especially with a frontliner like Vi, this is a win streak message, right? This is find a good backliner here. I personally would be selling the other two units trying to get the Viego 2 going so you at least have some damage. But you're going to need to ha try to win streak off of this. Because like you said, even if you get Piltover, it's going to be hard to sell this Vi. Now you have four Vi's. Uh, <laughs> you know, pretty wild here, but... Yeah, my expectation here is that, you know, you're not going to buy the other Vi. You're not going to chase that in this situation. Though the one thing to note for Chris is he has 29 points. He's near kind of the top here, so he's pretty likely to make it to the next lobby. But this is the point where, like, that doesn't matter as much. And right now, Setsuko is eight points ahead. 
If he wants any shot of winning, even though the way that the tournament structure works, he does need to go big. He needs to get a first place and catch up to Setsuko. Yeah, and so this is where we're going to see players potentially go uh, out really early because they've tanked in order to lose streak for as long as possible, but unable to get the win. Maybe we don't get the Piltover cash out because other players are starting to build stronger comps a little bit earlier so they can rubber band and slingshot into the late game with a lot more confidence. A lot can still go on as we get a silver augment. What do you think the players are feeling now that this is silver? Are they happy that it's not prismatic? What, are, what would you be feeling? I think Setsuko is really happy, right? Because this is going to be a lot less swingy and it's going to be a lot harder for something unpredictable to sway the tides of the fight pretty heavily. But I think everyone from Goobums down, Goobums, Re-Replay, Soju, Robin, Sox, was really looking for something that might give them that edge. In a Prismatic Lobby, you might get something really big that can play for a wild first, right? Uh, and so Chris is going to try to Pandora's Bench the Vi here. I don't know that I agree with this play. Um, this feels pretty risky to put that on the bench. Thankfully, he goes up against Setsuko, who is trying to play inconsistency uh, and might actually still win this fight here with some of these big Sorcerer procs. So it might not backfire, but, you know, maybe he gets lucky. If Perfect scenario here is this turns into a Swain, right? And then you've got your Sork comp going, uh, which could be good. But no, it does lose the fight, so it did kind of cost him here. And Again, going first or eighth play, I suppose. Trying to find something really strong here. The other thing that didn't help is his items really didn't match his comp. And so we see the roll here. Ends up with a Kled. That is not what he wants. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that was a little too reactive more, right? Like, we pretty much picked an augment for that Vi is kind of what it feels like at this point. And it was a little, maybe a little too reactive to the current moment rather than where we're going. Uh, that's definitely going to be one of those decisions that you can, I think, look back upon after this game is over and seeing what the result is. Because, again, if he ends up finishing really great, then we could say it was, it was a good move. If not, then we can kind of see where some of that power might have been left onto the table. Because, like you said, that Kled not as good uh, in terms terms of power level in the, what the Vi would bring to the table as that tier two unit. Super interesting. I think they kind of just felt like Vi was like that Piltover. We need a lose streak and it was better just to see what would happen outside of it and build towards that. Unfortunately, our next slot was not the right unit. If like you said, if it was a Swain, it'd be a t we'd be saying something completely different right now. Yeah, for sure. Now, the other thing to note is that this portal is the Targon Prime like we talked about. And so the first person to drop below 40 health will have to check in on. That's when you get sort of your, uh, you know, your stimmy, as we used to call it back in the day. And uh, we'll have to see what reward that is. Um, but that is going to give people the chance to sort of swing back. And so if you're one of those players that likes to play a Lost Street comp, that can be a great way to swing back in. Uh, we'll have to see if anyone got 2-1 Piltover. My guess is no from the looks of it and how things are going with the board strength. Uh, usually if you have a 2-1 Piltover, you're seeing a very low board strength. And right now only Soju with that 4 board strength, but still wind streaking off of it, which is fascinating. It goes to show no one's really gotten exactly the, the, the keys to the car that they want to drive so far. Uh, things are still getting uh, looked into and decided upon as we do get uh, one feast. I don't think it killed the unit, so no stacks just for that show. But let's see if this Samir is going to be able to at least take down one, maybe two extra units. It's Samira, Samira, Samira that time. Jinx, you own me a Coke. Asoji is going to take the loss. Nice. Looking at re-replay's board here, Jinx too early, which is really nice. Slams the Quicksilver early, though, which is not an item you would expect to see slammed this early in the game. It's a great item later, can be uh, up against other things, but already has the four Zon is the other thing worth calling out here. He has the Zon Heart, which is going to be great for allowing him to get access to that six Zon, which we've seen be pretty good at getting, you know, around a third or a second place even. So should be a good board for Riri Play, who again, right now sitting at 26 points. But the other thing is just, we have to keep talking about this, is that Setsuko is so far ahead right now at 37 points. Only Sub-Zero Arc in the other lobby at 35, and Casper at 33 really have a chance of catching up. So really, everyone else in this lobby has to play for big wins here. Mm -hmm. And maybe the strategy is making sure that certain people take the L's when they don't want to, right? Everyone knows that everyone's looking at Setsuko right now, and so that might affect some of the decision-making that some of these players might end up making. And maybe, hey, we're going up against Setsuko next. He's getting, oh, he's actually in seventh place. Maybe I invest a little bit of money and try to knock him out now when I've got the chance, because uh, sometimes you won't get another chance after that, a lot of 70T hex cash out. So we all, we are not in 
terms of gold in a very good spot when it comes to re replay, but we are on a streak, so we probably get to 10 after this round, uh, but we still have those Zons, and it looks like these Echoes are just kind of hanging out for it now. So the big thing to call out here with Re-Replay is that right now his Zon mods are the Chem Tank and the Virulent. And so the Chem Tank in particular, there's always that option with the Zon Heart here to go 6 Zon and play around that exploding Jarvan strategy where you play the Jarvan, uh, you get a Zon, although that normally requires a Zon emblem, so maybe not now that I think about that out loud. Uh, but otherwise, you know, might be some other options here to try to have that exploding front line. So we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, we saw we saw that exploding front line on uh, an Urgot, I think, yesterday, and it was insane when it came to the power level of that particular Zon comp. Once that unit died, the whole front line died with it of the opposing team, and everyone else just got to walk forward. We're still riding along with a re-replay right now. We're going to see a Quicksilver on this Jinx right now. Yeah, the Quicksilver Slam is fascinating to me because... Normally you wouldn't slam that, but he is wind streaking off of it, so maybe playing around that, maybe hoping for that Zeri in the end game to not necessarily get stuck. The other reason it could be advantageous, although it feels like it's signaling your hand a bit, is we have a lot of latent forges in the lobby, and latent forge can sometimes lead to eternal winter, and the gunners really struggle with that, and so having that quicksilver will present the prevent the eternal winter from doing any big work here. Uh, so maybe that's sort of what he's thinking right now. I mean, in the past, Quicksilver was what you put on your auto-attacking carries, right? Back in the day, yep. so they didn't get CC'd. I remember Sejuani ulting uh, the whole board at one point, but uh, when it comes to the, the the play at hand, things have changed a little bit. As we're going to go over to Sox, Beast Coast Sox. For some reason, I want to say because Sox every time I see that. But Sox is someone that we actually used as like the model TFT player for a really long time in the early sets. We kind of briefly touched on it in the early uh, part of this game and during the pregame uh, when it comes to this lobby. But he was kind of the the person we all looked into, the person that we copied, and one of his specific playstyles was he was really good at starting off with loose streaking and then coming right back, which is exactly what we're seeing right now. Yeah, so you can look at his board, and he's very clearly leaning towards that Kale. Again, he needs a first, and Kale is the kind of board that can be a first. It can also be a hard eighth, and we've seen a lot this tournament. It has not been a first. And so even if he ends up crashing out here, this is still probably the right flip play from his position in this tournament. I completely agree. We, I think we saw one Kale do okay, maybe off stream. I think it was Preston actually yesterday. Uh, a couple Ooh. of our Kale comms getting our tier three units without all three Yordles in play, having to wait one or two rounds. But you know, we still need to grab those Kales. Are we going to roll heavy on four? Those one cost units are more likely at this point in time. It's about how much we want to invest. And it doesn't look like we were able to pick up any extra Kales. So uh, we're going to have to wait a little bit longer, maybe through level five. Yeah, unfortunately, when you're rolling down and you hit this 40 mark, and what do you have? Four poppies, four kales, two maokais? The odds of you pulling it together are pretty low, so you're probably going to have to slow roll to try to turn this around. And again, if you look at this situation right now, you could bet money this is probably a 7th or 8th. This is not where you want to be with this kale comp to turn it into a 1st. But I think, again, knowing where Sox is in the standings at 23 points, this is absolutely the gamble he had to take. I think this was the correct play. It just didn't pay off, and sometimes that's how TFT is, right? You have to take these high-risk, high-reward plays. I think Last Stand is probably going to be the slam here. Yep, Last Stand definitely going to give him some options here to try to slow roll that and maybe make a crazy comeback. But just being so far off of these Kales from here, uh, if he hasn't hit it by, like, 3-7, you know, then we're probably just looking at, you know, the har one of the hardest eighths. And for this comp to really succeed, usually you want to hit by, like, 3-2. Yeah, we're already there. So unfortunately, this Kale is going to have to hang out for a little while longer. And the whole the hard part is if we're slow rolling through level five, we don't get the upgrade on the Kale, uh, and everything is just a little bit later. As we go over to my namesake, Chris TFT, fifth place right now, twenty nine points. Uh, you know, if you're not in that thirty point, even though you're still in fifth place right now, it might be okay trying to get to a higher position to try to touch where Setsuko is right now because of that lead. It kind of forces the whole lobby to take more risks yeah and the interesting thing is Setsuko has put himself in such a good position relative to everybody else because he's got such a lead he can play something relatively safe like these challengers while everybody else has to play these high risk high reward situations and let's say Sox manages to pull it off right and come back and make a first but a few of the other high risk players end up going eighth then what's going to happen is Setsuko gets a fourth 
and still keeps his lead going, right? The only really way Setsuko throws this tournament would be like a bunch of 7th and 8ths, and he just has to avoid that pretty easily, so it shouldn't be a big deal for him, I think. Yeah, and so in, if you were in the player seat, right, you're in fourth place right now, what are the types of things that you're thinking in terms, hey, how do I get how do I get there? We talked about Setsuko getting that lead, uh, but is there a way to, to chip away at it that you think that you can control more so than let the game kind of try to get to you? I think if you're in fourth place right now looking at the points, what you're doing is going, how do I get that mid-set invitational, right? Because again, it's top four that get that mid-set invitational, and so I think that's what you're looking at is just like, how do I just stay ahead of everybody else? And again, from fourth place right now, I think you're playing something relatively safe. Like I said, I like the challengers. I, I think you're also accelerated in the lobby a bit. You're maybe leveling uh, you know, a little early, so level seven at three, five, kind of push that advantage, play tempo a little bit. Uh, hopefully slamming items quick and trying to, even something like a six from that position is not necessarily the worst case. Uh, so, you know, trying to play around that. Yeah, and so uh, that was just a simple DC that we're seeing. So once we get that player back, we're going to start once again. But before we do, let's actually talk about how, like, a situation like this. Hey, you know, we're starting the game. We're a little bit close. To, uh, we're probably in the mid-game at this point in time, and there's a pause, right? So how does that going to affect some of these players, do you think? Yeah, for a lot of them, it can really mess up your head, right? Like, uh, we see this all the time in, like, even League, for example, right? Where that pause, everyone's just kind of in this awkward anticipation mode where it's like, okay, here's what I was thinking. How do I not lose my train of thought? Uh, because time is a valuable resource in TFT. You only have so yeah. much time to roll down, position, things like that. And every second you lose sort of recalibrating yourself can really throw you off. And so thankfully, not that long of a pause here. So hopefully not a big impact. Uh, and hopefully they can get right back into it. All right, we got a Sork Spat on this board, and it's Goo Bums, which, again, in terms of games that I've watched on a personal level, the thing that I enjoyed watching a lot was Goo Bums Sork Comp yesterday. Had Infusion, which is, like, exactly what you want when it comes to uh, the mana generation for these Sorks. But something I've noticed with this comp is that Spat moves around really frequently based on who needs it right now and how we're going to be able to go. But the Sork Comp is good against a lot of these comps that have back lines because uh, because of the re you're going to be able to have access to those units is there anything else about this sword comp that makes it particularly oh, like pretty good in this particular meta against the samiras for example yeah i mean so the thing with the sword comp is it's actually it's not a sustained comp right it's a lot like challenger where it's about bursting down your opponents and so you're going to want as much damage as you can get and so that's going to be the thing here, looking at these items, right? You have the Ionic Spark, you have the Shoujun, which is good, but now you're going to be looking for things like that Jeweled Gauntlet to really burst it down. Other thing to call out here is we had four players take Latent Forge. That's a going to proc next turn. So four people are about to get a Power Spike here. Robin Song, Soji, Sox, and Precedent are all about to get their Orn Artifact. Uh, and so now that will allow them to catch up. Uh, Sox in particular, 30 health. Maybe looking for a strong item here, but we look at Sox's board here and we still see a Kale 2, Maokai 2, Poppy 2. Uh, this is not what you want to see here for him, unfortunately. Yeah, if you, not on time uh, when it comes to that Kale, unfortunately. It seems like Kale in a lot of iterations of TFD. If you just don't get it early enough, you're going to get 6th, 7th, or 8th. And right now it is a potential for Sox, but again, the roles can be in the favor. The Mort God can speak upon him, right, and give him those Kales. Uh, if, if that is the case, we could see the fortunes change. But we're going to go back over to K3 Soju, uh, the, the artist formerly known as K3 Soju, now known as K3 Soji. And looking at this board, this is exactly what, you know, a lot of people wanted to start out with. Even though there's still just one cost units in the back lane, one of them is very important, and that is the Zeri. And we got pretty good items on her now, too. Yeah, it's pretty interesting here. He got the Zarian, so he pivoted into that based on what he hit. Um, you know, definitely one of the S-tier carries if you can get it put together. Also found the uh, the Hullbreaker item, the Orn item here, that's giving a bunch of armor, MR, and health for the person standing alone here. I think some people might have been tempted to take the Collector as it works really well on the Zeri, but I agree with getting that extra frontline going here, and that may have been the difference here on that win. Plus, that item will be really good later on someone like an Urgot if you can find that. And so this might turn into a pretty stereotypical Zon Zeri comp here. But as we know, that's also one of the more contested comps here. And so finally getting a look at Sox right now, who there's, hey. there's the Kale, but we still have the Maokai and the Poppy to go. And looking at this, we're at six and six. He's got the great items here, the Slayer Emblem. He's going to go full 10 loss streak here, uh, which is pretty risky, but 
again, he's got that last stand. So I think this is going to be really interesting to watch, right? He's going to yeah. go to the PvE round, level up. He's got that champ duplicator, which always feels unfortunate to use on a one cost. Uh, but if he can get it all put together and then level up to six, get that poppy four, kale three, maybe. The kale items are great. Double Ginsu's plus the Radiant is not terrible. And again, last stand may save him. You just really want to get it all going before you proc last stand, just so you have one little bit of health here. So he is not in the worst position, but it is looking really scary. And like I said, 3-7 is where it has to all come together. So I really want to watch this. All right, we're going to stick on to Sox. Hopefully he's not missing one. All right, let's see. Are we going to hit these units? We're already at over 50 gold, so we're going to roll down a little bit for sure. Get the poppy. Get another poppy. This is feeling good. Get the third poppy. So now we just need the Maokais now. They didn't show up as easily as the poppies have, but slowly but surely, this is looking like it's starting to solidify. We did win that last round, which I don't know if Sox is going to be happy about because we could have come into this with a big interest on that lost streak, but we're going to save a little bit of HP instead, give us potentially one extra life if we do lose upcoming. We also have a dupe, so if things look really, really, really bad, we could potentially use that earlier on, but we want to roll with this Maokai. Are we going to be able to? Yeah, and this is the big thing here is, again, we need two Maokais and the Duplicator. There's some Teemos that I don't really think he needs to be holding. He is going to hold them. Uh, and you also need enough gold to level up here. There's one Maokai. needs one more here. It's getting close because, again, the gold count is a little bit of a trick here. Just needs one more. Oh it's not goodness. looking good. Oh, no. Runs out, unfortunately. And so this is going to be a loss. The one nice thing about winning that round before is it is going to preserve a little bit of health. Uh, so, But he really does not want to proc the last stand. I can't stress that enough. But the other thing is that Kale is not level 6. The way Kale works is that she powers up at level 6, gaining an extra part of her ability, and then again at level 9. And so unfortunately, by not being level 6, this Kale is much weaker here. Takes damage, has not proc'd the last stand yet, uh, but still needs that one more Maokai here. And looking at these items, these aren't really anything amazing here. You could play the healing orbs, but you don't have that many units. It's probably just job well done or social distancing. Portable Forge gives him an out possibly here. Um, decides to go with the social distancing. And so now again, we have oh, to no. hit the Maokai this turn oh, here. And it's no. there it is. Oh, okay. He's got to duplicate it. Yep, sure enough. You spend the exact 12 gold to level here. Uh, that's going to give you the poppy. So we're good to go here. We've got the comp. Uh, Poppy 4, Kale 3, Kale is now level 6. Hasn't proc last stand, so he has one life. Now the challenge, though, is that he's level 6, 0 gold, right? And so, again, when we talk about this comp capping out, the way it usually caps out is it hits level 8. It finds, like, 5 Slayer so that the Kale does even more damage and heals up, and we're a long way off of that. Crazier things have happened more when it comes to TFT. It's not an impossibility, but it doesn't seem like a big possibility right now when it comes to getting through uh, into the finality of these comps. But yeah, we already see the huge power spike so far, and that's why you would even use you know the regular champion duplicator, not even the lesser champion duplicator on the Maokai, because look at the difference already. We finally reversed our fortune. We haven't triggered last stand, and every round that we don't trigger last stand is an extra round that you know we're going to be able to maintain and gather resources for when we do finally trigger it. But we also have now Soju in 7th place, Goo Bums in 6th, and Setsuko in 5th. And like you said, if I was Setsuko, I'd probably play a top 4 comp here uh, and kind of just push and play as clean as possible, maybe not going for the win, but definitely going for the top 4. And with this EHP totals being so close, that's not a solid thing for anyone just yet. Yeah, we're in an interesting situation because Soju and Setsuko are basically playing the exact same comp. They're both playing around Zeri. They both have long distance pals, uh, and so they're playing that. But Soju now is level 8, has the duplicator, so if he can find one more Zeri, we'll be in a lot better spot. Because again, long distance pals shares those stats between the units. Uh, you can see here, is going to manage to get the win. Oh, not quite. Um, but Setsuko, on the other hand, you know, still level 7, has that 30 gold, but hasn't hit either. We get a good look at their boards here. And yeah, you can see Setsuko still running that 1-star Zeri as well. Playing more the Freljord version, though, instead. And so we'll have to see who can turn it into. But what we really want to avoid seeing is Setsuko go out in, like, 7th or 8th. Also worth noting, Sox did just lose that last round. 
that proc's last stand. But again, this is what I was talking about, where when you hit so late, everybody else is starting to spike, and Kale has just fallen off too much at this point. And so I'm worried that, again, Sox took the right risk. It was the right idea. It just didn't pay off. Yep. And, this, and I hope that doesn't make other people take, you know, I think a lot of TFT players, because of the game is what it is, are super risk averse, right? But sometimes you do have to make those decisions. We are going to get an extra unit on the board, though, with those two spats. We also have a dupe here. Uh, if we do get another Ari that could potentially go on her, we're getting five cost units in the pack. Let's see where this is going to end up. This Froyord comp has popped up time and time again with the Zeri. If you're not playing the Piltover version, it's probably this one. Is this going to be enough, though, for uh, for Soju at 26 HP? Yeah, you can see he's kind of struggling a little bit with that transition. You know he's looking for that Sejuani. Wasn't able to find it. He's got the duplicator, but didn't use it. So if uh, if Sox is going to win any rounds, this feels like it's going to be it, while Soju is mid-transition. Uh, and so, yeah, sure enough, I think the Kale will be okay here. You know, up against a bunch of one-star units, nothing fully upgraded. Uh, but even this doesn't look like a big, big dominating win that you would hope with somebody who has last stand proc, you know? Uh, yeah. And so Soju right now kind of in between a lot of key decisions here, right? Does he duplicate the Zeri? Uh, so thankfully he didn't, and so it pays off here. Um, but now he's going to be able to star that up, which is great. Uh, and then what does he use the duplicator on, right? You've got four Gunner, which has not been the best version of Zeri we've seen. Is still missing that Sejuani. Uh, has the Deathblade still on the bench, which right now he probably wants to become something like Shojin for the Senna or something like that. But the front line is still all one-star units, and so not the best front line for Soju, unfortunately. Okay, some, you know, sometimes you do sneak some rounds and maybe just a couple extra rounds would change what we say about Soju, but we're going to be coming through with this sword comp, so this is going to potentially get some access with that Kale, depending on where Sona is going to ult. The Lux is just Lux 1 right now as well. It doesn't seem like a lot of the damage is going on to the Poppy just yet. Once that Poppy goes, the Kale will most likely do the same, but that Poppy stays alive. We get another round with Sox. Really curious to see where this Kale will end up up because we haven't seen it outside of eighth place on stream but we did kind of i think p god um finished around fifth or fourth uh when he played it yesterday so we'll see if we could do better i mean we'd still need a lot of work to do but 40 gold's pretty nice to have right now yeah for sure and again big stories to watch here setsuko really just kind of needs to avoid going you know six seven eight here uh, so hopefully he can pull his comp together, but still looking at level 7. Has 53 gold though, so should be fine. Looking at the board strength right now, Soju feels like he's the furthest with that 57. Um, but again, we're seeing a lot of Zeri play in this lobby right now. A lot of people, you know, knowing that that is that S tier comp right now, trying to make that go. And so you can see all the gold draining from the right side across the UI <laughs> here. Uh, only press event with 53 gold. Everybody else, Setsuko took that 50. Now down to zero. Is going to hit his Urgot level two. Re-replay hits that Sejuani two. So some big spikes there. And again, all of these big spikes are the Shell thing that's going to scare three. Sox. But here's an Echo three, which is fascinating. You do not see a lot of Echo three. But remember, we talked about how Re-replay had the explosion, I believe. And so this Echo three might cause a big explosion later. All right, let's see. Is the big explosion going to be big enough? Boom. Oh my goodness. <laughs> It's like we were watching Dr. Pimple Popper or something just then. <laughs> Absolutely destroyed. It's one of those times where you're like, hey, I want you to die. I'm so sorry, but you need to die. That's how we're going to win. And on the other side, yeah, I was mentioning uh, Goobums has a Velkaz 3. That is the la first time that we've seen anyone invest that fully into the Velkaz, because usually with Sorks, it's the Sona. Uh, but we're going to move on over to Prest Event now, as we're going to be rolling some of these units. We're playing that Noxus. The study group likes this comp, right? Uh, we yep. get the Gwen, who we've kind of been talking about has been, I think, a little underestimated in a lot of these comps so far. Walking into the backline a la Darius, but we do want that Darius 3 eventually. We have the duplicator to help us out. We gotta get there, though. We still need three more. Yeah, the other thing to note here is he's got some health to work with for this transition, but all those items on the bench right now is not necessarily what it, where you want to be. You see him coming in here, but this Noxus Gwen looking pretty decent here. Really hoping to find that Darius 3. He's got the duplicator, so he's only two off uh, and does manage to win the fight. 
but you know other than that socks being able to level up find another slayer this is what i was talking about right if you can cap out that kale comp with another you know four or five slayer that's when it can get really deadly in the late game and so he is level seven now 14 gold a long way off of getting level eight and certainly nowhere near nine but maybe he can turn this into a few wins and overall, if you look at the lobby health right now, you know, 48 all the way down to 1, but it's looking pretty close across the board here. Yeah, I mean, we haven't had an elimination, and we're in Stage 5. We've had a couple lobbies where we've had, a, like, elimination or two before chicken. So, in terms of tempo, this whole lobby a little bit oh. slower until we see something like this Echo 3. This might be it for the Kale. Uh, once that Echo does fall, though, but maybe the way the cookie crumbles, it's going to be able to get through a lot more after that. Ooh. Are we going to be able to survive? Yes, they will, just nope. for a little while, but that is not going to be enough matchup diff, in my opinion. Unfortunately, that Echo was just too much. Sox swung for the fences, but unfortunately struck out instead. Yeah, that's a really hard matchup, unfortunately, and so without a ton of healing, he even had good itemization against it, but an Echo 3 in particular, because that Hextech Explosion is based off the health of the unit, which is why Warmog's Jarvan is such a popular version. So the fact that he was able to get an Echo 3 with it means we are getting a big explosion every time that thing dies, and so that is going to be really scary across the lobby. Might even be the favorite to win with just how powerful that can get, since he has that strong backup Zeri behind it. Uh, we're going to have to see here, but Robin Songs right now also needed a big finish, kind of on the way down on a three loss streak with 12 health. But otherwise, at the bottom, we've got Setsuko, Soji, and Goobums all winning their round. And again, it's looking really close across the board here. Yet yeah, re-replay having just a two-round two, two round or one really bad round lead at this point. We might be going into stage six with uh, up to six people, depending on how the... Is, uh, matchups go and so uh, now that we're going into the, the late game with so many people a lot of people who might be waiting for units are going to be waiting a little longer usually at this time a couple of the noxus players have fallen and so the dariuses will get to that uh tier three status but we're gonna have to wait a little bit longer for that yeah like you said it's gonna be pretty close here and i think press a little struggling with uh trying to hit that darius three and everything like that and targon rise we see targon rise lift that darius out and off the field for the victory here. We're seeing the Noxus Gwen do some good work. Uh, Goobum's taking a bit of damage, but not knocked out. And again, Chris now dropping down. Goobum's dropping down. And now all of a sudden, 33 to 6 health across the board. This is going to be a wild round, and a lot of it's going to come down to who do you match up against? Is it someone you're strong against? Is it someone you're weak against? Right now in the lobby, we look at the board value, though. Look at the board values. Re-replay 86, Soju 81. Those were looking like the strongest, and Soju on that five-round win streak seeming very powerful here. Uh, and so Chris, unfortunately, has to use his duplicator on the Scion, never hit the Darius, and ends up against Re-Replay with that massive explosion echo. This could be the end of Chris, unfortunately. Which would l precedent would love because all of those units would just go into his board eventually. So, precedent, if you're a precedent fan, you are rooting against this Noxus player. Let's see if that's going to get him across the finish line, though. And there is the explosion. It was off to the side, but off of the convergence, you go, Chris. We're gonna maybe see you on the next one. Fifth place might not have been enough of a cushion in order to make it into that final lobby. We shall see, but it's not looking good for Robin either, unfortunately. Prest event with 3 HP now and 23 gold gets to use all of those Dariuses and Cats that were put back in the pool because of Chris. So this next round for Prest event is the most important one potentially of his tournament life right now, sitting in fourth place. One of the ones in striking distance of Setsuko. And so if we finish ahead of Setsuko, those are points that we're going to make up no matter what. So Preston really looking for that placement ahead of Setsuko, wherever that is. Yeah, this is a this is a big deal. The fact that Setsuko is looking very likely to be top four from this position here might just mean he goes in really, really strong here, right? Preston does manage to three-star everything, which is really big. Um, but, you know, looking at the tournament overall, it's really going to come down to how Sub-Zero Arc is doing in the other lobby. That's really going to be the differentiating factor here. Uh, Precedent was the next one with 30 points here. So Precedent really needs to convert this into at least like a third or a second. Has all the pieces to do it. Uh, it's just, again, these matchups, right? Everyone in the lobby is very strong at this point. 
Yeah, no one really wants to see the Echo at this point either. Prestavit has been able to avoid it thus far. Eventually, you are going to see it, and maybe uh, it's going to be the end of your tournament when you do. How do you deal with it, though, when you know that Echo is there, but it's always going to attach to it because of that ult? How, is there a way to bait it? Is there What is the counterplay there, Mort? Uh, I mean, there isn't really a ton when someone gets it that much online. A Lucky Cassante, which this board isn't going to be running. Uh, a bunch of Dragon Claws and some healing. The one thing is that Darius might not die to it uh, and then can heal up through it. That's the one thing he might have going for it, as long as there's no anti-heal against it. Uh, and so Setsuko did lose this round, by the way. He's down to five health. If Setsuko loses again, that could open up a gap here because a fifth place is definitely not what Setsuko wants going in here. We look at this board here playing around a Felios, which I don't think he was really looking to do, uh, you know, kind of playing what he wanted here. He did hit level nine, which is a positive here, but up against that Echo, this is definitely one of the harder matchups here. And we're gonna have to see how the health plays out. Oh no, the explosion hasn't even happened yet, and the front line's already kind of gone down. And there it is, and is Setsuko going to be able to actually take this? Is Aphilios going to be doing enough damage against the Urgot? Oh. Edge of Night. Oh, we are going to be able to... Oh, this is going to be very, very close. Another oh ult from God. the Urgot. Is this going to be enough? <laughs> no. He left. He won. Before. He won. won. He won. It did a little quick scout right at the end, just in wow. case. And now we're here in the top four. Goo Bums falling in fifth place. Yeah, I'm not sure if you'd call that the power of Urgot or the weakness of Aphelios, but uh, <laughs> definitely got a little close there. Uh, but thankfully managed to barely pull out the win there, and that's what he needed. It gives him the top four. Hopefully he can get an easier matchup here. But right now, Soju, we get a look at his board, and he's got that four gunner here with the Senna 2. Uh, and the nice thing here is he's using the Orn item to get a bunch of extra stats to feed to the Zeri with long distance pals. And so that's leaving him in a really strong situation here where that Zeri just has so many bonus stats from the Death Blade and the Orn item. And so we'll have to see how this fight plays out. We see the Darius on the other side dunking away pretty freely here. Probably the end of Setsuko here. I don't think Aphelios can beat a Darius 3, unfortunately. Uh, and on the other side, looks like Soju is going to lose this fight finally, ending his big win streak. All right, so, though, a lot of people, I, we, we haven't seen how Sub-Zero or Casper are doing in the next lobby. We will get to that after this one, but now everyone finishing ahead of Setsuko in both lobbies, so anyone finishing from third, second, and first are now going to be making up that point differential. So, for example, if Prestavit ends up winning this lobby, he's going to be much closer to Setsuko because Setsuko is unable to get those points. But that's okay. I think if Setsuko fourth is fine. It keeps him in um, yeah. striking distance, right? right? If, you're, if you're looking at a King Cobra right now, like, you're you're, you're, he's ready to strike in this next lobby, and honestly, he's probably set himself up to do just that. But this is now when the other players need to take advantage of the fact that he did get fourth. This feels like one of those Soju special moments where he leveled up to nine to throw in a rise one. It was almost nothing. I'm not sure how much value he got out of that. But again, his board's pretty strong here. The one thing I worry about is if he goes up against Precedent, can he deal with that Darius three? That's, I think, going to be the hard matchup here. And so watch the Darius 3 and how it relates to the Jarvan. The Jarvan leaves. Oh, the Darius yeah. goes right to the back line. Now, the oh. good news is it's going away from the Zeri. <laughs> so there, he is getting some benefit here. Darius is continuing to go on, though, onto the Senna. And so, Darius, where did you go, my friend? But the Gwen <laughs> also cleans up. And that is going to do it for Soju. And Precedent here. This, again, Precedent was the one with 30 points, the best shot of trying to take down Setsuko. This is great for keeping it really competitive as we go into the final game. Yep, so far has made up at least a point on that differential. Are we going to be able to get that second one uh, made up? Maybe if the Darius does the same thing, we might not get bailed out uh, like we did last time. All he needed to do was look the other direction, but instead he wanted to get everyone else out first and let the rest of the team take Zeri out. But this could... This is going to be it at single digit HP for both players. This is going to be our last round, folks, and we're going to know who our top eight is very, very soon. Let's see if Re Replay or Prestman is going to win this round. My eyes are on that Darius and those ultimates. There's one. Are we going to get a second one? No, we get CC'd instead, and we have Mana Reeve on us as well. Didn't get the kill on that one, but we're still trying to go 
and jam out when it comes to that space jam comp with this Darius. We are going to slice and dice, but is it going to be enough against this Urgot? Is this Deja Fu? It was the Aphilios before, and now it is going to be the Urgot. Urgot 2 versus Darius 3. When is this ult going to go through? And it finally does, and re-replay will go down, and it's going to be Setsuko with that Darius getting that first place, and it's going to be a really, really big deal, Mort, because all of those points are going to be made up against Setsuko, and he was in one of those positions where he could potentially have caught up. Yeah, I think for Setsuko, press event winning this lobby was kind of worst case scenario. Uh, that's going to close that gap, and I believe it'll be 38 to 42. So now it's definitely within striking distance, and so with that big lead, we're going to have to see how the other lobby went with Sub-Zero Arc and Casper. They were the other two really in the running, uh, and if they did well, we'll have to see. So... Awesome. Well, folks, we have something really exciting. We have some special guests coming up for you. Someone I think you're going to like and a couple familiar faces as well. So why don't you take it away? Hello. Thank you, Mort and Boop, for giving us a little show through game number six. But now I got the two kings of the couch. It's Bryce, Esports Law, and Frodan. I know you two got to watch what the up? other Lobby, Lobby B, in that previous game. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, you know, set the, set the stage for us. What were you looking for going into that game, and, and what did we see? Well, when we eventually did get to load into the game, gameplay, <laughs> we saw some pretty good action. A lot of the narrative that we've been following is actually the journey of Sub-Zero Arc. He's actually been a pretty big underdog, and also not just in terms of his name recognition, but playing Caitlyn as his main legend of choice and executing a lot of good strategy. So we watched him, but he narrowly missed out on a top four. Instead, it was another potential challenger to the throne, Casper Wu, who nailed another top two. Also want to give a big shout out to Connor as me. He's playing Ezreal, Bryce, which is a pretty unusual strategy. Not a lot of people are picking Ezreals and using buried treasures or the big grab bag to get a lot of tempo, and he executed it very well. So a lot of cool action that y'all missed in Lobby B. Bryce, I do want to throw something to you now. Casper is a player, I know I've spoken to you about this player, this is someone who's been around the block, he's competed in tournaments, has really struggled to kind of convert on those top placements though, right? He's someone who tends to kind of fall in that middle of the pack. Does it surprise you to kind of see him finally getting that showing in this top finish? So, it, I, I can't say it surprises me. We always knew Casper had the potential. His ladder stats were there. He's played in a ton of tournaments and he's always had that capability. He's never been quite able to get over the hump as a player, so I'm excited to see it happening. But it, yeah, I wouldn't say it's a surprise. All right, guys, now we do have, the listen, the floor is yours. We got a little bit of time. We've got about a minute before we do want to go to a quick break. So, Frodan, Bryce, I want to just give you the floor. Any final thoughts before we go into the final game of the day? Oh, Precedent. That's a captain of my fantasy team, man. I drafted Precedent first time, and I was so proud. Everyone was like, really, man, Precedent? Like, isn't he better last cup? You know, he's supposed to, like, you know, set 13 winner of world championship. I knew he was in good form, and I know that a lot of people are hyping up Setsuko, and rightfully so, all these other underdogs. But this guy gets memed on, and he's, and you know, every time, every meme that gets posted of him, every time someone makes fun of him in chat, every single, like, flame that he gets on Twitter from Nantom, just makes this guy stronger. He, he actually just doubles down on his work ethic every single time people doubt him. So I am so proud of him, and I really hope that he can somehow make a crazy comeback and win a cup. That would be such a great story for him and all of North America. And my fans. All right. Well, with that, good luck to Preston. Good luck to Dan as you try to close out this fantasy draft. Now, I'm going to bring back Mort and Boop because it's time now to take a look at the overall standings. Boop. More you two got to see that game. I, I will say I actually did get to catch a little bit more of Lobby B than Lobby A, but I will say before we go to these standings, Boop, Preston, make a statement coming out on top. How are you feeling about that? I'm feeling pretty good, just like Dan. I actually came in with uh, some pretty high praise when it comes to Preston. It's like, uh, it feels like with a certain amount of players, it's just a matter of time, right? And I think Preston has, has, if you look at his career, has consistently gotten better, right? As, as time has gone on. And so what used to be a meme about world champion, as we keep going, even today, you know, those types of things might stop becoming mean and become reality, right? So instead of joking around about things, we have to take this player seriously because underestimating him is going to be the reason why you lose 
And on the other side, we did see Connor Gizmi, like Bryce and Dan said, coming out with that Ezreal finding another first place finish. Now, as we move on to the overall standing, this is the most exciting part. As we determine who the top eight is, who's going to be playing in the final lobby of the day. And it looks like Malala is the player that is just on the outside along K3 Soju. Now, Boop, I know you two were talking about it. Soju just putting up a good fight but barely coming up short going into the final lobby yeah i think like it's just how the cookie crumbles sometimes right uh, there are so many games that we play and you i don't think can attach a certain individual mistake one time across all of these lobbies as to why we didn't quite make it i mean we we're one point in a tie break away right that is a single decision potentially that's different in every lobby that we played that could make a difference but i do i love that soju participates in these i think he he's a stalwart in the community and what he brings to tft is an incredible Incredibly, is incredibly valuable and watching him play and compete is always a great time I'm just really happy that he's here and able to do uh, exactly uh, exactly what I just said is participate it wasn't that great right now he's usually really good at LCQ of any of the tournaments that Soju like can be expected to win he's really good at the last chance qualifier but unfortunately today was not uh, the day we were just one point off now more it's time to celebrate these top eight players who are going to be competing in this final lobby i know that when i look at this list there's a couple different names that do stand out re replay wish iverson sub-zero arc definitely one of the main characters of this broadcast today but i, I want to hear from you what's a player that who, who is a player that you see on this list that you feel is really interesting i mean i think they're all interesting right we've talked about sub-zero arc with his legend choice um, press event kind of prove himself, re replay showing that he's not, you know, a one set one trick, Wage and Iverson as well. Um, but for me, I think playstyle wise, Setsuko coming in with the Earth and coming in and playing so many a variety of comps. He's been playing that Sorcerer comp, he played Teemo reroll. I think that's been exciting. And for me, the other big thing here is like you see that gap between press event and Connor as me. And the way this tournament works is the top four get that pass to the mid set invitational. And so right now, those four players, Setsuko, Casper, Sub-Zero, and Precedent, are all just kind of playing to have a strong performance. They only need the top four to guarantee that victory. Uh, and so I think that's going to be a really interesting game to watch and see how they optimize to make sure they get that top four. I think it's especially important that we call out players like Re Replay who did not make it to the second weekend of the Frail Yard Cup, right? Got day one. So probably does not have enough qualifier points, if I had to guess, to make it to the mid tip finale on that alone. So absolutely agree with you, Mort. With a gap that big, it would not surprise me to see someone like Re Replay make a jump and do something a little bit more exciting to try and make it into that top four. Now, boop. More dog, thank you so much for joining us on the broadcast. We do have one more game, but we will have Cass and Crowen on. Now, I want to open up the floor. Boop, more dog, any final thoughts before you go? I think. The story of Sub-Zero Arc today is really awesome. I love when a new player is going to be able to make a name for themselves. So after this tournament, we still talk about them. But it's also very evident that a lot of the vets with their experience on a day four did really, really well. And that is why a significant amount of them were able to make it to the top 16. So experience is really good. We get to see that. We get to see some new people develop experience and see where that's going to go. And then we're going to get a champion at the end. And I'm excited to see who that is. And I just want to say thank you for having me on here. It's always fun to cast these and be a part of the community. And on behalf of the entire development team, for everyone who participates in these, runs these tournaments, and watches these tournaments, thank you from the bottom of our heart. TFT wouldn't be the same without all of you. And I can't wait to watch this last game. So let's do it. All right, going to be a fun time. Now we have game number seven, the final game of the Shreema Cup, coming up in just a few minutes. So don't go anywhere, and we'll see you in a few.
Hello everybody and welcome back to the seventh and final game of day for the Sharima Cup. I am Gangly, your host, joined back with Casanova and Crow. And now, Cass, we have the final game going on in just a few minutes. And the thing that's interesting about these cups is players are not just playing for first, right? Because the top four get that automatic invitation straight to the mid-set finale. So going into this final game, who do you have your eyes on? Well, I mean, for me, uh, you heard Rodan and Bryce talking about him too. I've been talking about him all day. I won't shut up about him, in fact. I know I probably should, but Sub-Zero Arc. Uh, you know, my resident Caitlyn player is still hanging out in a very good spot. He's currently in third place with 39 points. And he is kind of the only player here who needs the top four in order to make mid-set because he did not have a placement. He has no qualifier points from the Freljord Cup. So he absolutely has to make this top four happen. And he's positioned himself very well to do so. Now, Crowen, I think it's worth pointing out that as of right now, Setsuko is the player sitting in first, has the potential to join in with that very elite few who have won multiple events in North America, and to have done it in such a short stint of time would be even more impressive, but he's not up there alone. Casper Wu, Sub-Zero Arc as well, and Prestivant all sitting in the top four and have the opportunity to catch Setsuko in this final game. Which of those players really stands out to you? Yeah, actually, uh, Kasparu, who you mentioned earlier, Kasparu actually has more points technically on the day than Setsuko, but Setsuko's coming in with three bonus points, which does give him the edge. But Kasparu has had a fantastic day, and I think if he continues, could definitely be, um, I, I don't want to say upsetting Setsuko, but a little bit of, of upsetting. I think a lot of expectations are going to be on him. Now, the top four gap just in general is kind of crazy. It's like four points up until the bottom four. But still, if any one of those top four have a poor placement, it just opens up a whole world of anyone else sneaking in. There's prize money on the line. There's qualifier points. So many things kind of happening right now. That is going to be a really, really intense game no matter what happens. 
All right, well, Crowen Casanova, with that said, it does look like the seventh and final game is ready, so I will leave this to you. All right, thank you so much, Gangly. We're jumping in, Crowen. Final game of the day, final game of the tournament, where we get to crown a winner of Sharima Cup and send some players to mid set. But Thresh's Sanctum, Targon Prime, Aaron Mount are going to be our options. And we've got people on all three, but it seems like Thresh's Sanctum is the one they want. Sub Zero, oh, Aaron though. Mount. We'll get Aaron Boys. Mountain. This one is very good for Caitlyn because you're going to have a lot more options to itemize whatever uh, two stars you get with Stars are Born. It's actually really nice for the yeah. win streak play style you're trying to play. I know we were talking about off broadcast a lot of about Sub Zero not liking slamming early items, right? We need to keep them, or wants to keep them very open. So that's actually interesting that he's going to be the one to choose that out. Maybe he wants to find that direction more early, open slam more items to commit to a line. Because as soon as Sub Zero has a line in mind, boom, he commits for it, slams the items. Um, he likes things like challengers, but he's also open to Noxus, Azir Lux. He's played Invokers, he played to a first place. Same with Six Shadow Isles. So he's played a bunch of different compositions. Um, and it's really interesting to see how he's going to pilot that with not typically slamming those items early. Yeah, and meanwhile, we're taking a look at Satsuko. He finds a Samira early and gets a Katarina orb. So Noxus, definitely something open to him. On Aaron Mount, it's really nice to be able to slam your Noxus items immediately. Put yourself in a very good position for that. Yeah, definitely. See a glove coming through from the creep rounds. Not going to be hopping any components yet. Just going to wait until see what happens on 2-1. Augment choices might be throwing a bit of wrench in players' plans as well. Taking a look at Sub-Zero Arc. The Caitlyn player has not pivoted at all. Has two pilt Ooh. over on the bench as well. And I think you mentioned Cas Sub-Zero Arc has played the pilt over and has had success with it, even if it's not going to be his maybe first choice. He had a great Piltover game uh, yesterday, did get a first, and I think considering his spot, if he wants to play for first place here, this is something he should stay open to, and it looks like he might. I mean, generally the option here would be lock pre-level, a lock or pre-level, but he's not going to do either. Oh, yes, oh, he, is. he is. Goes out of Sells Piltover. Out Piltover. In Interesting. A just playing around Stars Are Born, and he does here get rewarded by finding it. Yeah. Noxus Crest, not going to be the pickup there. Ooh, it was a Darius in the great. shop, though. And these, yeah, this shop for a Kalen player it, it, it is pretty bad, isn't it, Kaz? Yeah, it's pretty rough. You do kind of want your two costs to be a frontliner, your one cost to be a carry. And uh, getting, you know, both an Ash and a Talia as the options are not super favorable. It does seem like he already knows what items he wants, though, as we see him just kind of ripping through these on Aaron Mount. Uh, I'm, I know he favors JG uh, very heavily and likes to kind of do that JG uh, and uh, as well as the uh, Spirit of Shojin slam early. So maybe that's kind of the consideration with these items. Yeah, not buying anything in these uh, in the shop does feel kind of bad. He can sell Orianna to 10, can start to itemize Karma, three Ionia online, two Invoker is going to net a little bit of power. And I think just like you're mentioning, Cass, yeah, the Shojin Slam and the JG comes through. These are flexible items that can go in the Sorx line, the Azir Lux line, or even the Challengers line and find their way onto a Kaisa. So it's still relatively flexible between those three different options. Yep, there it is. And just gonna lose but it's a good loss to start things out and you know he's he's definitely okay to lose the first round and then potentially streak the rest of the stage if he finds something good but these shops are pretty terrible i mean we'll see when he finally gets Oof. to uh utilize the stars <laughs> are born but this is a definitely a rough start for caitlin yeah uh if these games do happen occasionally they feel pretty low roll and um just trying to find your way out of it is important but at least you get the gold from stars are born that helps you yeah kind of bail it out a little bit since your economy still gets to be good Exactly. I was going to say he was not playing down an augment, right? Like we kind of might see. It's like, oh, there's no value out of getting the, the two stars. But still, that gold to generate the econ immediately is really, really huge in the early game. So I'm actually not super worried for a sub zero arc right now, even if it is a kind of low roll Caitlyn stars are born spot. But now let's take a look at precedent. It is the Noxus with the Trickster's Glass. Not on Samira yet, though. It is just going to be on a Cassiopeia. Um, but a lot of items in precedent is not willing to slam any of them right now. Yeah, it feels rough to be on Aaron Mount and not be slamming but i guess if you're committing to loss streak it works out and precedent being able to loss streak uh, another really great loss here hasn't lost that much hp overall he's at 94 with a two loss uh that's got to be pretty solid for precedent we'll see when he can slam those items a bit later uh if he maybe finds the samira and he wants to start win streaking he can do that but once again no two cost in this shop uh for sub zero i know i like the observers <laughs> keep giving us just, just a yeah chance to no see it's good if if he's going to be able to find something to play, the Malahar is kind of, you know, like the quote unquote high roll 
uh one cost it's one of the the options that you really like to hit with stars are born so uh, at least he finds that but needs to find a two cost frontliner to pair with it either probably cast it in or ideally swain uh would be what he wants to hit yeah 100 percent. but not being offered any real feasible two cost options this is a pretty low roll stars are born spot however going to be going for the lost streak it's still okay he's richer than most everybody else in this lobby or i guess i guess tied with connor is me and casper as well but uh casper is the only other player who's also trying to lost streak fully as it is casper oh. going up against chris and oh. wow casper actually casper wins won. that matchup and snaps the lost streak before carousel maybe wanted yeah, to actually really... lose that and have a good loss really did not want that uh because he was he was doing great on his loss streak he was getting very good losses as well uh mm -hmm. honestly both our loss streakers were doing actually all three of our loss streakers were doing great at saving hp um but i guess at some point someone's gonna snap theirs and uh being casper uh snapping into chris who has just started a loss streak as well with two loss yeah we gotta talk about the the noxus kind of um the uh, noxus factor i suppose i'll say it feels awkward to play noxus from a lost streak just because winning does give you more power but ever since the noxus changed where a lot of that power is just front loaded in the trade itself it's more doable and i think you've been an advocate in the past of saying that oh yeah this is still very very playable to play noxus from a lost streak be it you know not for my deal situation but still doable Okay, we're high rolling again. Yeah, uh, so right. <laughs> finds the Swain. I was saying uh, that's the best one to find, right? Castin's passable, but this is the best one. If you have the Ionia, which I guess he does, there was also the out of um, set. Uh, however, you know, this is probably the ideal spot to be is with that Swain. Even having the potential, if he wants to play for more of a, a sorcerer's angle, he could just slam um, Ionic Spark right now onto that Swain, which I think would be huge for turning this into a win streak. Uh, but it depends on if he's gonna see if he can still lose one more or not. Wait, Akshan two? Hold huh? up, wait, is it with collector? Like <laughs> with collector, with death blade, with Rudans at two five? Nah, this is illegal. That's not fair. I get Bryce back on the phone. We, we had him <laughs> earlier. Get him back here. I need it. I need him to tell me. But I, honestly, I don't need him to tell me. This spot is unlawful. I, I can tell you that. I don't need a degree to tell you that. That, that's not okay because wow. the collector is just gonna make him spike his equon so fast his board is so expensive right 19 gold on this board right now but he's still making 20 right he's still like you compare this to setsuko level five on the four streak with a nine gold board has only 20 gold in his bank account right now this is this yeah. is very insane uh, for Weijin to be in this spot. I don't know, previous games were like, oh yeah, players with 12 or 13 board strength, that's pretty strong, right? Oh, they're gonna be players win streaking, but throw that all the way up to 19? Some players in, you know, TFT's history are like, oh no, th sometimes this uh, three cost two star is not worth it in stage two, but this is 100% an opportunity uh, of just so much gold generation because of the collector to make back that economy, farming at least two gold every round, it seems like, maybe some rounds he even farmed three, but Weijin has put himself in a prime position to run away with this lobby I, I i can't see this being anything under a top four i mean then those items are so good for akshan which does raise the question you're on akshan 2 with like essentially perfect akshan items akshan reroll has not been great is this a spot where you actually play it because we should we've seen him just play tempo he could play like any comp from this spot he can swap it up it has to be ad because of those items but some ad line yeah. he can play zary he can play whatever but that's mm -hmm. why, I mean, those items are so good on Akshan. He's on the Akshan too. Is that ever kind of a consideration here? I think it is a very, a very real consideration. Um, Wyjan Iverson, like you said, is going to have the option to pivot. Um, we saw him pivot into Zeri uh, just a little bit ago and have some great success with it. Not able to quite win the lobby, but nearly winning the lobby and getting a second place. It will, I think, depend on the natural shops. He's going to continue pushing this tempo, go to level seven, uh, or go to level six, go to level seven pretty quickly, and just see what his shops are offering him to give that direction. I, I think everything's up in the air. He shouldn't be leaning quite one way or the other. It all just depends on the game state. Yeah, I guess that's fair, right? Like if he goes seven and he's hit two natural Akshan since then, he's on like five. Maybe, yeah, maybe you just yep. rip it. Maybe you go for it. Uh, but if you don't see a single additional Akshan until that point, maybe either keep going to eight, maybe even push a fast nine, considering just how strong this board is and how strong it gets over the course of the next few rounds. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. We'll have to keep our eyes there as we take a look at Casper's spot, 61 gold here at the bottom of the tables. He's saved a good amount of HP. He's only on a two loss, but still very rich and uh, actually has a board that can do some good damage, even though this is a Samira one uh, with items that are not exactly optimal, still going to be able to find a couple of kills in each of these fights.
yeah definitely smear one three items there's gonna be able to do a little uh some good work even taking down the swain uh something i wanted to point out real quick before we go into the augment stages we actually have four players not playing orn in this lobby it's an ezreal with connor as me found his way here sub-zero arc with the caitlin and then two earth players so it's just very interesting that it ended up on that kind of half being orn and half being the off meta picks yeah i think it's really cool and we started the day talking about sub-zero arc and connor with their two off meta picks and both of them making it to the final lobby is awesome to see but let's take yeah. a look at these kind of prismatic augments as well right we've got the social distancing was casper's choice it's going to provide a lot of ad a lot of power very good for both the zeri line as well as the aphelios line but we just saw him roll past an ergot oh okay oh it's uh, not maybe just... that's right he has to play noxus yeah it does have the noxus emblem trying to find a darius rolling very heavily for it stuck on a samira one zeri he rolls past as well man that feels so wow. bad to commit by playing earth commit to a line just not hitting anything i mean it does find the the uh excuse me six noxus to, to throw in there because he has the emblem but zero darius is at this point especially because samir was item carrying two items uh or, or three items i guess for the primary carries it's really really low roll yeah, I mean, this is this is awful. These zero gold, uh, a pair of Katarinas, a pair of Echoes, no Darius. He was lost streaking to have all that gold to roll with. So it's not like his board was strong beforehand. It didn't really get much stronger. Uh, Casper's just going to be hemorrhaging. I, I don't really see a great way to salvage this spot to get bailed out here unless Natural's like a three Darius shop or something like that and locks it. And yeah. Gets to make that very quickly, but the the units are currently contested with setsuko playing it oh, as wow. he leans towards that challenger line yeah I, I love this kind of board from setsuka right here you have some perfect items for this composition obviously the samira right now it's like a little funky it's like okay that's just an ap carry in disguise a kaisa waiting to happen but it's still very very strong at this point in the game darius too a fantastic upgrade with the challengers with the edge of night holding that for the yasuo setsuko is playing strong board strong tempo very very efficiently right now because even looking at the right hand side he's one of the lower board strength in terms of gold cost in the lobby only being at 19 but he's the second highest hp in the lobby right under wage and iverson yeah i'm looking at chris though Crow. He uh, wins that 80, round 85 hp or eight not 85 hp 85 gold for chris i'm wondering if that's hedge oh, fund hedge fund uh, that it he's is. got this time around yeah it looks like it is chris incredibly rich and uh, oh, yeah. we saw Hedge Fund level up uh, last time around, be able to push towards that fast nine, fast 10 from Kembuli. It didn't end up being a fast 10, but uh, yeah. you know, fast nine, Eventually get a big 10. Bill Gates comp on. Um, and maybe we can see, you know, a similar spot come out of Chris. It won't quite be that same level, but we'll see if he can still go fast eight, maybe fast nine. Yeah, and Chris needs a big game, right? Coming into this with 31 points. If he wants to get into that top four, get into more of that prize money, right? This is uh, this is play first or eighth kind of style of TFT. Um, so I like this decision. He's on seven loss currently. That's okay. Be rich. Go for that fast nine strategy. Cap on legendaries. We've seen it be successful throughout this tournament. Find many first places. Um, so I really do like that line, especially these item slams, right? These are still good. You don't have the RFC or the Edge of Night for a Belveth, but you still do have some really good re items and you can you know start your your pivot point around that unit yeah and it, it's interesting because it started with an invoker spat invoker spat you know six invoker on the re ends up being very good but i don't even think he has to go for that line the invoker no. spat can just link up with the rise in the late game or even a shen right a shen two yep. uh and just be two invoker and still provide value maybe not the highest from a, a gold augment but still gonna be quite good and as you said these items are gonna be great for the re just has to find his way there and uh, some of these fights are getting kind of rough though starting to lose a lot more hp as we're going up against uh this darius does end up finding a couple of kills at the very least but i think it was this uh dragon claw giving a lot of trouble to the casio in the early stages of that fight yeah, Krista losing HP. Uh, also, really quickly to paint a picture of what that end game board might be. You're mentioning the Invoker Emblem. I think that's great to call out because with the Ari, the board loves to play both Shen and Karma for the three Ionia buff. And if you're able to slot Rise in there, that's a free kind of four Invokers, which makes the Ari just a little bit better than um, that two Invoker buff. Chris, however, has a long way to get there. 39 HP, yeah. a ton of gold. So that's the picture of what the ideal board wants to be. We'll see if he's able to get to that point as we check out Precedent Spot. A lot of players kind of playing this early game challengers, uh, it seems like. More than I, than I typically expected, Cus. Yeah, I mean, challengers ending up, you know, we were looking at it as like one of the worst comps uh, <laughs> yeah. coming into today. We're like, ah, people will probably stray away from this. Nope. All right. Everybody's changed their mind. 
uh challengers will be uncontested right and then we've got a ton of people playing it all over the place uh and Pre uh, prestivant as well as Setsuko, i think have been finding kind of the most success uh mm -hmm. that study group has found some good lines with it especially Setsuko with the challenger spatula playing around that towards belveth that's been the biggest way that we've oh, yeah. seen success uh Prestivant, of course not going to be an earth so won't have that option available but also i think transfusion is a pretty reasonable augment to go alongside the challengers uh some of the issues with the comp is they're just a little too frail but they yeah. do a ton of damage so if you can give them that extra bulk and they have some regen with something like a hodge you know these challengers can actually really stand up to everyone else when they have some extra time to do all the damage that they're already capable of doing yeah, 100%. Oftentimes, you see Yasuo go into the back line, but he gets kind of taken out before he's able to get that unit kill. Transfusion does shore up that weakness. Obviously, you have to compare that to the other players' power levels that they're getting from their Prismatic Augment, but still, this is a solid one for the Challenger's line. Not that Precedent needs to stick here for sure, but he's setting up for it, especially with holding units like a set on the bench. Finds even a Yasuo pair as well as the Callista upgrade. And Callista with Tricksters is one of the best Tricksters carriers. A Shen even, yep, that Shen pair is going to be found um but he does have four shadow isles in right now and it might just be a little bit of a pivot point finds the gwen finds the viego to go in as a lot of this board's tankiness is centered around the maokai with triple tank items at the moment yeah i mean let's look at this four too right plus one shadow isles puts you in a really really favorable spot yep. uh goes six shadow isles you've got really good items on the Callista with the tricksters class you can actually completely play around that right this doesn't actually have to be challengers at all in no. the sense of being a challenger comp i actually think this is a shadow isles angle this feels like a shadow isles flex and uh, it, it it does feel like this is actually where Preston wants to be, considering the items that are on Callista. These are kind of best in slot. Yeah. Oh, 100%, and especially upgrading that Callista. It's like, okay, Rage Blade doesn't really find its way onto any other challengers. It's just Callista, so you don't have to remake that in any world. Giant Slayer will do well on things like um, a, a Kai'Sa, even a Yasuo in a pinch. But no, Shadow Isles Flex is going to be fantastic. So let's see if there's a plus one Shadow Isles on any of these rolls. Even rerolling job well done might be the play, I think, here. Gets the Challenger okay. Emblem. So can still play around that angle if he doesn't think he needs any more life steal with cybernetic leech. Um, it can play something like that flex with the four shadows four challenger, but decides against it and does in fact decide to go for that magic wand. More AP scaling for the rest of the board. Yeah, magic wand going to give more damage to the Gwen. Going to give more damage to uh, Kaisa potentially if that ends up showing up later as the plus one challenger. If uh, he stays away from the three Ionia with the Yasuo and instead tries to play a little bit more damage. If he can find items for the Kaisa as well, it does pair a little bit better with that AP, but still, it's more so just that Gwen is going to get a lot of value. And also, if you do find Senna later, Senna actually does really well with AP. Her scaling is fantastic, so it'll help a lot with the shields. Definitely. Take a look at the matchup versus Re Replay. Noxus player in the mix. The Deathblade and Hodge on Adirius. Just slamming kind of any items. Even a belt is already there. Maybe going to be a guard breaker uh, just a bit later. But the Shadow Isles presents so much tankiness. It's oftentimes a struggle for Darius to get through. It is just a Maokai too, so it might be enough. But the shielding comes through. The Gwen goes down. It is a relatively close fight as Yasuo, or excuse me, a Samira Ooh. versus a Kalista. But Samira does take the fight win. Yeah, Samiri able to grab that one, so Preston going to take a loss, but his board's still very strong, and we did just see that Shen 2 pop up in the shop. That's going to be a big upgrade for Preston as well. And we're just having to take stock of these augments. Crone, it looks like Sub-Zero Arc has committed towards a Sorcerer line. We saw the um, items that were slammed early easily can go in that direction, so that will be the choice. Yep. Uh, Chris has actually died oh, like on that hedge fund. Oh, He's fallen to negative one here. Chris not able to hang on to find a way to spike, went to level eight and then fast eighth from there. Yeah, and that, that's the risky play is right. You're playing first or eighth and uh, sometimes you unfortunately do go eighth there. But, um, you know, shout outs to Chris. I, I think Chris has played in, I think this is a, their third cup, obviously well known for in the past for being a competitive player in, in the LCS. So competitive blood all there. And it's, I think this is one of their best placements in a TFT cup so far. So getting to the final lobby, getting to the top eight, it's no shame to be going out in eighth here because you're amongst the best players in the game. Oh, for sure. An absolutely great performance from Chris across the board. As we continue on, that does bode well for anyone who was already in the top four, right? For rest events of Zero Art, Casper Wu, and Setsuko. Uh, just trying to hold on to those top four slots as well. As we take a look at all of these boards, Crowen, try and break down anything interesting you see. 
Yeah, I mean, Wage Iverson is still on that Akshan. We were looking at it early, thinking, oh, where is it going to go? Is it going to be the reroll angle or, the, you know, the, the Sharima commit? And there is a Nasus on the board right now. There is an Azir right there. So it looks like it is going to be um, that kind of Sharima angle. Maybe we will see that Akshan be rerolled with, even though we know that they're level 8 at this point. But you can still reroll for Akshan on level 8. Yeah, that's true. You can just go, hey, look for the reroll from there. Find your four costs a little bit easier to help spike the board even harder. I wanted to note that Casper was able to stabilize slightly uh, by getting to seven and finding a Belveth that he made a Noxus oh, Nox Belveth. You know, true. who needs Darius? We just play Noxus Belveth instead. And from here, Casper can actually potentially look to push levels instead of rerolling because it is a contested line in this lobby, or at least the units were contested in the early game. Jumping on board with Sub Zero Arc, looking wow. at this Sorcerer spot. Strong board. And it is very good. The Lux items are great. And because you've got three great Lux items, you're able to put a Radiant on your front line with the Jarvan. Close to Swain 3 as well, which can yeah. help spike the board quite a bit. But at this point, it feels rough because you don't really want to roll for it. You want to push no. levels and look for Ari. 100% want to push levels. Even if you don't find the R, you get to put in an Orianna for the six Sork buff. Six Sork is really, really huge in, in making sure that the, the Lux is able to just be eliminating units, be able to provide some more of that extra damage. Um, and you can maybe just luck into Swain 3 a bit later, but like you're saying, don't want to be kind of stuck rolling for it. It is going to struggle when it goes up against those Shadow Isles shields. We talked about Shadow Isles. The reason why it's so successful is just it's so tanky, and it is that tankiness yeah. that means the Callista lives for just that much longer even through a three item lux that's like uh that's a six orc diff right there if that was a better spot from sub zero he's already level eight so i'm able to play six orcs that fight would have gone completely the other way i mean i don't know if you noticed but the uh the maokai tanked three lux lasers which is uh <laughs> that's a lot. i mean that's that's pretty absurd for a one cost to pull that much weight and yes it is the itemization alongside the shadow isles itself but that's doing quite a bit of work let's take a look here at connor is me's spot He's playing three Noxus. This is a pretty unique board. He's playing level up. He's trying to make his way to a fast nine. nine and play little legendaries from there. And so he's string together a lot of synergies here, Crone. Even though it's a lot of one cost, it's like, you know, Aatrox being able to get the Juggernaut alongside Nasus, who's got these Orn Thieves gloves, which are making it pretty tanky. Still having a Swain, Samira, Cassio core, which is just that best early game core that does do well, even in yep. stage four. Uh, this is really well crafted. I like this quite a bit. Yeah, 100%. Now, Connor hasn't done the best job when it comes to preserving HP comparatively to other players with this kind of similar line. Falling kind of low on 35 HP here is going to look like take another loss. It is a good loss, though. But after this this neutral round, Connor is going to be, you know, pulling the trigger, going to level 9, maybe even during this neutral round, and start to pivot this board. Has the extra time because it is neutrals, so we'll see where it ends up. Immediately finds the Belveth, and that's one out of two huge hits. Yeah, I mean, that's massive, right? You find the Belveth. The other thing you're kind of looking for is that Ari. He finds the Heimer, which is impactful, but you can't really roll for the Heimer upgrades just yet. He needs to find a little bit more power for this board before you do so. However, still having one early is nice to be able to move towards that cap once you stabilize the board a bit more. Yeah, definitely. And I'm thinking of, yeah, Ari and Belveth are the traditional hits, but the items for Ari at least weren't quite there. You have a Shoujins right now, which is playable. Could be even thinking about something like a double RFC onto the Belveth. There's the Belveth pair swapping out that Swain finally, who's done a ton of heavy lifting up until this point. And yeah, this decision making time. Senna 2 is huge for this board. Um, it's going to allow the Shadow Isles, if we do find something like a Gwen to put in, but even just as a raw legendary unit, the power is so, so great. Heimer does go in as we start to prioritize maybe the uh, turret upgrades, and yes, they do come through with one Mechano Swarm. Oh, there's the Ari, Ooh. doesn't get there in time, sells the... Only had, had zero gold, sells the Lux, trying to get the Ari in, doesn't quite make it. I was actually yeah. curious about uh, Sojin Rapid Fire Cannon on the upgraded uh, uh, Senna. I feel like that can give you a ton uh -huh. of shielding and some pretty Definitely. good damage. Uh, it goes along well with the Belveth having already the, the carry items, and I'm, I'm curious if those will end up there, because now the Ari's online, so maybe you want the Shoujin to end up there alongside the Death Cap, so there's there's definitely a lot of consideration for Connor. This ends up being a round that he's got a sack. He's going to take a, a pretty sizable hit. However, he's so close to a lot of upgrades, and he did already hit a couple that can make his board stronger. 
And it feels so rough because that's not a round where you can think, oh, I can afford to sack this because Connor is already so low. Really needed that Aryan last fight. Could have saved a, a decent amount of HP even if he wasn't winning the, the fight. But yeah, it is going to go for the Deathblade on the Senna right now. The RFC, I, I think, still will probably find its way onto the uh, Belveth to try to make her as powerful right now. Even though she's not tier 2, hopefully Connor is able to, you know, salvage another couple rounds, snap this lost streak, start to find some wins. We'll see this this repositioning is gonna be able to do it as he does face Casper Wu right now, another player towards the top of the standings. Yeah, I mean Casper with that Noxus Belveth, it's still a Belveth one, hasn't found many upgrades in the last little bit and has started to finally be losing. We look at the battle of the Belveths right now. Noxus is a powerful uh, upgrade for it. However, this is three item Belveth on the other side for Connor, and it is targeting on to Casper's Belveth first, getting the damage down, and it is Huge. enough. Connor's going to find the win, won't quite take Casper completely out, but Connor has found a little bit more time to stabilize. Yeah, and this is uh, insane that that was a fight win against Casper, because if, say, Casper goes seventh and Connor is me, he's able to cap these legendaries and find a first place, that could be the ticket to a top four and, and a ticket to more prizing and to the mid set. Yeah, absolutely, right? That's Connor's actually in the best position of the bot four to make it into top four. He's sitting at 34 points. Whereas towards the bottom of the top four, it's Prestivin at 38. But even, you know, Casper at 40 points, if he takes a really bad loss here, that can be overcome by a first from Connor is me. And uh, it's looking like that might be the case as far as Casper taking the seventh. But it's a matter of can Connor actually claw all the way up to a first from this spot only on 10 HP? As there are some other boards that are quite powerful, even an Azir being added. There's six Azirs for Weijin right now as he is playing this very strong Shurima setup, tempoing from that Akshan. Oh yeah, Azir three items, Akshan three items. Weijin was so rich, able to roll down to maybe heading this three star four cost unit. It is still good for now, good enough to win the round. It looks like versus Connor is me, but the Ooh. Aatrox does come back alive from the dead, needs to start targeting the Heimerdinger and then the turret, but the oh, other, other Aatrox comes back as well. One more cast will do it. And oh, Connor is me so. lives. Oh, drops to just two HP, but survives as Casper does go down in seven. Casper out in seven. Connor lives, so Connor oh. has a chance to fight for that first, and it's a Tactician <laughs> Crown. Oh no! Oh no! Mark oh. pulled the levers on his way out. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Connor gets the Belveth. Connor gets the Belveth with the Tactician's Crown oh, as does he well. Have a pair? Yeah. Oh, now he's got the Belveth too. That could definitely stabilize him and push him towards a potential first what but Weijin still has the chance to go for that azir three uncontested unit a lot of time for the other players to try and hold those though while Weijin is still at six of them oh connor velvet two texans crown doesn't actually have anything else to really put in besides for this re1 doesn't want to sell off of the re pair but that's okay i think the raw power of that tactician's crown being on a belveth is going to mean that is perfectly a-okay connor's made two hp in a dream but the whole rest lobby hp at least from re-replay down to precedent just a five hp gap with those four players yeah if connor can find a karma get invoker and ionia online alongside an re2 He's in a fantastic spot for this to go first. He kind of would have hit everything that you really want to hit uh, with this board. We see him go up against Prestivant with those Shadow Isles online. Has the Rise being able to give even more shields. That does buff up the Senna and the attack speed even more. It's a great synergy between those two. It's actually making this board so strong. Can't quite get through that Callista yet. Even with the Belvath in the back line, she's being hit. But the Callista might not be able to get enough spears for the Ren just yet. Does not. Prestivant takes a big hit. Maybe Callista 3 in that spot actually wins, though, because so many spears got yeah. stacked into that Belveth. Yeah, great point. It could have been the difference maker in that fight. We'll have to see if, if that can come through a bit later on. Uh, but Wage Niverson currently sitting still six Azirs, five Akshans, a bunch of Luxes just sitting on the bench as well. We have like six Lissandras. There's a lot of pieces um, in, in the makings here, but Wage it just doesn't even care to hit any of them. He doesn't need to. He's still on a six win streak, 90 HP sitting kind of pretty at the top there and is going to be playing this game for that first place cap really wants to find that way and sneak into the top four yeah i mean weijin trying to just guarantee uh that he can hit these three stars play that first he knows that to beat connor he probably does need to find these three stars and i think he can win if he does get there connor gonna be fight fighting off against a still a samira on the board the fact that samira's <laughs> just like last on boards this long with yeah. three items 
uh, this this unit is too crazy but it's not doing enough anymore that's gonna be of a big course. hit taken a uh, sub-zero art gonna take a big loss falling down to five hp after rolling down on level eight maybe able to hold on enough though to keep that top four position so zero arc actually really yeah. needs uh the top four overall sitting at 39 points initially a sixth is a little bit sketchy to get there but uh at least you know not a bottom two might be enough to just hold on to a top four slot yeah, exactly. sub Zerak is kind of the big focal point, I think, of this game in the sense that everyone else is maybe chilling on qualifier points, but sub Zerak really needs to fight for that top four, um, at least more than other players. So going out in sixth might not be enough. Had a decently comfy lead, but might not be quite enough if one of those players on the bubble uh, like Connor's being a re replay can spike to a first place. So still, there's a lot riding on these next couple of rounds, especially with four players being on single digit HP. Yeah, Sub-Zero Arc would go up to uh, 42 points with the 6th here, which does kind of get him out of range of Wajin, uh, but not out of range of Connor or Re-Replay, who are both yep. still within the lobby. So that yep. can be a pretty terrifying spot to be. Really, just getting a 5th kind of elevates Sub-Zero Arc to a place where he yeah. should be able to lock in that top 4. Every single placement is going to be so huge as we see Sub-Zero Arc playing the 8 Sorcerers online and runs re -replay. the replay. And re replay doesn't have any 3 stars, so it should be an okay matchup. Yeah, I mean, winning this essentially guarantees that top 4 for Sub-Zero Arc by being able to beat Re-Replay. He should be able to lock in a ticket to the mid set and able to take down the Darius. The main carries are down. It's just a Samira still trying to carry this board, and that's not really enough. She's still alive, though, and because of the Aatrox, and we're looking at the Demacia Rise, keeping things up. There, finally, it goes down. Re-Replay will fall. Sub-Zero Arc stays alive, does not take the sixth, does top five, and that should just about lock in a ticket to mid-set for Sub-Zero Arc. Sub-Zero Arc hangs on, but so does Connor's being an impressive and Falwasian Iverson finally takes a loss and is starting to roll down. This is one Azir away from Azir 3. However, we'll stop along the way for a rise too. That's not a bad upgrade if I do say so myself. Two Akshans away as well. Could even consider selling things like that Sejuani 3 potential. Doesn't need to. 70 HP. Wajin is still chilling. Yeah, Weijin having a fantastic game here. He can't quite sneak into the top four, but he's just looking for as high a placement as possible as he snuck into this top eight lobby near the bottom, and he's doing a great job of it. Looking to play for a first. Gonna do a ton of damage to Setsuko here. Might even take him out from 15. That's a big loss. Setsuko will fall from a spot that was looking pretty solid earlier this game wow. to a potential bot for no, oh, no. Sub Zero Arc and Prestivin are down. Prestivin in fifth, Sub Zero Arc in fourth, Setsuko in third. And now it is just Connor versus Weijin. And Weijin is digging for those three stars, not finding the Azir or the Akshan just yet, as he has finally gone to zero gold. But he's got a carousel coming up and a ton of HP. Yeah, and that carousel, though, if he's going to be able to hit Azir, great, go for that. But if it's between getting like an Ukshan or getting just like an item or denying an RE2 from Connor, denying that RE2 should definitely be on the radar. We still have one round to get through, though. We have to have that Bell that that legendary board survive from Connor to even have a chance to come back. Yeah, here's a big fight for Connor. Let's see if he's able to take down Wajin before the big upgrades are through. The Rise 2 giving a lot of shielding, but that Bell Veth is absolutely crazy still gonna be able to take down this entire board as you're doing its best but not able to do it oh kind of close actually belveth fell really low um even amongst that board who we see the belveth it's like oh that should win every time there's an ari on the carousel connor is me is gonna get gifted it there we go this comp gets more powerful akshan with a death blade means that wage nervous is gonna be one akshan and one azir away now as well both players finding units that they want just unfortunately able to die but wow naturals the akshan three Finds the Yuxhan 3, still not quite there on the Azir. Just the fight between these Ooh. two. Reforges the DB into Archangels. That's a decent, better item there for the Rise. All right, here we are. One more fight potentially. One more fight win from Weijin will do it. Does the three-star Yuxhan do enough? Three-star Akshan upgrade versus the RE2 upgrade. Which difference is going to be better? Connor's me on a five-win streak. Looking to make it six to keep his chances live. Can Weishin close this out, though? There we go. We see the front line kind of evaporating almost immediately, but Ryze does get a big cast out. It's going to give a huge shield with all that extra AP. 
watching for that shot from the Akshan. Does take out the Heimer, but the Ari's still alive to cast. The shields are big, but they expire before the wave comes through. Very close fight. If that Rise Shield lasted just a bit longer, it would have been able to make all the difference. Wajin rolling to Azir every single turn. Each round that he rolls and doesn't hit the Azir three. Oh boy, that's just like how much longer can Wajin hold out for? He's built this big HP lead. That's why he's in the spot that he's in right now. Even if he does lose another round, he'll be able to go to neutrals, generate a decent amount more gold. And some may say, yeah, maybe Wajin shouldn't have rolled down as aggressively. Maybe he should have tried to make Econ again to be able to get into stage seven, roll all down and have more gold to hit that Azir. But Hey, we're here still zero gold, one is zero away, but looking to take another hit up against Connor. Right, there it is, one more fight here. Still looking for Azir, still has a lot of HP remaining. Fight back and forth, there's the Akshan cast, not able to find too much purchase. Still mana reeve from the Ari, and these are not getting any closer for Weijin. Needs to find that three star Azir to make it happen. Hey, I guess Belveth got taken out, you know? That's pretty cool. It was you know, one step of the way there, but still not far enough as the Ari and other units in the back line were still alive. It's going to be the Azir 3 is hit. Wajin Iverson cast. I think that might be enough. He might be able to march his way there, but I do want to call out. We missed it in all the commotion with three players going down at once, but Setsuko did grab a third place, highest placement out of any of the top four players, which means Setsuko has won the Shirima Cup. He has earned enough points. Wow. And Setsuko is going to join that small group of players who have been able to get first place in multiple Riot tournaments in TFT. Congrats to Setsuko. He's part of that elite club right now, and it's not a surprise to see him there. We'll be talking to him a bit later, but for now, we got to see both Connor is me and Wage and Iverson have to bring to the table here that Azir 3 cast. I think the Akshan was getting close. He did take out the Belveth in the last fight. So especially if they're on opposite sides, get protected by these Riot Shields. I think Wage has done it and bought enough time. Aatrox 2 upgrade does come through for Connor though. Yeah, finding another upgrade is big. We have to see how these mana reeves go as well because it was stopping a lot of the damage, but the Azir does take a second to ramp up. We're not going to be able to see the health bar, so it's a little bit of a mystery how this <laughs> fight is going to go. Watching that Azir, it's still untouched, Azir. however, getting a lot of damage out. I'm looking at the Bell Veth. Kind of hard to see here, but we aren't getting any Azir hits on her yet. Now the targeting has shifted. Looks like there she has go. fallen, and the Azir 3 is enough for Weijin to win the fight over Connor. Weijin going to grab a first on his way out, and we'll see what place that can net him because i know he had a big uphill battle to go through from 31 points definitely ways and iverson taking the win there but cast you called it yourself we got to talk about it here setsuko nabbing that third place finish and in doing so securing his place as first place finisher the winner of the Sharima Cup. Now, Cass, I feel like it's actually worth talking about this as much as I do want to uh, acknowledge Weijin and, and his win there at the end, though. Setsuko not only winning two, two different events in two straight sets, but also, and this is going to sound silly, the fact that Setsuko is also considered the best at multiple points in this stretch of time yeah. and yeah. then winning two cups is actually more surprising than I think a lot of people would think. But yeah, I think the big thing is a lot of times there's someone who everyone is considering the best player and they have really great placements and you you expect that, right? But they don't win a bunch of tournaments in a row. But Setsuko has kind of flipped that on its head. There was, you know, the the always oh, a ladder warrior. He's not going to place well. He broke that and corrupted, had a phenomenal set eight. And then now in set nine, he's still continuing that streak. He's still playing fantastic and finds yet another win here in the Shirima Cup. So it, it is it is beautiful to watch him kind of uh, be able to flourish in tournament play as well while everyone's saying he's so good. Yeah, I actually want to bring up a point as well. I almost forgot that Setsuko had that ladder warrior narrative at this point. You brought it up and I'm like, oh yeah, people did say about Setsuko, but because I think he's proven everyone wrong at this point. It's been multiple sets where he's at the top of tournaments. He is definitely not ladder warrior anymore. He is tournament god Setsuko now claiming another victory. And it's just how far can he go, right? It's it been a lot of that talk last set about, you know, dish, soap, and Setsuko at the top, but Setsuko has been able to make it, you know, just that much more consistent and really earn his place among the NA greats. And I want to just add to that, you know, Setsuko made it to the World Championship and made it to this lobby. And we look at, at this, the, the side here. I'm just looking. I see Riri playing Weijin also in this. So three of our representatives from Worlds 
our continuing success into set nine which that feels really good i feel like we don't see that all the time right sometimes oh. we'll have world representatives that may fall off for a set they may not be able to come back as strong and here in the shrima cup we've got three of our world's reps popping off here in uh the final lobby and and having great placements one of them even winning the entire event all right, well, with that said, the scores are ready. Let's take a look at how the final eight shaped up to see, as we mentioned, Setsuko taking the win, 48 points, including his bonus points, but you know what? Didn't even need it. Didn't need him. <laughs> Setsuko really looking great on the day, but you know what, Cass? I think it's worth talking about Sub-Zero R coming in at second place here. The Caitlyn player defy defying the meta and playing Caitlyn in an entire field of Ornn. Yeah, I mean, it's awesome to see, right? This is his first day four ever, uh, and he gets here. It was his first day three as well, I think. Uh, first day three, first day four, makes it all the way to second place, doing so as the only remaining person playing the legend, Joe Bookmark, on day three also was running it. Uh, the only problem for him is he's kind of ruined the legend now because Caitlyn does a lot better when it's the only Caitlyn <laughs> in the lobby, and I expect a lot of other people are going to start trying out that strategy, trying out to play Caitlyn uh, now that they've seen that great success and i, I want to add to that with a shout out to connor is me on the ezreal we've got two people playing their unique strategies making the final lobby and placing second and fifth that's just fantastic now listen as much as i would love to talk about all of these players individually we have something very exciting coming up we are going to have a winner's interview with the man the beast himself it's setsuko the ladder warrior so i'm i'm gonna tell us right now it's gonna be very very exciting love talking to setsuko very excited to see what he has to say but don't go anywhere we'll be back in just a couple minutes for a winner's interview with setsuko
everybody. Welcome back. We have something very exciting here. We have Setsuko, the winner of the Shirima Cup, on the line. Setsuko, congratulations on the win. We just have a couple questions for you. And I wanted to start by, I guess, talking a little bit about your legacy, so to speak. You know, I've been hearing about you since all the way back in set four. People have been saying how good this Setsuko guy has been. And I remember not even a year ago, you spoke on the Don't Talk If You Don't Know podcast about how you felt like the expectations and the pressure uh, and the nerves really did get to you. And you felt like it made uh, that it affected your actual tournament performance. Obviously, almost a year later, you've now won two tournaments, almost back to back, honestly, with how short the stint was. I'm just curious to know, do you feel like it really was just an experience difference that really gave you the difference to, to be so successful in tournament now? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's kind of experience. Like, I think after one, like there's a certain tournament, I just like started not caring as much. I don't know why, like I just played, like I would play in Soul Queue and then I, did pretty well and then just keep doing that from then on and it's been going pretty well so yeah i don't know like it, like it's just a flip of, flip of a switch kind of can't really hey, explain that's it fair. that's sometimes how it happens for competitors right it's just one day you wake up and you kind of break through a, a wall like that i wanted to quickly ask you about kind of your your study group the group of players you play with because this is the second tournament in a row y'all have had very good placements and this one both you and president made top four and uh soju was just sitting outside in in top 10 as well um, I'm, I'm curious kind of how the prep goes with that group. It's a lot of big personalities and it feels like there could be clashes, but you all seem to learn a lot from it and gain a lot from it and get very good. So how does the preparation go with that study group? Well, I mean, I wouldn't say we learn a lot. Like, I feel like we don't even do anything until like two days before the tournament starts. And then we just, I don't know, we just sit and call and like, like, like snipe each other for like a few games. I mean, I feel like it's just good to talk to people about like, I don't know, how, like certain spots and certain lines that you don't see. But yeah, like I, like I don't even think we prep that much. Like we just play solo queue all the time. Like like most of us are m most of us are streamers anyway, so there's no time to like like prep all the time anyway. So yeah, fair enough. Yeah, Ross Kill carrying through. Now speaking of kind of different lines, there you're one of the few players who brought a different legend than most into this tournament with playing the uh, Earth for a lot. Is that something that you had prepped a lot personally? Because not a lot of people in your study group, right, had that kind of same approach. Why was that the approach for you? And do you think that was a big contributor to why you were so successful here? Oh, honestly, I had no idea what legend I was going to use, like up until the tournament, and then, like, I just have some sort of mental block with the ore items. Like, I don't know. How to like place some of them like like i just see them on two one i'm like what the what or what the like what the hell am i supposed to do with this and then so i just pivoted to earth and then like i feel like earth is like like there's a lot of hyrule potential like some portals with earth are really op like placidium library um vandal cafeteria like there's a lot of hyrule potential like worst case you just don't take the augment on two one but like three two four two earth is like acceptable as well so i just so i think earth like 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 there's some like i think orn is actually better than earth but i just and bat it with the orange, so I just started using Earth, basically. Yeah. Now, Setsuko, I, I know you're probably exhausted. Long day. Congratulations again. But before you go, I do just want to open up the floor. Is there anything you want to say or anything you want to shout out as we close out the tournament? Um. Okay, I don't know. Okay, honestly, like, I feel like this patch is, is good, but there's just some really, really, like, Obscene, like obscene things that are in the game, like Samira two being stronger than any other one cost in the game by like a like a like a like two levels, is pretty is pretty bad. Also, like this Piltover trade, I don't know what they're doing with this Piltover trade, but like I feel like every patch is just getting stronger. Like like two, like on the first patch, like it was strong, and then they just they would like try to buff it, like try to nerf it, I guess. But then it, it just gets stronger and stronger, and now like whoever gets Piltover on two one just wins the game instantly. Like I don't know what's going on, but I mean it's fine. I mean, yeah. Okay, also, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, like, I think we all know which study group is better now. Like, they, they got cleared out of their minds this tournament. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to say names, but you guys know who you are. <laughs> GG. All right, Tsuko, congratulations again. Seriously, very, very exciting to see you uh, up on top. So, hopefully, this is a trend that continues, but we will let you go. Congratulations again. Go get some rest. We'll see you at the mid-set finale. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, now Cass, Crowen, just the three of us once again. And listen, Setsuko won, right? Setsuko is the champion of the tournament, but the thing we keep talking about is that it's not just the winner, right, Cass? We've, yeah. we've been talking about how the top four getting the immediate 
automatic invitation to mid-set finale is such a big deal. And we do have our four automatic qualifiers with, with Setsuko, Sub-Zero Arc, Casper Wu, and Prestavint. Yeah, I and mean, this is big, right? Because Sub-Zero Arc was the one player we went in there saying he needs to make top four in order to get to mid-set. And so he's locked it in. And while he's the only one who needs it, the other players may be able to get in on qualifier points. It's really good to have that peace of mind, immediately lock it in, know that you are going to mid-set. And then on top of that, top four, you know, you get the bigger payout. So it definitely feels good for all these players to make it. And their performances throughout the weekend were really spectacular to watch. Casper was outscoring Setsuko going into that game uh, when you don't include bonus points. That's a really impressive performance. And Prestivant, who, you know, we kind of did talk about how some people do kind of underrate him or they'll, you know, make fun of him or talk down on him. But he's still continually put up some very consistent, amazing performances. And so very happy to see him make a top four of another cup. And I do want to draw some attention, Crow, and obviously we have this top four, but just outside of the top four, there's some other players that I think it was really important that for them to kind of make a statement. The two players that came to mind there were Re-Replay, Weijin Iverson, right? Re-Replay oh, yeah. getting day one in the Freljord Cup, Weijin Iverson having all this hype around him and then going out in day three. So I think it felt really good to see those two players make top eight. Oh, 100%. Re-replay, you know, getting the Team Liquid signing, you know, buff here coming in. A lot of expectations being like, ooh, is this guy like just like a one-set fluke kind of thing? No, that's not the case. Freljord Cup maybe was the fluke, but not, set, you know, set nine in general. Comes into uh, to Sharima Cup, is able to top eight amongst the best of them. And while we're not seeing, you know, him top fouring or winning the cup, right? You just can't expect to win every single cup. That's why we talk about players like now Setsuko winning multiple cups as, you know, such a high pedigree, right? Because it's so, so hard to do. But Re-replay having winning worlds obviously i think he has the potential to win another event wayshin iverson as well uh casa mentioned it right the three world's representatives in the final lobby being able to um to get here and continue that kind of dominance that reminds me of say like juan mi from china right after winning uh winning worlds he was able to do keep topping in those regional events in china and go back to worlds multiple times as well right that's the kind of level of play that i'm starting to see from players like Riri play and wage iris in north america and fills me with confidence to say that north america is still you know the best region amongst them I think even looking at things like Setsuko now at this point in time holding the best average placement in set 9 and then even looking at set 8 where he was among one of the top three average placements across the entirety of set 8. It's such an exciting time in TFT where we can point to someone and say like, hey, this person in a game of variance is able to build an edge that they find consistently in a field of players who are among the best in arguably the strongest region, right? We're the defending world champs, right? As far as anyone else can say, we're, Definitely. we're the best. The strongest region, gangly. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know what? No, there's something worth saying. Like I think it's even more of a celebration for Setsuko to be considered one of the best players, to to prove it in a tournament, and to prove it again one set later. This yeah. guy really is just on top. Now, Cass Crowen, this is the end of the show, but I want to open up the floor to you two now for some final thoughts before we go. Uh, you know, don't play Caitlyn. Caitlyn's really bad. Leave Caitlyn <laughs> open so that I can still just be the only Caitlyn in the lobby. I prefer that. Uh, definitely, you know, it's great. But no, I mean, big congrats to some of the newer players uh, that are coming in, or at least first time uh, making it towards the day three, day four, right? Sub Zero arc, but also uh, looking at uh, some of our players that, like Master Uknan, uh, YMDE, that made it in all the way to day four in their very first uh, tournament with Riot. It's so cool to see. New players come in and actually have a strong performance makes me feel good uh, again about na as gangly you were talking about other than that it's just great to uh be here with uh, you and crowen and uh mort and boop it's a lot of fun to be on this broadcast and i'm uh looking forward to many more this set and i'll uh, i'll see you all around yeah definitely i mean similar sentiment it's just been some fantastic storylines coming through there's so many players to name especially the newer ones i always get excited about because it's like the lifeblood of the tft scene really gets reinvigorated by those new players with so hungry so much drive even getting to the final lobby right for, for someone like sub-zero arc and even players that we didn't quite mention at the end there um but connor is me and chris as well you know chris has been around for a little bit but finally finding some top eight success i think is really really huge i was excited for the future as always of tft these events like the Freljord and Trima Cup leading towards mid-set, leading towards that world's qualification spot, just get me really, really excited for, you know, seeing how NA develops as a region, the talent pool, and I think we're going to see some heavy hitters there, and whoever gets that number one spot at mid-set is going to be very, very deserving of competing at Worlds. 
All right. I don't have too much more to say apart from what everyone else has kind of touched on. I do just want to say again, congratulations to Setsuko on the victory. And I do want to give a special shout out to Re-Replay, obviously the defending world champion making a comeback after the Freljord Cup and uh, technically the highest ranking Tri-State player competing in the Shurima <laughs> Cup. So let's go Tri-State, baby. That's how we do it. So again, for the last time, I'm Gangly. This is Cass. This is Crowen. And don't miss the mid-set finale coming up August 25th, but that is everything we have for you here at the Shurima Cup. Have a wonderful night and be good.